Hey everybody, it's 815. Welcome to the 65th Rochester Ophthalmology Conference and thank you for your attendance. That's been quite a year to say the least. Um, I believe we're seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and vaccines are rolling out to the general population in Springs here and we have a wonderful conference lined up for you. And it's a privilege presiding over this conference for the first time as chair of this department. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how honored I am to be working with such dedicated faculty and staff that we have here at the Flom Eye Institute. And we are growing. The slides that we'll be playing during the intermission will have multiple announcements about the conference and we'll introduce you to 10 new faculty members that have joined us since May 2020 or will start by September of this year. And if all goes well, more will be on their way. Uh, needless to say, we're excited to be growing and fulfilling critical eye care needs for our patients in the upstate New York region and beyond, in surgical retina, ocular genetics, uveitis, pediatric neuro-ophthalmology, and pediatric cornea, to name just a few niche services, while also bolstering our already strong science research by jointly appointing with the Department of the Art Sciences and Engineering, the new director of the Center for Visual Sciences, Susanna Marcos. Now, of course, this conference wouldn't be possible without the hard work and great team effort of those lifted here. So thank you all. And also a special thanks to Alcon, Bausch & Lomb, Johnson & Johnson for underwriting a portion of this conference through independent medical grants. Now some announcements about the conference. And again, this information will be posted during our intermissions. Uh, this meeting is 100% online and eligible for a maximum 10.5 hours of CME credit. The two-day program is divided into six sessions, four today and four tomorrow. And each day will feature a named lecturer, the Frederick Doucet lecture today by David Wong and the Albert Snell lecture tomorrow by Reza Dana. Each session will be followed by a panel discussion and as you listen to the lectures, you may ask questions in the Zoom chat and the Zoom Q&A. We will answer your questions during the panel discussion at the end as time permits. And during the panel, you may also raise your hand in the Zoom where you can ask questions for all to hear. Except for speakers and moderators, everyone's audio and video will be turned off so that it doesn't distract from the presentations. During the breaks, we encourage you to visit our virtual exhibits and read about our new recruits. A link to the exhibit hall will be posted in the chat prior to the breaks. There you can visit with our exhibitors in real time. Just click talk to us live link at the top of the exhibit page. Important note, if you lose a connection or get lost, remember this web address, www.i2021.urmc.edu. It will lead you to the live meeting homepage where you can pick up any of the meeting streams. If you do need help, enter help in the Zoom chat and one of our staff will reach out to you privately. On Saturday afternoon, check your email for instructions on how to claim your CME credits. If you're not registered prior to March 26th at 8 a.m., you will not receive an email to claim CME. You're of course welcome to stay for the lectures. Thank you and please enjoy the first session moderated by Ben Hammond. Ben is an associate professor of ophthalmology here at the Flom Eye Institute and our residency director. He completed his residency with us after receiving his medical degree from the University of Michigan. And he went on to complete a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship at Children's Hospital in LA, USC, and it has been instrumental in the education of our program. He treats all pediatric eye conditions and performs cataracts, strabismus, and glaucoma surgeries. Ben's research interests include multi-ethnic pediatric eye disease studies and is an active participant in ongoing pediatric eye disease investigator group studies. Ben, thank you for taking the time to moderate this session. It's all yours. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here and um, we have a great uh, group for our for our first session. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Vance Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thompson is an internationally recognized specialist in refractive cornea, phacic IOL, and lens surgery. He's the founder of and director of refractive surgery for Vance Thompson Vision in Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota. Dr. Thompson also serves as professor of ophthalmology at the Sanford um, School of Medicine. 
He's a leading international researcher and has played a key role in the development of many advanced technologies and techniques for both laser and implant vision correction. He has served as the medical monitor or principal investigator in over 85 FDA monitored clinical trials. In addition, he has published uh, numerous papers and book chapters and is the co-author of the textbook Refractive Surgery. He has lectured and taught advanced laser and implant surgery to thousands of surgeons all over the world. Dr. Thompson graduated from the University of South Dakota School of Medicine, and then he went on to complete an ophthalmology residency at the University of Missouri. He um, then completed uh, his fellowship in cornea and refractive surgery at Hunkeller Eye Institute in Overland Park, uh, Kansas. In addition to his vast clinical trials experience, teaching and publications, uh, Dr. Thompson has 13 US pat patents or patents pending. Uh, welcome to Dr. Thompson. We're uh, very excited to have you with us uh, today. Uh, he will present his uh, first lecture, uh, The Premium IOL Patient Journey, Important Keys to Success. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me, and uh, what an honor. Um, I have a ton of respect for your institution, and David, uh, bravo on your leadership, uh, and Scott, you know, McRae is, um, you know, one of my heroes in refractive surgery and, and uh, has been a close comrade for my, my whole career, so there's a number of things that are super special about this, including the fact that I've been, you know, waiting a year uh, to give this as uh, things were delayed with COVID. And so I'm going to talk <clears throat> about, you know, some things that I'm passionate about in the world of refractive surgery. And I focus on refractive cornea, phacic IOL, and lens surgery. And, and I'm going to cover a fair amount in what I consider the, you know, important keys to success in the premium IOL journey. Um, but I think you'll find it's a meat and potatoes approach that is very applicable uh, to your practice. And these are my financial disclosures. I do a, a lot of research uh, and develop in addition to, you know, my uh, clinic and surgery. And I do it with just a wonderful group of ophthalmologists and optometrists um, who help push me every day. And this is my family who I go to battle you know, for every day and my kids and grandkids. And, but I have to tell you, the fellowship I did with Dan Durian Refractive and John Hunkler in Cataract in 1990 and getting involved in the Legally Blind Eye study of PRK um, with Dan and implant studies with John uh, really changed my journey that even though I came back to my home state of South Dakota, um, you know, um, having been involved in the PRK LASIK SMILE trials and every phacic IOL trial and collagen cross-linking, some as medical monitor, some as principal investigator and light adjustable IOLs and multifocal IOLs. Um, I like to call it an, an advanced anterior segment practice that <clears throat> has taken me all over the world. But, you know, when it comes to my practice, I knew I had to a decision to make when I got back home. And that was, do I want something that's kind of centered in patient pay, that boutique refractive practice or an insurance-based uh, you know, practice? And I, I, I knew I wanted to do both. I wanted to take care of the Medicaid patient, uh, just like the you know, patient who's looking to invest in, in refractive surgery. And to tell you the truth, it helps fund uh, you know, um, advanced technologies for people in need too. And so this comprehensive approach to refractive surgery and refractive cataract surgery um, has been, you know, what I consider one of the foundations of my practice. And in this day and age, you know, I think the most uh, important, you know, thing in cataract surgery is to just understand all the options and it can really be fun delivering them. And I think the first question we ask ourselves is why? And I think the main reason is we want to serve our patients well. And I like to think about what type of cataract surgery would this patient want if they knew what I know? 
And so an important cause of an unhappy patient is just taking a cookie cutter same approach to every single patient. And it ignores that different patients have different goals. And I like my patients to really understand lens function that it used to provide reading range um, and clarity. And uh, you know, you first lost the reading range and and uh, went into bifocals or readers, and now you've lost the clarity, and that's why we're sitting here today. Um, but you wanna understand that because you can replace one or both. And then also how to take care of residual refractive error. Are you gonna wanna do a lot with glasses or are you gonna wanna do a lot without glasses? After I finish my story of what, how I talk with these patients, um, you know, 60% of my patients choose a monofocal, just fine with wearing glasses approach, and. 40% end up wanting to do a lot without glasses. But when we take a situation like this, patients see in 2020 minus one, you got a manifest refraction of plus 0.25 minus 0.75 axis 180. We, we know what to do with glasses. We're gonna do our very best to get them to Plano and hit that refractive endpoint. Well, with advanced implants, we gotta, we gotta have the same standard. Whether it's a cornea adjustable implant and we're using a refractive corneal procedure to take the football in for the touchdown or a optic adjustable implant like the light adjustable lens. And so to me, my refractive consults kind of the crossroads in it is, do you wanna do a lot with glasses or do you want to do a lot without? And it really helps me separate my patients uh, into the appropriate journey and education you know, for them. And so again, residual refractive error, plus 0.25, minus 0.75, one, axis 1A. We know if we don't you know, have a nice set of glasses for that patient, they're going to have some nighttime glare and halo, some decreased image quality in low light. But when we put those glasses on, we're going to help clear, clear that up. We have to think the same way in advanced cataract surgery. They have that residual refractive error. And we can't just blame the nighttime glare and decreased image quality on the optic. We have to take care of the residual refractive error if it's visually significant. And our exam will show us that. So when I'm taking this patient-centered approach, I'm really thinking about it in this way. And this 99.2%, I think is a number that will surprise a lot of people. And that was the you know, percent of patients in uh, the panoptics trifocal uh, study that set, got the panoptics and said they would do the same exact implant again. And that was with no enhancement. And now we did in our recruiting uh, have to, uh, you know, enroll people that were, you know, with a, a diopter or less of astigmatism. Um, but still, that was with no enhancement. And the monofocal control group, 89% said they do the same implant again. And we know monofocal implants do beautifully, but we have to remember there's an adjustment there also, especially some of these younger cataract patients that you know we know the reduced nighttime image quality is from lenticular changes, but we're actually removing a little bit of accommodative range also, and there's an adjustment. So it's important that these patients be educated properly. And as far as, you know, the most common implants I use when someone wants to do a lot without glasses in an advanced cataract surgery anymore is trifocality or a light adjustable lens. And the trifocal, we know, you know, how patients are interested in getting that range, but we also know we're going to get nighttime disturbances. And I think it's what intimidates a lot of us about multifocality. No one wants to bum out their patient. But when you look at, you know, the first trifocal that was FDA approved in our country, you see the majority of patients were very satisfied. And I have loved how the FDA has, you know, um, required patient reported outcomes become a bigger and bigger part of our trial. When you ask these patients that got the trifocal, would you have the same implant again? 99.2% said they'd have the same implant again. So let's talk about, you know, how we handle residual refractive error. We know that, you know, the way the lens sits in the capsule, you know, what we call the effective lens position is an estimate. We hope it's going to sit in the center, 
but if it sits in the back or the front, or combine that with incisional healing or posterior corneal astigmatism, um, we just aren't as accurate with cataract surgery as we are with LASIK. And I like my patients to understand that. I, I like them to understand how the cornea is distance from the, I don't use the phrase nodal point, but I do use the, the distance from the pupil. The cornea's distance doesn't change. So when we change its anterior curvature, it's a very accurate procedure. With an implant, whether it sits away from your pupil or closer to it, it changes its power. And you just wanna understand cataract surgery isn't, ac isn't, ac isn't as accurate as, as we'd like it to be. And I like them to understand that actually all implants are adjustable at the plant, but the power of adjusting an implant inside the eye is revolutionary. And having been involved in the beginning of these light adjustable lenses, I've seen a lot. And you've been, you know, uh, uh, able to do plus or minus two diopters of sphere and plus and 0.75 to two diopters of cylinder corrections with these implants. And the way they basically work is the opposite of laser vision correction. In laser vision correction, if we look at the little arrows on the left there, if we're treating the center more, we're flattening the cornea. If we're treating the center more with a light adjustable lens, we're steepening the cornea. And the way that, I'm sorry, we're steepening the implant. And the way that works is you can see uh, the um, uh, ultraviolet light um, that is going into this optic. Um, that, you know, I like to think of about, about it like that, the, the movie Men in Black, when if you saw that cat that had the little, you know, medallion on its collar, inside of it was a whole galaxy. There was a lot going on in there. And I think of that with this implant, that these photosensitive macromers, that when you uh, illuminate them with UV light, they polymerize. But the, the macromers that haven't been polymerized diffuse into the area where they've been polymerized so that the concentration of unpolymerized is equal throughout the implant. And what happens is you, you know, we get a, a swelling in the center that's with a very specific math that once you're happy with it, in the FDA monitored trial, we were able to do two light adjustments. Post approval, we can do three. And then when you're happy with it, you lock it in and then you get the final result for the rest of their life. So very powerful technology that what's so nice about it is you can show the patient, you want both eyes distance, you want both eyes near, you want one of each. Um, and, and so the power of being able to show them because we just can't use the same examining techniques in a cataract surgery like we do in a presbyopic contact lens or LASIK uh, evaluation where their media is clear and we can show them their options. We can't do that in cataract surgery. We have to paint word pictures. Whereas after we put in one of these implants, they have clear media and we can show them uh, their wonderful options. Now they do have to protect their eyes with UV protecting goggles and there's clear ones and there's sunglasses and either work just fine and people use a combination. But I think it's important to realize that in the FDA monitor trial, we achieved results that were as accurate uh, as LASIK with 91.8% getting within a half diopter with two light adjustments. And when we compare that to large studies on the accuracy of traditional implants that you can adjust, it's so much more accurate. And it's also quite comfortable. We do our regular surgery, do our regular refraction, dial it into a light delivery device that looks a lot like a YAG laser that we sit up to and do our light adjustments. It really brings refractive surgery uh, into the office rather nicely with being able to adjust the power of an implant. And here I've achieved 360 degrees of capsular overlap, what I'll be talking about in my next lecture with uh, the light adjustable lens. And I'm actually doing a treatment right there. Um, and it doesn't take very long, typically in the 60 seconds to two minutes. And what I like about it, again, is you can show the patient their options. And it's just a wonderful technology to work closely with optometry. And you know how well monovision can work when you are you, you know, doing a precision approach, really nailing that distance eye. And then, of course, getting that 
reading eye. And one of the beauties of this technology in the reading eye, if you adjust it from the hyperopic side, you actually get about a half diopter of extended depth of focus in that process. And so a minus one with the light adjustable lens is often giving you what minus 1.5 would give you in a monofocal monovision situation. The toric accuracy is awesome too, because once you've had all the, the healing from the incision and, and the final effective lens of incision is established, uh, you can take care of the astigmatism also. And post-refractive, um, we fully enrolled that clinical trial and it went just beautiful. Um, and, and, and so we now uh, do these in our practice and it's been just wonderful. Like for instance, this patient, 62 years old, um, I saw her in January of 19 and she had had a 2006 hyperopic LASIK for three diopters. In 2008, a lift flap and laser and an astigmatic keratotomy in 2010. And this is an unusual and hyperopic journey because of epithelial remodeling and all the things that don't lead to the same stability as in a myopic LASIK. And now, She's in with uncorrected vision at 20, 30 minus two in each eye with some residual refractive error, corrects to 2025 20, minus two, glares down to 2060, has nuclear sclerotic cataracts, and she wants multifocal implants. And it's probably the last thing I want to do for her, but she wants the spectacle independence. Her topographies look good. She has nice, well centered, hyperopic, uh, you know, um, LASIK procedures but her epithelial thickness map, you know, is a mess. I mean, I just don't really want to touch this cornea. Again, we don't see the beautiful 50 microns of, of equal epithelium across both these corneas. We see, uh, you know, an irregular epithelium that's very thick. And what's even worse is when I quantify her corneal high order aberrations, wow, I mean, she's got 1.2, uh, on the right and 1.08 on the left. I'd love to see it be under 0.4 or even less for a multifocal. And so I told her, I don't want to touch your cornea because of these issues. I suggest a light adjustable lens. That's what she did. And she ended up just beautiful, ended up really happy. I was so happy I didn't have to touch her cornea. Now, if she'd have had and corneal high order aberration index of 0.116, like this patient, I'd have been very happy to do a, a, a multifocal lens. Now we're also doing an extended depth of focus study uh, for uh, the light adjustable lens and it's in an FDA monitored trial right now. What's so beautiful is for the first time in the history of implants, we're centering the multifocality on the undilated pupil. And as you know, the pupil and the lens, and we'll be talking about this in my next lecture, aren't necessarily you know, married. Uh, and so sometimes you see that multifocal optic not as centered maybe as nicely as you would like. Whereas, you know, this is just like LASIK, we're centering it on the pupil. And I think this has an, an, an exciting future. Now, um, as far as how we want to deliver this, I got to mention a little bit about the experience because premium IOLs anymore are a want versus necessarily a need. And the most impact I've had in my practice is working on my patient experience and, and studying it and realizing that the true differentiator is the people I work with and how do I educate them? Well, we buy the books and we read the books and we do breakout sessions and look at things like which face looks more attractive here? Well, I think you'd say the one on the left that is actually looking at you. You can see the one on the right, she's not. And coaching your team on the importance of smile and eye contact, even if they're just on the phone. I like to call it the science of nice. And I think the patient experience is really the missing link in really understanding how to take care of your patients. And, you know, this team first mentality, of course, we took this oath that we're going to do the best for our patients. But John Wooden said, we got to, you know, love our team to get the best out of them. And when we really look at ourselves as, as doctors, you know, do I care so much about my coworker that I'm kind to him and I think about him as work family and, and every day I say hi. And when I interview people, I'm thinking about others and, and, and their influence on them. And when I'm deciding to close the clinic for a holiday, I'm thinking about their joy and not my cost and all these things 
that if my team answered them, they would say, I treat them that way. That's how you build a great patient experience by having a great team experience and then understanding what your customer values and what they expect, a motivator versus a hygiene factor. And I think that a lot of doctors think the motivators are technology, talent, and experience. And I say, no, patients expect that when they come in. If you want to differentiate yourself, it's how you treat these patients. It's how you made them feel. And I think setting up a great patient experience is really important, including great patient education. I don't spend a lot of time on the details of technology, but I do spend a lot of time on how do you want to use your vision when you're done? And I make time for these patients. And I want these advanced implant patients to understand the importance that we got to hit the refractive endpoint and that sometimes 2020 isn't enough. Small corrections matter. Just show them. If they matter, they need the enhancement. Dry eye really matters. Surface irregularities really matter. And if you have a 2020 uncorrected patient, and they're not happy, do a gas perm over refraction. If it helps, it's dry eye or surface irregularity. And I tell them it's multiple split steps plus time. Advanced implant, laser fine tune, oftentimes a YAG laser. Not a lot different than traditional, but you got to realize we got to optimize this. And then there's neural adaptation. So I tell my patients that's three steps plus one year, and that if you're ready to embark on a one-year journey, at the end of it, you'll have some of the world's most advanced optics in your eyes, and I think you'll be happy. We call our patients, even if they're co-managed, we are seeing how they're doing at two and three months. We keep in touch because it's a lot of information. And neural adaptation, as I get to the end here, Jack Holliday showed this in some of his writings, the quick phase and the longer phase. And if you just look at that blue dot, you can see the image on either side is pretty equal. Just stare at the blue dot. Keep staring at the blue dot. You know the left image is blurrier, but your right image is trying to be blended by your brain. And I'm gonna now go back to the equal images and you can see the right one is blurry right now because that was your brain trying to equalize it with the left. Now things are blending out. Neural adaptation is real and we need to be talking about these with our patients preoperatively. But if you follow this three steps plus one year and some of the things I talked about, I think you'll find the premium IOL patient journey uh, will really be just a wonderful thing to grow in your practice. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Vance. That was, that was excellent. Um, just going to get this pulled back up. So um, our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Scott McRae. Um, Dr. McRae is a professor of ophthalmology and a professor of uh, visual science at the University of Rochester. He is also medical director for the Flom Eye Institute's Refractive Surgery Center, where he provides laser vision, vision correction and advanced uh, corrective procedures related to refractive error. In collaboration with other FEI faculty, Dr. McRae is currently working on research centered on improving refractive outcomes in corneal laser ablation and intraocular lens implantation. He is also part of a multidisciplinary team working to use non-ablative laser technology to change the corneal refractive index. Scott studied medicine at the University of Wisconsin um, and also completed his residency at the University of Wisconsin. He went on to complete two cornea fellowships, um, the first at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and then a second at Emory University. He spent 16 years at Oregon Health Sciences University, after which he joined um, our faculty at the University of Rochester. Dr. McRae has more than 100 scientific articles, presentations, and book chapters to his credit. He also patented one of the world's most widely used LASIK nomograms, as well as other technologies. He is the 2017 recipient of the Jose Barraquer Award and a Lands Award winner. Please welcome Scott. Um, his talk will be Messing with Your Vision, 20 Years of Surprises and Learning with Wavefront. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. And uh, Vance, thank you for that great talk. Every time I listen, uh, 
listen to your talk, um, I get excited about uh, um, improving uh, patient satisfaction and, and working with my office staff. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we've learned. Um, let me get my screen up. There we go. Can you see my screen okay? Perfect, Scott. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons we've learned um, over the past 20 years from Wayfront um, here at the University of Rochester. It really kind of started with Dave Williams's group here at the U of R and his um, developing ad adaptive optics. And um, over the past 20 years, uh, I've worked with a group of um, visual scientists uh, at the Center for Visual Science group and learned an incredible amount about how we actually see, which I think um, uh, is we as clinicians are learning more and more and, and great, great practices like Vance, who uh, Vance's practice who uh, is really, really digging into uh, uh, how, to, how to link that basic science with, the, with uh, practical day-to-day -day work um, uh, really, really helps us understand what the limits are in terms of being able to optimize vision for our patients, particularly those cataract um, surgery patients and, and also corneal refractive surgery patients that are so demanding. So um, some of the things that I've learned, I'm gonna try to share with you and then, I'm going to tell you about a very exciting study that Jack Holliday, Sam Mascott, myself, and Walter Stark did with the Academy and the FDA um, over the past three years. And we we're starting to get some really um, powerful data uh, from that really large uh, study that we did with industry. So, let's see if I can advance. I have a hard time advancing this. Okay, I'm, so um, my objectives are to review some of the um, uh, IOL preferences um, that surgeons have, also deter determine su su successful strategies for monovision using the concept of binocular summation and, um, and kind of linking that with, with uh, how our, um, uh, with neuroadaptation and also talk about uh, pre-screening IOL patients using the language that both the surgeon and the patient understand. Advances are so tuned into this uh, in terms of patient and his staff communication. But one of the problems we have is that we don't have a common language yet. We haven't had an accepted standard. And I'm gonna to talk to you about, about a study that, um, the, or a huge study that's being conducted by the RAND Corporation and the Academy uh, to uh, link the subjective responses of the patient post IOL pre and post IOL with uh, what, what we classically look at as um, different uh, visual symptoms. So, well, how do we communicate about vision? Vision is actually really hard to describe if we're not on the same wavelength uh, with our patients. Uh, when a patient says I have bad vision or blurred vision, that's a very vague term. So we have to kind of narrow that down and in one of the, in, the, this talk, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we're narrowing that through this large study that we're doing. Um, and that interaction between the patient and the doctor, Vance is, there's nobody better in talking about this than Vance Thompson uh, in terms of communication and being on the patient's wavelength. And that is so critical when you're trying to decide how you're going to select a different strategy for either a, a LASIK patient or a, um, a cataract patient or, or whatever, that you really need to listen to what the patient's needs are. And there are some things that we, we've learned over the years about multi, from multifocals. And one of the things I think, and I'd be interested in advance and other people's opinion, but one of the things I've observed is visual discontinuity is bad. In other words, um, if you have a big difference between two eyes, and, and these have been sort of confused confirmed through basic science studies that I'll show you. But if there's a big difference between the two eyes, um, that is difficult because the brain is having to, the brain is having to sort of neuroadapt, trying to uh, either suppress the one image that's markedly different than the other. 
And, um, and so the level of satisfaction with that is less than if the images are better matched. Visual continuity is good. So if there is overlap of images, as I'll show you in just a minute, that's good. The brain likes that, patients like that. And so that's why I think um, sometimes we see that uh, when you use like a restore three or four, it might not be quite as well tolerated because there's so much disparity between the distance and the near image. Um, and you need some, uh, some gap to kind of fill in uh, and uh, get that intermediate vision uh, clear so the brain can reconcile those two images. Um, and one of the reasons I think that's more problematic is that there's a gap there. And so what we're seeing, <clears throat> we're seeing in Europe and Asia is that the trifocals are much more successful, let's say, than just a bifocal uh, intraocular lens. The EDOFs also are successful because there's a there's sort of a blend uh, from distance to near uh, that the brain can reconcile better. Um, binocular vision camouflage is a uniocular vision gap. So one of the interesting things that we've learned over the years is that you can mix and match. We didn't really know that. Uh, but it actually works pretty well. I'm going to move this a little bit because I'm getting sun in my office here. Um, so, uh, so mix and match does actually work and modified monovision is actually quite successful as well. And I'll show you um, why that is. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, the trifocals have really uh, taken off in Europe and Asia. And now in the United States, um, the panoptic uh, is, is becoming very, uh, very popular as well. And I think one of the reasons is there's, there's no visual discount, discontinuity, there's no gap. So um, some of the things we've learned, basically the brain adapts to mix and match. It doesn't really matter. The patients are saying, well, I can see two different images uh, when I go oh, close one eye and then alternate eyes. And uh, what I basically just tell them is, well, how do you see? And the you see with both eyes. And so I just encourage them not to get too obsessed with the difference between uh, one eye and another, but just to basically uh, accept that adaptation. And I tell them a little bit, just like uh, Vance is talking about, I tell them about the brain neuro adapting to that and how you're, you're, you have this thing called binocular summation where the two eyes actually uh, adapt to that. And why does that happen? It's because there's no gap. So um, in addition to that, as clinicians, we need to sort of not apologize for uh, having binocular uh, patients. Um, we should strategize with both eyes. Uh, and um, sometimes you might want to shoot for distant vision in, one, in the dominant eye and a little bit more near in the other eye. That actually gives patients greater depth of focus and uh, keeps them more functional. So um, I encourage clinicians not to apologize if one eye is emetropic and the other eye is a little bit myopic. I just talk to them about how they have greater depth of focus and um, that keeps them more functional. Now, if you have an engineer that's super fussy about that uh, and they want absolutely both eyes fully corrected, that's okay. Um, we can go back and actually, like Van says, we can go back and fine tune that with uh, refractive surgery. This is taken from a study that was done uh, a couple of years ago, primarily on anterior segment specialists. Uh, and they basically asked, you know, what intraocular lens would you like? And they showed a uh, preference for either monofo monofocal lenses or for monofocal lenses set for monovision. And I thought that was really interesting. 61% um, of the clinicians basically either wanted monofocal or, or, or monovision alternative. 26% of that group actually wanted monovision. Um, I do monovision and it actually really works really well and I'm pretty happy with that. So um, it, it's interesting why that's so successful. 13% uh, noted that they um, preferred a diffractive achette, which is basically uh, like an EDOF um, type lens like the Symphony. 9.5% at that time were um, opting for um, a multifocal um, diffractive type system. Uh, and a small percentage uh, with accommodating lenses. So let's talk a little bit about how we can optimize monovision using adaptive optics. This is taken from some excellent work by Gunyun's group. 
and um, their lab here at the University of Rochester. But um, to understand this, I think we need to go back to the basic studies. Uh, Melanie Campbell and uh, Green years ago did a study in 65, basically showing that two eyes are better than one. If they're fully focused, let's say at distance or near or whatever, you get binocular summation basically. And uh, you don't have to worry about these fancy formulas, but the important thing is that it's by a factor of square root of two, which means that there's about a 40% improvement in vision when you have binocular summation, when you have, sorry, when you have both eyes that are uh, fully focused, let's say at distance, um, if they're both smack on, you're gonna get a 40% improvement in, in contrast sensitivity. In addition, you'll probably get maybe one or two lines better on a visual acuity chart uh, as well. So two eyes are better than one if they're fully focused. This is taken from um, some classic work that by Pardham where he looked at binocular summation. And it basically shows that when, um, when we do monovision, if both eyes are in focus uh, at distance, then uh, you get binocular summation as shown over here uh, up above, about a 40% improvement. But as you separate the two eyes, one eye for distance, one eye for near, um, you get a reduction in that binocular summation and binocular contrast. And uh, once you get to about 1.5 diopters, there's what we call binocular neutrality, where two eyes are uh, equivalent to the best eye at whichever different distant, distance. Let's say if it's a distance, uh, if you're looking at distance, the eye in focus at distance, um, you'll get that amount of uh, visual acuity. Uh, whereas if you're in focus at near, uh, you'll get that level of visual per performance at near. But once you go beyond that, you actually have binocular suppression. In, otherwise, in other words, two eyes are actually worse than one. Uh, when the two eyes are markedly different, the brain has to work harder to suppress the non-focused image. And, um, and you'll find that patients are less happy. And that's why I say that you know, gaps in vision are not necessarily a good thing. You want some continuity in that. And let's, um, let's look at that um, through the University of Rochester uh, adaptive optic system that um, Gun Young built here at the U of R. So um, this is one of the two uh, adaptive optic systems in the world where um, you can, this, I'm just gonna show you one eye for initially here where we have a wave front sensor that detects all the aberrations of the eye. We can correct those out and we can add in aberrations. We can selectively say, well, I wanna add a little bit of spherical aberration or a little bit of coma and see how the visual performance is. And uh, the way that we do that is we have a deformable mirror that can actually correct out the aberrations and then add in uh, the aberrations. It's a mirror with little pistons behind it that in real time, 20 times a second can change uh, based on what, what we're um, detecting from the wavefront uh, in that particular eye. And then we can start doing visual testing using contrast sensitivity uh, and different visual tests, visual acuity, contrast sensitivity. We can not only do that in one eye, we can do the same thing in another eye. And there are only two systems in the world that have this, Paulo Artel's group in Murcia, Spain, and uh, Gun Young's group here at the University of Rochester. Very, very powerful technology. And the industry has looked, you know, there are a number of companies that have had uh, Gun Young do studies looking at uh, different strategies uh, using this. So let's take a look at some of the strategies. Um, well, what happens with traditional monovision is you get a good focus and, and here the patients in the adaptive optic system, you get um, optimal, basically diffractive limited, diffraction limited vision uh, in the distance eye and diffractive li limited vision in the uh, near eye, you get really, really good vision, but in this intermediate area, it's not quite as good. Uh, and then we test the visual performance and we find that there's a large interocular difference between the eyes uh, and there's a very short monocular depth of focus as a result of that. Uh, you can see here and here, but you can't see very well in that intermediate uh, range, uh, that computer range, let's say. Uh, or a little less than the, uh, uh, the computer. So, but we can add in 
spherical aberration uh, with this. And basically um, when we do that, um, let's go ahead. So, um, so here um, we can compare traditional monovision to doing uh, a little bit of spherical aberration addition. And if you look carefully, now the, the E becomes much clearer compared to that monofocal eye. The E gives you a much greater depth of focus. But the interesting thing is that this image is kind of close to that image. And the brain now can take those two, the, it, the image from each eye and start fusing that image. So that, so that there is um, some overlap and there's better binocular summation. And when we actually look at this, um, we find when we compare um, traditional monovision, which is shown here to uh, a modified monovision where we've added in a little bit of spherical aberration, basically we find the visual acuity per performance is better. The uh, binocular summation factor is better. Contrast sensitivity is better um, because of that overlap because of that um, binocular summation that we're getting uh, uh, from this. In addition, the stereo acuity actually improves as well, comparing traditional monovision to modified monovision. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, a study that we've done uh, on uh, dysphotopsias. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to go into that in more detail, but, um, this is a study that Sam Mascot, Jack Holiday, myself, and Walter Stark did. Gun Young Yun, uh, who I just mentioned, uh, actually was uh, critical in this study, uh, and we're all indebted to him, uh, both nationally and internationally, for the work that he's been doing on this. Uh, dysphotopsias are not are, are are not adequately really described with the current uh, patient-reported outcomes that the companies have. There, we're comparing apples to in oranges. Uh, with all these different uh, questionnaires that companies are using and using for their FDA studies. Uh, the, the, um, the group recommended developing a questionnaire to better measure dysphotopsias following cataract surgery with IOL implantation, and they needed to have something that was validated. Now, this is a massive, this is a massive project. These are the different uh, dysphotopsias, and for time, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail except to say that there are positive dysphotopsias such as glare and halo and, uh, and, and uh, different types of dysphotopsias as a result of too much light or poorly uh, focused light and the negative dysphotopsias, which are basically a, a lack of light. And then there's also entopic phenomena, but we're not gonna talk much about that. You can see here's a demonstration of an entopic phenomena but um, these are some of the results that we got from our FDA study. This is the reference image. This is the image that Gun Young Yun here at the University of Rochester developed for this large study. It was critical uh, for us to have these images. And basically, um, this is a, a 64, question, 64 question questionnaire that um, goes in and asks uh, a large group of patients, 700 patients, it was sponsored by industry. It was almost a million dollar study over, um, we took us three years to do this. But basically um, the, the study was run by the RAND Corporation and they actually at first brought a subgroup, several subgroups of study patients in and they showed them this image. And they said, well, how would you describe that? And the word they came up with is halo. Um, that was coming from the patient. And they did a study group with all these 13 different images and basically uh, found what the patient would actually describe halo or starburst or snowballing looks like. And I'll show you those in just a second. Um, in the last seven days, how often did you see that? Did you see it with your glasses on, with your glasses off? What time of day, day or night? Uh, was it mild, moderate or severe? And how much did it bother you? And then they correlated with the patient's level of satisfaction. So now we know, you know what halo or snowballing or or starburst glare is, but we also know how the level of satisfaction afterwards, in other words, how disabling or how, uh, how much it affect the patient. And basically we found two major groups. This is the study, that, study group that was done. This was done at um, 14 different centers, uh, all excellent cataract surgery centers that do a lot of work with industry. 
Uh, in this study, we, this is the pre-op data, we found that 84% of the patients had uh, reported poor or only fair vision. 36% reported poor, 48% fair. The other um, question that was asked in terms of, uh, of patient satisfaction, uh, we asked how satisfied were they and 83% were either very dissatisfied uh, or somewhat dissatisfied. And these are the numbers here. I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. There were two prominent symptom groups, the blurry vision group, which had blurry vision in the glare group, which consisted of starburst, streaking, halos, or snowballs. And this is the pre-op data. Here's the blurry vision group. It's characterized by a loss of high spatial frequency. That's different than haze, which is a loss of high spatial frequency, or which, in which high spatial frequency is maintained. So I'll go back. Here's the blurry vision group. Here's the haze group, um, and you can see there's a difference. So this actually, the patients gave us those words uh, in those subgroups. And then um, we, we went out into the 700 patient group and showed them those images, and that's what they responded to. So these, these blurry vision symptoms were most common during the daytime, uh, and they were, they were present in about 67% of patients uh, preoperatively, that dropped down to 22%. There was a 45% decrease in symptoms at the six-month interval. Uh, so we, we also surveyed these patients at six months. Um, the interesting thing is that there's still some uh, symptomatology. Now, this was a large group of monofocal and multifocal uh, patients, and they included the symphony, uh, in all the commonly uh, used multifocals in the United States. So we, it's a large, uh, it's a very large cohort that's gonna allow us to articulate and to validate a subjective questionnaire. These are the, this is the glare group uh, where, um, and these are the actual terms that the patient used. This is snowballing, this is uh, starburst, this is halo, and this is streaks. Um, and this is what we call the glare group. And Jack Holiday <laughs> worked in, in, and Gun Young worked really, really hard to uh, make sure that these uh, terms were exactly right. Uh, in, the, in the glare group, uh, and this was after 500 eyes, we're still getting further data in the next couple of months. I think we'll have the six month post op data finalized. But in the, in the pre op glare group, in the glare group preoperatively, uh, these, this was the most dominant symptom, and it typically occurred at night. It did not occur often during the day. Only 10% of the patients noted it during the daytime. So it's like, it's like Dracula. It comes out at night, and uh, we as clinicians know that as well. It was present in 83% of uh, patients preoperatively, but postoperatively, there were still a fair amount of patients that had glare, but it was significantly reduced in terms of the uh, severity. So, but there was a 47% decrease in glare. And again, here's what the glare group looks like, snowball, starburst, halos, and streaks. So stay tuned for uh, more information. The data is um, coming in over the next couple of months and we're gonna be pre presenting this uh, uh, in numerous meetings. The European Society is very interested in this data as well. Um, so thanks for your interest and, uh, and I'll try to give you an update on this report next year. And uh, Scott, uh, absolutely uh, stunning, stunning lecture. And, um, you know, uh, this idea of visual discontinuity is bad and, and visual continuity is very good and bifocal, you know, gaps versus trifocal gaps. I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing higher patient satisfaction in, in these trifocal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cases. And I, I, I just loved your, you know, uh, work in monovision and binocular summation and telling us, you know, why uh, it works so well and, and where we start to get in trouble. And just the, the work you do to, you know, make our clinical practices better is absolutely amazing. And, 
one of the reasons I've been a fan of yours for 30 years. And I'm going to, um, you know, uh, talk about something that, that I'm really passionate about. Um, and maybe it comes from being uh, so passionate about corneal refractive surgery and centration. And, you know, we're always talking about centering on the pupil versus the visual axis when it comes to PRK and LASIK. When it comes to cataract surgery, um, you know, centering sometimes doesn't get the same attention. And it's such a powerful and, and successful procedure that I think sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need the same level of attention to make a lot of our patients happy. But if we're really going to optimize their results on the short and long run, some of these principles um, that I don't necessarily think are new, uh, but I'm going to try to bring together, uh, you know, on how I feel about them in this talk. And these are my uh, disclosures and some of the companies I do uh, implant research with. And so our goals in cataract surgery are, are really both anatomic and optical. I mean, we want to, you know, in the end, have an implant that's well centered. But if we're going to want an implant that's well centered on the long run, we better give special attention to our capsulotomy because uh, the capsulotomy is probably the second most powerful refractive uh, component to cataract surgery besides the implant itself. And achieving 360 degrees of overlap of the anterior ca capsule optic is something I try to go for in every surgery. And if, and if I don't achieve it, I actually, I, I, I feel like I just didn't do my best job. So, you know, centering both is so important and how we do that is going to be, you know, basic, the basic uh, premise of this discussion. Because then after a YAG laser capsulotomy, that, that implant on the long run is going to be happy because of that capsular overlap. And I, I think uh, the femtosecond laser, especially OCT guided, and, and when you do an, uh, a femtosecond laser, a lot of these lasers will give you a choice. Do you want to have your capsulotomy centered on the pupil? Or do you want to have it centered on the capsule? And, uh, and, and Scott, maybe you can teach me, but I can't think of a reason we would ever center it on the, the pupil. Uh, I always am trying to center it on the capsule because I want to get that, that overlap. And maybe there's a happy place in between, but you know, centering capsulotomies can be done manually. And I use an optical zone marker. Uh, with an epithelial imprint, uh, but then I'm following a corneal mark to do a lenticular procedure, but it can be done. And I do it a lot, all the time in my traditional cataract surgeries. It can also be done with the Zepto device, uh, which is another form of, you know, what I would call a more automated capsulotomy. And, and um, whatever technology we're doing, um, I just think it's so important that we, uh, think about centering both. And it really is uh, the goal being that our implant not tilt or decenter on the long run. Because it's such a bummer to have it in a beautiful position in the beginning and then have it tilt and decenter. Because when you tilt and decenter an implant, um, a lot of the, the nighttime uh, issues that, that Scott was talk about, talking about become accentuated and are really, you know, difficult uh, to take care of. I mean, when you have an implant that's fibrosed in there and tilted and decentered, and now you're going back in, it's a, it's not an easy surgery. So prevention is definitely the best. And so getting overlap of that optic. So let's pretend that the brown is a lens and not a cataract, um, and that that overlap is critically important because the germative zone, the lens epithelial cells that are, you know, uh, um, really the most active are, you know, in the equator um, and 
mostly on the anterior capsule in its uh, uh, mid and, and peripheral aspect. And what we're trying to do is respect those cells because if you do this and don't achieve overlap, that anterior capsule leaflet fusing to the posterior capsule sets up a sequence of events that can lead to an aggressive form of capsular contraction that can tilt and decenter uh, the implant. And again, this isn't new. Um, David Apple's group, for instance, talked a lot about really two different types of PCO. And for those of you doing uh, YAG laser capsulotomies, um, you, you know that, you know, that kind of, you know, pearl type PCO that's less aggressive that sometimes takes 10 to 15 pulses is, uh, feels way better than someone who has that leathery capsule that takes 300 pulses that, you know, um, is, is in the implant is oftentimes not in the position that it should have been. And he taught us that apposition of the anterior capsule edge onto the posterior capsule uh, is dangerous. And others have said the same thing. Um, you know, the, and, and, and that and an apposition of the anterior and posterior capsule places the eye at a <clears throat> higher risk for a fibrosis type PCO or, uh, and just paper after paper of how we wanna prevent this including Alan Carlson's survey article that showed that incomplete overlap, um, you know, is actually something that leads to a capsular fusion that can be progressive. And over time, you can get this complete uh, fusion of the anterior capsule to the posterior capsule that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, I call capsular fusion syndrome and it can affect vision. And so this group compared a small capsular excess to a large capsular excess that was off the optic. And they showed that the large capsulotomies were associated with significantly more wrinkling and worse posterior capsule opacification than the small capsular excess. And the patients with the large capsular rexus had significantly poor visual acuities and a trend towards worse contrast sensitivity. And so this effect of allowing the anterior capsule to fuse when you have not achieved overlap and gotten that barrier effect to prevent it is real. Just look again at the large capsulotomy and how aggressive that looks and the small capsulotomies and how delicate that capsular fibrosis looks. And you can look um, at wrinkling and see how much uh, uh, worse it is with large capsulotomies. You can, you know, look uh, at other things, um, you know, such as, uh, the, you know, the, the, the percent PCO being so much greater with a large capsulotomy. And you can literally look at vision and see that vision uh, with a small capsulotomy is better. Um, and, and, and more days after surgery, it starts to even become more obvious. So how do we prevent this from happening? Well, um, I love this paper by Dan Chang and George Waring, the subject fixated coaxially sighted corneal light reflex which is basically using the first Purkinje image with the patient fixating well, and is a good start to centering cataract surgery a lot like we do in LASIK and utilizing these Purkinje images. The Purkinje images um, are really the, the basis of, you know, what we would call specular reflection, you know, also known as regular reflection that you see in, in many other uh, you know, areas of life, but you also see them in cataract surgery. And they were first described by Dr. Perkinji, who described a lot of things, uh, not only in our nervous system, the central nervous system, the Perkinji cells, but many other things, including these Perkinji reflexes. And you hear 
the Prakinji Sanson, and Sanson was a French ophthalmologist who also actively uh, taught and found value in the Prakinji images. But I think that these images aren't sometimes utilized to their fullest. I'm pointing at Prakinji image three there, it looks real diffuse, but this first Prakinji image is the brightest image here. And the second Prakinji image is the uh, second brightest. Um, and there they're aligned and they have a unique relationship when a patient fixates that I think is very valuable because let's say that they've had anesthesia and they can't fixate. I can manually recreate this relationship between Purkinje one and four and center my capsulotomy in my implant. And so how we utilize those images, uh, you know, I think is really uh, important. And the optical axes and angles, uh, it gets a little confusing when we start talking about all this. So I'm gonna probably keep it a little bit more simple as we talk about the Purkinje light reflexes. And Purkinje image one is an upright image because it's coming off of a, a convex surface. And Purkinje image two off the posterior cornea is also an upright image because it's being reflected off a, a convex surface. Purkinje image three is also upright coming off a convex surface, but Purkinje image four is inverted. And so there's these four images and really, um, you know, I find one and two the most useful, but where these images actually reside as far as their image is of interest. Purkinje image one, even though it's a reflection off the anterior uh, cornea and basically the, the air tear interface, um, is residing in the anterior lens. Uh, the the Purkinje image two is a little bit anterior to it, but is so um, dim that it's not real useful. Purkinje image three off the anterior capsule resides in the vitreous, and Purkinje image four resides in the you know near the center of the lens. And that's why I find Purkinje image one four alignment to be so helpful. So when I start cataract surgery, I, I'm having that patient fixate and I'm looking at my relationship of one and four because it becomes very useful if that patient has too much anesthesia or the light is too bright in surgery and, or they just can't fixate well. I'm really, I really wanna know that relationship because I find it useful for centering both. And Jack Holliday uh, has helped me with a lot of uh, this. I remember we were at a triple IC meeting in Aspen and he said, Vance, go find a bi-convex uh, magnifier. I want to show you something. So I took my cell phone light and he showed me um, how, you know, uh, the reflections are a lot like looking at the lens. So I, I did it in my hotel room with the ceiling light and you can see uh, the Purkinje one here and Purkinje two here. And, and so, um, but what I found was I, I, just, I just couldn't tell which was, you know, uh, which easily, I figured this was Purkinje uh, to, you know, the, coming off the back of this lens. But so I took the candy wrapper and taped it to the light so I could be oriented. And then sure enough, uh, I could see the brightest was my, um, you know, first Purkinje, well, the first Purkinje image on this magnifier. And then the inverted uh, was off the posterior surface. And then, you know, I could align them even though our natural lens is naturally uh, tilted. Um, it, but it just was a good experiment for him to teach me about uh, the Brickenji images that, you know, I find so useful now in surgery. And by the way, with, I, I don't know if you can tell here, um, but this, 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 this shows you also on, on my Leica scope, that first Purkinje image, I think it looks like kind eyes, kind of a kind eye reflection. And the, in, the inverted fourth Purkinje image looks like sinister eyes. And, and you gotta get to know your scope. But in surgery, if that patient's not fixating, they're looking one way, you'll see one look to it. They look the other way, you'll see another look. And when they're 
looking at the light, you'll see what you know, you're looking for to center the procedure. And if they've had too much anesthesia, I was having a difficult time getting this patient to look and, and recreate the P1, P4 that I you know, wanted to center everything. So I just manually moved it there. And, and then now I can center the procedure on that. Jack Holliday thinks that you know, somewhere between the visual access and the pupil center is where to center things. But you know, you, for you to start thinking in this way for you know, optimizing patient satisfaction, whether it's centering on pupil center or slightly nasal, uh, you know, it, it, it's worth thinking about these things um, when you're trying to center a capsulotomy. And so if I'm doing it manually, I work really hard at this imprint. And I'm really wanting to make sure it's well centered. And, and, I, and you can't tell if that's centered yet because the patient's not fixating. Fixation is so important. So look at the light, boom. Now I can tell if I can recreate that during my capsulotomy and follow it on the lens underneath the cornea, I'm gonna have a well centered uh, capsulotomy. And here I am, you know, actually aligning it. You saw I used my 0.12s to align P1 and P4, um, and I'm doing my epithelial imprint, and then I'm just gonna, you know, do my capsulotomy. Now, you know, when you're doing what I call a refractive capsulotomy, there's a lot of stopping and reorienting your P1, P4, because the only way your corneal mark is of use is if that P1 and P4 is aligned somewhat like uh, it was um, with the patient fixating. But when you do that, um, it's amazing the beautiful overlap you can get by a nice capsulotomy. And here's this monofocal implant that has beautiful, I like to check the pressure with a baric tonometer, but this patient did just beautiful. And you can do the same thing with a femto. And, or, and, and I use the same Purkinje method with the Zepto also, which is a nitinol ring that I kind of call it like a cookie cutter. And this has been a, a big part of my uh, capsulotomy research, just like Femto um, and manual to tell you the truth. Um, but this little uh, silicone cup houses this nitinol ring. And I've described all this uh, in uh, the JCRS journal of using the P1 and P4 um, with the various techniques, but here's the Zepto, and hopefully uh, this video plays uh, because um, it's a big file, but you can see P1 and P4 are relatively aligned there, and then I turn on suction, and now I'm going to de deliver the energy uh, from the nitinol ring and it's going to create the capsulotomy. And then I'm going to release suction. You actually get a nice little hydrodissection with it also. And you can see I have a nice capsulotomy. And now when you see your implant like this, you're not done. I know my capsulotomy is well centered. I can center that implant better by spinning and, and appropriately nudging towards the P1, P4 image. And that patient um, is going to do you know, I think just beautiful. And so using P1 and P4 uh, can be so helpful um, when you, what, whether you're doing manual or you're doing Zepto. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of towards the end here, talk about the light adjustable lens again, but just imagine the red dot being the optic center and the green dot being the pupil center and the blue dot being the visual axis. In our EDOF trial, we are centering on the undilated pupil. And for the first time in the history of multifocality, we're going to, you know, we're centering the multifocality on the patient's pupil. Um, and so I'm really excited about this, more to come on that. And, and, and we have, you know, multifocal uh, loose lenses that we can actually show the patient postoperatively um, what that's going to look like. And so I like to, you know, not have this really be about any certain technology, but more about all the methods to get capsular overlap as you optimize your cataract surgery uh, by centering on the visual axis or as close to it as possible. Thank you.
Thanks, Dr. Thompson. That was uh, very interesting as a, as a pediatric ophthalmologist. I don't think of some of these things as, as often, and um, I think a lot of very useful um, tips there. Um, we're going to move on to our last speaker for the session, uh, Dr. Matt Geringer. Uh, Dr. Geringer is a professor of ophthalmology at uh, the Flam Eye Institute and also of uh, pediatrics at Colasano Children's. Uh, in addition to a very busy practice, he is the Associate Chair for Education at the Eye Institute um, with clinical interests in amblyopia and uh, child and adult strabismus. Matt is also a former residency program director um, and has become a leader in developing strategies on how we improve um, our resident education, including running a number of um, studies that uh, collaborating with other institutions. Matt has delivered more than 40 invited lectures or skill labs at conferences and meetings worldwide, and he's authored or co-authored dozens of peer-reviewed um, articles and book chapters. Matt received his medical degree from the University of Michigan and did his ophthalmology residency at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. He then completed a fellowship at Duke University in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus uh, before joining the uh, Flam Eye Institute. Uh, he's been annually selected as one of the best doctors in America since 2011. And today he's going to uh, present on clinic efficiency, reflections on office efficiency in the COVID era. Thanks, man. Let's see. So um, thanks for having me today. It's a little bit strange doing this in an office, not seeing people, and that'll uh, be reflected in some of my talk here. Um, it's been nice talking with Vance and Scott here. I will not have a whole lot of optics in this talk other than the word reflections in my title. I do agree with Scott that two eyes are better than one. That's a large part of my practice. Um, and I agree with Vance that focusing on patients and teams is uh, very important as well. This past year has been um, difficult for a lot of us. We pretty much most of us had a month or two of stopping our clinical practice uh, back in March of last year in April and had to restart. And the title of my talk is silver lining. So you can kind of think of dark clouds or lemons and getting silver linings or lemonade out the other side and how to deal with the major disruption in our clinical practice. So by the end of this talk, you're gonna be able to discuss the interplay of providers and technicians, patients in rooms in an efficient practice, and then learn how to create a dashboard to monitor your practice efficiency. And all of this is gonna be geared towards our trainees and people early in practice, but it might apply to some serious, uh, seasoned professionals as well. So looking back um, on New Year's Eve of 2019, a cluster of cases of pneumonia started in Wuhan in China. And I was learned that Wuhan is actually a city of 11 million people. So it's probably, it would be the largest city in America if it was here. It's about eight hours west of Shanghai and 12 hours uh, south of Beijing by car. And it started at this market. About three weeks later, uh, we had our first confirmed case in the US. It was a 35 year old man in Snohomish County, Washington, who presents at his hospital with uh, cough and fever four days after returning from visiting his family in Wuhan. About six weeks later, we had our first case in Monroe County on March 12th. And on that Saturday, March 14th, it's strong. We ended all non-emergent clinical operations and surgeries, and they're suspended indefinitely. And on St. Patrick's Day last year, we had our first death in Monroe County. And I think in the early days, we were looking at graphs like this uh, on the very left edge, and we had cases growing from the single digits to the double digits. We didn't really know what to expect. We're thinking maybe three months, maybe six. I don't know if any of us were expecting a full year plus of dealing uh, with this pandemic. Um, this was uh, McQuaid's spring musical last year. My daughter is one of the dancers on the left here. Uh, and this was going on from March 11th to 14th. So this was when awareness was growing in the community that things were happening. And uh, it was set for having six performances and the last few were canceled. Uh, because of the, the outbreak. Um, the last show was attended only by parents in a very sparsely uh, attended auditorium. 
and every single cough or sneeze was greeted with anxious uh, glares from the rest of the crowd. Uh, soon after we turned our uh, living rooms and dining rooms into classrooms for our students, Zoom became a real uh, a thing that we all had to live with. And we learned that uh, drive-through graduations were gonna happen. This is my daughter on her graduation last year. Um, as the days went on and we weren't seeing patients, we had to try to stay sane. And my approach on some of these days was just to be mindless. We often talk about mindfulness in practice, but I think mindlessness is also helpful. So did lots of hikes, seeing new places, um, did thousand piece puzzles with the family. And I got back to the bare necessities here and forgetting about my worries and my strife. Um, other things we did, we adopted new hobbies or renewed past hobbies. Ben uh, took up sourdough um, baking. Um, I used grains and yeast for other effects and doing home brewing and exploring the world of cocktails. And I think a lot of us had this disconnect. I remember my um, end of year meeting with uh, Dave in June last year and saying that I felt lacking motivation. I think there was some concern on his part about that and mine as well. And I don't think it was really burnout. Um, but I think a lot of us had this experience. And this is a quote from a, uh, a monk in the fifth century, John Cassian, describing this Greek um, emotion of akedia, I think is how he'd say it in Greek. So he said that a mind seized by this emotion is horrified at where he is, disgusted with his room, it does not allow him to stay still in his cell or to devote any effort to reading. And he feels such bodily listlessness and yawning hunger as though he were worn by a long journey or a prolonged fast. Next, he glances about and sighs that no one is coming to see him. Constantly in and out of his cell, he looks at the sun as it were too slow in setting. And you know, sitting in an exam lane here on my own, um, I kind of recognize this emotion. I think understand this is not necessarily a burnout, but just this. Uh, emotion that deals with disconnection and exhaustion is, is a way to uh, acknowledge this to yourself and to others on what's going on in our, our daily lives. Um, once the pandemic hit, I think the priority for many of us was the safety of our families and our staff. Um, that first weekend, I found a um, pattern for face masks. My wife is very handy. She made about 40 masks for friends and family of all different colors. Um, in our offices, we went through processes on how to keep ourselves safe. And this is uh, an area on the desktop. We made these four red dots in the corner. We initially call it the cootie corner. Um, we moved it onto the COVID corner in front of patients. And if we touched an instrument or the patient touched an instrument, we put it in that corner to wash off afterwards. Uh, cavi wipes have become um, universal in our practices as well. A large part of uh, dealing with our staff uh, during the meetings in the first couple of weeks was talking about the proper way to stay safe. You know, how do you take on a mask when you're eating? So it's, you know, wash your hands, wash the table, take off your mask, put it down in a clean spot on the table, uh, eat your food, then wash your hands and put your mask back on. And just that information for the uh, staff to make them feel safe and that we were looking out for their best interests. And also kind of acknowledging their worries, you know, where they not willing to see patients that came with two parents, uh, for instance, and realizing that's just something we're not going to do if our staff does not feel safe for that. Um, informing our teams was also a high priority in my practice and looking at the early stages of, you know, what's happening in Monroe County, which is on the left here and what's happening in the rest of the world on the right. Um, and making sure they were very informed, which is difficult because there's a lot of misinformation then and throughout most of that year. I think you can look at the disruption that we all had. So in my practice, we shut down in mid-March um, and we're only seeing emergency patients through the end of April. And that was a big disruption. You can either say we're gonna restart and try to go back to the way things were or seize an opportunity to make your practice better and more efficient and starting from scratch. And I think some people's called building back better. Um, there are a couple books that I kind of relied on during this time. One was Synchrony. This is a book I'd read a number of years before that dealt with efficiency in the office. Uh, Dennis Hahn is a uh, right on the doc and talked about how to make his patient flow uh, work well. And the second book, I read this a number of years. I had two rowers uh, in my kids, and it's a talk about the, uh, the men's rowing team in the 1936 Olympics and how they came together as a team. 
And I think these visual mnemonics are very helpful, um, at least in my mind. So this is from Han's book. It talks about the difference between flowing of the team, the medical team, and the patient flow. And they need to be linked up. Um, you can't have the doctors working faster than the patients are coming in and vice versa. It's not going to be a very stable process. So if you design a system where those two gears are interlocked and working together, you'll have a, a good practice. The second kind of visual mnemonic I have for my team, at least, is talking about a rowing team. Um, and rowing, having experienced probably six years next to cold, muddy rivers with my kids, is just the ultimate in team coordination. Um, and you need to have everyone working together to get to the end of the race. And, you know, my team or in my boat, I have, you know, the doctors, the patients, the techs, the front desk staff, the testing technicians all need to be working for the same goal. And throughout my day, I'll be asking, you know, how is the boat going? And they all know what that means. You know, are we moving okay? Do we need to kind of reset and reestablish what we need to be doing to make it out? And, you know, my boat needs to get to that finish line at, you know, 12 o'clock in the morning so we can have lunch and four o'clock so we can get home on time. And if we're not doing that, then we have a, a bad boat that day. Luckily, most days we have a good boat with my team. Um, so discussing office efficiency, and this was really helpful to have that pause to rethink what we want to be doing. And Ron Plotnick uh, helped us develop this process for the pediatric team. And you don't need to look at every little single spot, but you can do this for any of your practices. It's just a patient flow. They come in, what happens to that patient as they go through? Where are the decision points? Where are the stoppages? And trying to find where in that process you can make things leaner, uh, eliminating these delays. In our practice, one simple thing we did was eliminate the waiting room. We had to do that out of necessity because of infection control. But by keeping the patient in the room during dilation, we saved a lot of patient movement going back and forth and really decreased the amount of time the patient needs to stay in the office and makes them happier and makes our day more efficient. The second way to look at efficiency is to look at right size in your practice. And this is uh, going to be the next few slides. And it's a way to coordinate your team with your doctors, your rooms, your technicians, your patients, and your schedule. And I'll go through each of these uh, components individually here. So looking at the doctor side, and this is how you can look at yourself as a practitioner and say, if I had infinite resources, if I had 20 rooms and 30 techs, five scribes, how many patients can I see in an hour? And this is your time, meaning what history do you need to do, whether it's reviewing the chart, talking with a patient, what exam elements are you performing on these patients? Um, what discussion do you need to have? And that's kind of your face-to-face -face time with the patient. And it should be your average patient mix. So in my practice, um, you know, I see a, a, probably half my patients are referral complex pediatric patients in adults with business, but 50% is kind of routine kids with refractive errors. 30% um, of my practice is new patients, 50% is Medicaid and under uh, insured patients, and probably 50 to 60% of patients are being dilated on any visit. So that's kind of my patient mix. Other specialties probably have different mixes. Um, so recognizing that average mix that you're having during the day, how long do you need to see the patient? Then you multiply that amount of time times the hours and you get the patients per session. So in my case, you know, I probably see seven to eight patients a minute. Um, sorry, <laughs> seven to eight minutes per patient, um, which is eight patients per hour. Um, so for a four hour session in the morning, I should be scheduling 32 patients for my maximum efficiency. Afternoon, if it's a three-hour session, it's 24 patients. Um, so that is how you right-size uh, your, yourself. The next element is the technicians. And in your practice with your average technician, your average patient mix, how long does it take your technician to work with a patient? Uh, you can then convert that to patients per session per tech. And then you need to schedule that amount of techs to cover your schedule. If you have too few techs in your schedule that day, Patients are going to back up because you're going to be waiting for your tax. So my tax and our initial guess was they took about 20 minutes to work up patients. That's three patients per hour per tech. And if I'm seeing eight patients per hour, I need three techs to handle that. Um, so we kind of made that case that um, we should have three techs for every one of my sessions. The last element is the rooms. Um, and this is a schematic of our uh, new Webster office that will be opening next spring. Our PEDS pod is located down in the bottom left corner here. We have four long exam lanes. 
And it's a pretty efficient layout. The room openings or the doors are all very close to each other. So you can walk simply between these four rooms and uh, work up easily. So in my mind, I need one room for each of my techs plus one for me to keep the rooms uh, flowing. The tech pod is right next door. The waiting room is very close as well. And then the nice thing about this off is we have all of our diagnostic areas right in the center of all of these pods between our subspecialists, our optometrists, and the peds docs. So there's not a whole lot of patient movement in this office. Um, so the last step is uh, the patients. And again, with that last slide, trying to limit unnecessary movement of the patients. In my practice, eliminating the waiting room for dilation was helpful to keep the patient in the room and limit their waste of time. And if you can get a patient in and out of your office and 30 or 45 minutes, they're gonna be very happy. Um, so looking at the schedule, you wanna look at what your rate limiting resource is. Ideally, that's gonna be the doctor where you're working at your maximum efficiency, you have enough rooms, enough techs, um, but your wait time to get in to see you is increasing because you've got a lot of patients. And if that's the case, it's, it's great. You just hire more docs and you have a building practice, which is awesome. Um, if your techs are a rate limiting resource, and we have this some days with techs calling out and I have one or two techs, um, you either need to hire more techs to cover your practice, or you can swing more of that work up to your doctors. You know, there's plenty of days where I say I'll have two techs and I say, you know, I'm going to see all the post-ops, so you don't need to worry about that, because I can do that in two minutes where it might take them 10 minutes to work up that patient. Um, if your patients your rate limiting stuff, and this might be the case in an, uh, when you're starting practice, we have excess of your time, but not enough patients, you should just run your most efficient sessions that you can and maybe only work four sessions a week and then have that extra time for research or administration or just free time to enjoy yourself until you get really busy. So again, this is kind of the mnemonic again. And if you have an efficient practice where your team is working efficiently, the patients are being scheduled efficiently, these gears are going to come together and you have a very stable process and a uh, in a happy group. So the team's not going to be waiting for patients. The patients aren't going to be more for the team that's going to work. Um, there are some days where I have extra time to walk around our clinic here on the third floor. And you can tell a lot about what you see. And sometimes you'll see techs are sitting there waiting. The rooms are all occupied and they're checking their email. In that case, you have an excess of techs. You might not need that many techs. The ideal situation when I walk through is having all the doors closed, they're all occupied, the waiting room is empty because that's an efficient practice. Um, if the waiting room's backing up, the doctor is taking too long or they have too many patients scheduled, um, those patients might wait a long time and not be very happy. So trying to balance those two flows of what your team can do and scheduling the right number of patients to come in to see the team makes it a good day and a good boat rowing down the uh, course there. If you look at my practice of the past few months, this is a uh, straight from your record, which gives a lot of great data. This blue line is the number of patients we've seen. So in November, December in my practice, we we're seeing 300, 350 with vacations and holidays. And in January, February with a more uh, full schedule were 450, 500 patients coming in per month. The green line and the purple line here are the wait times. So the green line is how long they wait to see the technician. This is about eight minutes uh, this past month. The purple line is how long they wait to see me. The doctor is about seven minutes. Um, so that's a pretty good flow. If I think if we look at the average for our departments, probably 20 minutes waiting for the tech, maybe 15 for uh, the doc. So I think if you concentrate on efficiency, you can really cut those times down and make your practice more efficient. The last thing I want to talk about with these last few slides is using dashboards. And I think this is a really helpful visual way to um, see how you're doing as a team or as a department. Um, ideally, dashboards are gonna be something that's measurable and meaningful and motivational. Um, last May, as we restarted, um, Dave came up with these dashboards and I think it was great for us. We had the unfortunate situation, we had to uh, furlough many of our staff um, that they had to, to go away uh, with the hopes of returning. And Dave had these goals. Um, if we see this many patients, we'll be able to return our staff and, and be a flamily again. Um, and in May, our goal was seeing 4,000 patients for that month. So each week we had this little speedometer dashboard that we exceeded each of those months. Um, and for the entire, each of those weeks, the entire month we saw uh, over our goal. 
In June, we increased that to 7,300 patients. Um, and, you know, in a safe way, we were able to make that goal and rehire all of our staff earlier than anyone else in the hospital. So these um, dashboards are easily measurable. They're motivational. They helped us get our patients or our staff back uh, off of furlough. I did this in my own practice looking at a few things. Um, when you're looking at creating dashboards for your practice, it's helpful to have only a few. So you don't want to have like 24 dashboards going on because they become meaningless. I had three that I was looking at as we restarted. Um, so this is looking back at last March, the start of pandemic through June. So the first four months of, of our um, disruption here. Um, the top line is what my prior two years were of patient visits, you know, somewhere in the 400 range and looking at what the pandemic months were. Um, and the last part is the percentage. Um, and I'm very into colors, I guess, you know, red is bad, green is good, and in between rainbow is in between. Um, so we can see in March, I was doing 60% because we had lost those last two weeks. April was almost zero patients. It was pretty much just seeing emergencies that were coming in. May we started back up and by June, I was back up to pretty much a normal um, patient volume for that month. Similarly, you could look at our views, and this is kind of a, a substitute for collections in our practice, how we look at things. And a similar uh, um, pattern to what the visits were, where it dipped dramatically in April and came back up to exceeding past months in our past years in June. And uh, looking at surgeries, um, March and April were down, and then it came back and rebounded to even uh, exceeding what normal months are for me in, in May and June. And if you look over the entire year, this is kind of cluttered, but I think just looking at the colors, we had really bad months in March, April, May, and came back to being you know pretty good for the rest of the year. And having these few things that you look at with your practice, whether it's wait times um, or visits or collections, um, is a good way to look at your practice with these dashboards. So that's my talk. Um, thanks for everything you all have done this past year. It's been trying for all of us. I'm proud to be a member of our community and. Um, have done good work safely uh, restarting our practices. We now have some time for uh, questions and answers and, and discussion. Again, um, there are three ways that you can uh, participate in this. You can ask a question on the Q&A tab, um, which is down on the bottom toolbar. You can also put a question into the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, there are a few um, chat things that have already come up um, and I'm just going to uh, present these for uh, the, the whole group. So the first question comes from Dr. Marcos and this is uh, for Dr. Thompson. Um, Dr. Marcos points out um, that the Purkinje uh, one through four can be used for a lot of different things um, including looking at tilt and um, foveal alignment. Um, and she had a question about whether uh, intraoperatively, are you using the separation between P1 and P4 as a landmark uh, that you want to reproduce uh, when you've got your implanted IOL? Uh, well, first of all, when Suzanne asks me a question, I get intimidated because she's the world's smartest at this stuff. And so Susanna, whatever I can do to make this better, uh, I'm actually gonna go to your publication too. So thank you for giving that reference. But I think of it as, you know, let's say my index finger is Purkinje one, the corneal light reflex. And the patient looks at the light and it's a valuable uh, landmark. Um, but if they can't look at the light, I just want to have it in my head what the relationship of P1 and 4 were at the time of reliable fixation. So if they, you know, uh, fixate, you know, uh, somewhere else, I still can see a beautiful, you know, corneal light reflex, but P4 is over here. And it's just a little indicator that something's not right. And, and then if I haven't, you know, I just say, no, look, look at the light, boom. And, and Scott knows we'll use little tricks. If they're looking to the left, we'll say, well, look at the right side of the light. And then we'll try to have them go a little past and then center them. But if they can't do that, then I 
and they're looking this way because uh, of anesthesia or whatever, I manually recreate the relationship I saw between P1 and P4 and then center uh, on P1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, Scott. That's, uh, that's, that's really clear uh, and it, it makes complete sense. Uh, in, in one of the subsequent papers, I, uh, <laughs> after the one I referred to, it, this is exactly what we're finding, that the tilt of the intraocular lens before and after surgery is very similar. So probably the surgeon uh, was uh, either uh, dealing with, uh, with patients that were fixating very well or using something um, like your, 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 your strategy to, uh, to make that alignment. But yeah, um, this is something that you can measure um, before and after uh, surgery, and and we found that it was it's preserved. So it made complete complete sense to preserve um, this relationship between the uh, lens orientation and the cornea and the off axis uh, alignment of the of the fovea because uh, we found that. Uh, this, uh, this is actually a compensation happening for coma when um, that happened in the, in, in, in the natural eye that you want to preserve. And it seems that it's exactly what you're doing. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Can I ask you another, can I ask you another question? <laughs> yes. So, you know, now the, I have the cataract out, the implants in, and, um, you know, I'm having the patient fixate on the light. Mm -hmm. And for the same reason for implant fixation, uh, uh, centration, implant centration, if they can't fixate so well, I, I, I'm trying to get that P1 and P4 relationship, you know, mm -hmm. somewhat the same. And, and, and typically P4 being slightly temporal uh, mm -hmm. to P1 and then centering. So, so if I, if I look at the first, the Purkinje image and, and the implant looks well-centered, I'm, I'm thinking, because if P4 is over here and I'm well-centered on it, I'm not well-centered, is correct? Um, I mean, the, the uh, eye is tricky because that, those disintegrations happen because the fovea is actually off the um, optical axis of the optical elements in front. So, so this is to be expected that, that there is this, um, um, not overlapping uh, Purkinje images. So um, what I said is that because the cornea has normally spherical collab positive spherical collaboration and the crystalline lens and you know the standard monofocal now standard monofocal intraocular lenses have negative spherical collaboration. This apparent decentration is actually compensated, um, having kind of a positive. Uh, coma in the cornea and negative coma in the lens. So despite those disintegrations, uh, the eye is kind of a smartly designed so that you have compensations of those sort of happening, even if there is uh, these uh, misalignments. So Vance, uh, quick question for you. Are, you know, when you're thinking about a multifocal or an EDOF, is there sort of a critical amount of angle kappa where you, you know, you say there's just too much, there's too much angle kappa and putting it, trying to put a lens in and get it centered is, is problematic is, you know, 0.6 millimeters or, you know, Jack Holiday has brought that issue up. Can you comment? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge when you see someone with 0.8 of angle kappa, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like someone with higher corneal HOAs than you would like to marry to a multifocal. And the patient says, you know, I've done all this research and I've looked into this <laughs> and I know that you've educated me that I have a, a higher chance of an implant exchange, but this is the technology I want. So that's where it gets to be a, a challenge. So, you know, once we're getting above a 0.5 angle kappa, um, I'm starting to think I may, you know, have a higher chance of, of not having a pleased patient. And they need to understand that if we're going to dive into multifocality, uh, they may have some issues that we have to do an implant exchange. But I think it's also one of the beautiful things about having the light adjustable lens is I would probably nudge them that direction 
So mm-hmm. I do respect Angle Kappa, but but I'm not a hard liner that no way would I do it. It's just extra patient, um, you know, discussion, just like, you know, someone who has an ever so slight epiretinal membrane that I'm not too excited about doing EDOF and they're like, but I work at my computer all day long and I really want it. And you have that good long discussion. Um, th- these, these are all, there's judgment calls and I call it dealing in gray, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, that's interesting. The vividity is, is I think we're going to see more and more of these sort of soft multifocal lenses that don't, you know, they, there's not such a big gradient. Um, and so the patients can adapt a little bit easier. And if you do have, let's say a large angle kappa or some higher order aberrations, something like the Vividity that doesn't give you a huge amount of uh, greater depth of focus, but it, but it also doesn't make you susceptible to all the glare halo type issues that, um, that we see, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful study that just came out from Julie Shalhorn, Steve Shalhorn's uh, daughter at UCSF. And she basically took all the pre-market approval FDA studies on multifocals and EDOFs in, in the Journal of Refractive Surgery this, this February. Take a look at it, it's a great study where she compares the, the mono, every company has to do a monofocal and a multifocal to get a multifocal approved. So you, they have all their subjective symptoms. They have their, uh, their, their objective visual, uh, uh, visual uh, acuity uh, contrast sensitivity study sitting there comparing monofocal to multifocal for each of these, um, you know, for the symphony, for the um, panoptic, all these different lenses. It's a great study, but you see that, you know, the more you increase the, the ad on the multifocal, the more they're going to get some glare and halos. Whereas like something like a Vividity, they get, it's, it's almost equivalent to the monofocal. So that, you know, I, I think we're going to see more of these soft, soft EDOF um, multifocals in the future. And, and for those kind of patients where you're, you're kind of on the fence with them. Right. Yeah. We, We've got um, just a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, a combo question. We've got a few on the light adjustable lens um, and hopefully we can finish up around 10.05 here. Um, The first question is, is there a time limit for when you can make adjustments? And then as a follow-up, what are your thoughts on the light adjustable lens and the setting of corneal transplant like a FACO DMEC? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's no timeline when you have to uh, do your adjustment. Um, so for instance, let's say you're doing a post-radial keratotomy patient who takes three months to uh, stabilize. Because um, uh, this beautiful adjustment, you don't want to do it when the eye's still changing. You just have to wear your goggles. You could wear the goggles for a year and then do the adjustment. You just have to wear the goggles. And, and so um, there's no timeline. You, you only get three adjustments. So you can separate those as much as you want. You could even try monovision on the first adjustment. If they don't like it, uh, wait three weeks, see how they're doing and you know, reverse it. Um, but the point is there's no, there's no timeline as long as you protect it from ambient uh, UV light. And then as far as uh, DMEC transplant, for sure, uh, you know, wonderful situation. Now you have a six millimeter optic with, you know, uh, around a five millimeter diameter light adjustment zone. So there's a little, little edge barrier for protection, you know, that if you're not perfectly centered on the, you know, five millimeters, that you're, you're not getting spillover of the UV light uh, onto the retina. And, and so you got to think about if you're going to be doing the graftose junction isn't well centered um, and you are inside the optic with a, 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 a significant scar. For instance, even an RK patient that has big epithelial plugs, I won't do the light adjustable lens. I don't think the data is good enough. Now, if they've, or, or the, we don't know, um, there's really no data on it. 
but nice thin uh, scars, whether it's uh, asigmatic keratotomy or graftose junction or previous RK, we can, we've had real good luck with it. Great. I'd like to thank all of our panelists today uh, for your time. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. For those on the, on the panel, you can uh, put in a response um, to the Q&A questions or anything in the chat um, and everyone can see those. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dave. I believe we are going on to a break at this point. Yes, we're all set. We will be uh, reconvening at 1020 for the next section. And please take your time to, to visit the virtual exhibits and uh, see some of the new recruits that you hired on the slide loop that we'll be playing um, during the intermission. See you all back in at 1020. Welcome back everybody to section two. Um, we started off with a great morning session. So thank you, Vance, Scott, and Matt for start kicking things off to um, what looks like gonna be a great conference. And um, now I'm excited to introduce uh, the moderator for our next section, Crystal Huxland. Um, a couple reminders. Remember, if you lose your link, uh, www.i2021.urmc.edu. And after this session, we'll have a break from 1140 to 1240 for lunch. And then we'll start the afternoon with the Fred Doucet lecture and the formal introduction of David Wong. Uh, Crystal is the James V. Aquavella Professor of Ophthalmology and the Associate Chair of Research at Flum. She also holds joint appointments as Professor in the Center for Visual Sciences, Department of Neurosciences of the Institute of Optics. Crystal received her BS and PhD in neuroscience, neurosciences from the University of Sydney, and she completed postdoctoral studies at the University of Sydney and the University of Rochester before joining the faculty in 1999. Her expertise is broad and includes visual retraining, corneal wound healing, and corneal laser refractive indexing. This research has led to multiple discoveries resulting in promising new technologies. These include helping cortical stroke patients to recover vision, healing damaged corneas, regenerating corneal nerves, and changing the refractive error in the human corneas, as well as inert lens materials using ultrafast lasers. Her research has been recognized and received funding from the National Eye Institute, Research to Prevent Blindness, and the New York State Department of Economic Development, to name just a few. She's an active member in ARVO and was former president of the Rochester chapter of the Society for Neurosciences. She's published more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and, and has been invited to speak all over the world. Crystal, we are grateful for you moderating this session today. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. Um, so I think Steve Coffrin is going to pop up the slides for the session. If you can manage that. I, I can share screen. Uh, oh, he's got it. He's got it. We're good. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, David. Um, welcome everybody to this second session um, of the Rochester Ophthalmology Conference. Um, the session is about imaging and we have a great lineup of speakers here, starting with uh, David Huang. So a short introduction on David. Next slide, please. Um, so David um, is the Associate Director and Director of Research at the KCI Institute. He's also the Martha and Eddie Peterson Professor of Ophthalmology and Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Oregon Health and Science University. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from MIT and then pursued an MD PhD from the joint Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program. He received his ophthalmology residency training at the Doheny Eye Institute at the University of Southern California. And he did fellowship training in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Huang is well known for his innovations in applying laser and uh, um, optical technology to eye diseases for which he's received numerous awards nationally and internationally. More on that later when um, Dr. DiLoretto introduces him for the Duchesne lecture. He also leads the Center for Ophthalmic Optics and Lasers and is a founder of GoCheck, the maker of the GoCheck Kids smartphone app that has screened over 2 million children for amblyopia risk, risk factors. And he's also the founding president of the International Ocular Circulation Society, 
uh, which promotes research in the field of ocular circulation. Um, and as um, David mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Huang actually is no stranger to our region. He graduated high school in Avoca. Um, but without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Huang. And his talk title is Classifying Corneal Epithelial Irregularities as Primary Deformation versus Secondary Modulation on OCT Maps. David, please take it away. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about a uh, new concept, and that's classifying corneal epithelial irregularities as either primary deformation or secondary uh, modulation. Uh, and this new concept comes out of the ability of OCT to map the uh, corneal epithelial thickness. Um, and so this is this is new in that it, it's a concept that's not in uh, uh, textbooks and most people uh, have don't use it yet and I, I like to uh, popularize this and hope to get some uh, feedback from our illustrious uh, panel this morning on this. I do have financial interest in Optiview, uh, a company that uh, uh, produced a machine to do this. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, Dr. Pavlatos and Professor Yen Li. Uh, as a background, uh, we all know that corneal topography is ca classically mapped using placido disc technology. Uh, and this measures the shape of the anterior corneal surface by projecting rings. Uh, the axial power map, uh, I think originally the concept is it ap approximates a refractive power of the cornea uh, using the anterior surface. But uh, we, we are all now uh, very familiar with how to classify corneal shape using this. So the normal has a uh, symmetric bow tie pattern, whereas in keratoconus, there's this characteristic skewed and asymmetric uh, bow tie shape with inferior steepening. Um, <clears throat> But this focal steepening is uh, really not sufficient to fully characterize keratoconus, which uh, we know we want to screen out when we do refractive surgery pre-op evaluation. Uh, so in a cornea with keratoconus shown on the left, you have a uh, stromal distor distortion, and there's actually a compensatory epithelial thickness modulation uh, with the thinnest point at the steepest point uh, that reduces this distortion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, focal steepening can also be observed in corneal warpage, uh, for example, with contact lens wear. But here, the opposite pattern occurs. Usually, it's uh, a focal thickening of the epithelium that results in uh, topographic steepening. So, uh, here's actual example map where uh, on the left you see the axial power map showing uh, inferior steepening in both of these cases, one form foods keratoconus on top and the warpage at the bottom. But uh, if you look at the epithelial thickness map produced by OCT, you see uh, different patterns. Um, in keratoconus, you see uh, focal epithelial thinning, whereas in warpage, it's really the primary epithelial thickening that drive the inferior steepening. Um, another feature uh, that's really helpful in diagnostic differential diagnosis is that in keratoconus, you see, uh, of course, uh, co coincident pachymetric thinning. And uh, we can use this in a diagnostic system that primarily uh, look at the, the central and inferior temporal cornea, uh, where uh, the characteristic changes in keratoconus occurs. Uh, we, uh, in a paper uh, that will soon be out in, in print uh, by Yang et al., we found that uh, the location of uh, pachymetric thinning shown in the center and the uh, epithelial thinning uh, are, are in approximately the same location, generally in inferior 
temporally. And here are a few examples to, to show that uh, in normal cornea, you don't have that pattern. Uh, the pachymetry is thinner uh, centrally, but the epithelial thickness typically is thinner superiorly. And this is a, a, a subclinical keratoconus, a 2020 keratoconus with a clearly abnormal uh, topography map. And you see that there's infratemporal thinning both on the pachymetry and epithelial thickness map. And this is apparent even in the form through keratoconus case. Here uh, we define FFK as the uh, uh, fellow eye of highly asymmetric keratoconus, where the uh, uh, topography map is uh, borderline or normal, and we still would see this uh, uh, coincident pachymetric and epithelial thinning. So we have a formal system where uh, we look at this analytic zone, central and infratemporal, and we look for coincident epithelial thinning with this uh, concentric pattern. So if you look at the epithelial map, it has to has, have at least uh, one uh, ring of concentric uh, thinning pattern or color step change. So we, we look at uh, first uh, a number of pachymetric and epithelial uh, parameters to uh, that indicate uh, focal change. And then uh, we look for this coincident and epithelial uh, thinning pattern uh, as a diagnostic system to classify eyes as keratoconus or not keratoconus. And uh, the system works very well and it's something you can use clinically right now uh, using a, an OCT system on the market. Um, and uh, in uh, a, a group of keratoconus eyes of various uh, severity from manifest keratoconus to form fruits, we found that basically it has 100% specificity, almost 100% sensitivity in the manifest and subclinical uh, severity scales and uh, 94, no, sorry, 74% sensitivity in the form fruit group, which is uh, very good because it's hard to pick out eyes with uh, uh, almost normal topography. So um, we can also uh, measure this coincident thinning using a um, computer generated parameter. And for this process, we start with uh, pattern deviation maps, and this is a, a deviation from the normal pattern on a normalized um, epithelial thickness map. So uh, on the right, you see a uh, keratoconus having, uh, when you, you boil down to pattern deviation is very clear infratemporal thinning uh, that's uh, shown in blue here. And this was uh, published uh, in a uh, paper uh, in 2016 in JCRS. And the index um, we can calculate uh, by Gaussian fitting in the area of uh, center on the area of pachymetric thinning. Uh, we uh, multiply the, uh, the Gaussian fit and get a uh, percentage score of deviation from normal. And in keratoconus, you should be uh, more than 2.2%. And in this form first case did satisfy the diagnostic criteria. Whereas in warpage, if you do that, you have the opposite pattern. You get actually get an uh, opposite sign or a very small value. So with this, coincident thinning index and a automatically generated computer uh, value, computer index. Uh, we also uh, get 100% um, sensitivity on uh, manifest and subclinical keratoconus 
and 56% sensitivity in form fruits at a 95% specificity cutoff. Uh, and this was uh, recently published in Journal of Refractive Surgery. So OCT can also map corneal topography. Uh, I think that primary impediment was uh, motion error, but that's been overcome by uh, several groups. We, we have an algorithm to do that, uh, that we developed uh, uh, last year, and that's published in uh, Biomedical Optics Express. And it compares well with Pentacam. You can see that the pattern matches well in normal subject. It matches well in keratocona subjects on um, axial power, tangential power flow, uh, maps anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, the numbers match up in terms of uh, uh, SIMK. That's all published. And um, we now want to use it. So uh, in, in our topography system using OCT, we prefer to use, rather than axial power map, the mean curvature map. Uh, I think it's a simpler measure of shape because on keratoconus, you just see this uh, um, focal uh, steepening. There's no bow tie pattern to, to confuse you. And it perfectly matches uh, the shape of the uh, uh, thickness changes. So that, let's look at the, the correlation here. Um, so on, uh, on normals, uh, usually there is a, a slight uh, central uh, thinning, but uh, the pattern, the variation is very small. Generally, it's all in the green. And at the bottom with the keratoconus, you can see there's infratemporal thinning and steepening, both anteriorly and posteriorly. And these are all uh, valuable diagnostic information. And here we create a, another index called epithelial modulation index that captures the correlation between uh, focal steepening, which uh, in the case of keratoconus drives the focal epithelial thinning and we uh, do this calculation by taking the covariance of these two maps and applying a negative sign. And uh, in keratoconus, you get a positive value. So in this case is uh, diagnostic. And in warpage, uh, you have usually epithelial thickening, driving uh, steepening, and you get the opposite sign. So it's, uh, it's easy. Uh, on this epithelial modulation index, keratoconus is positive and warpage is negative or close to zero in a lot of cases. And again, we evaluated this in a, a group of keratoconus uh, and non-keratoconus uh, patients. This time we included a group with uh, contact lens warpage where there is uh, topographic steepening associated with a reduction in corrective visual acuity. And uh, using this epithelial modulation index, uh, there is a close to 100% uh, correct identification of normals and warpage and 100% uh, correct identification of manifest and subclinical keratoconus and about 52% correct identification of from fruits keratoconus. Um, we also have another index called epithelial pattern standard deviation or EPPSD. That simply uh, takes a room in square of the pattern deviation in the epithelial thickness. So this detects all kinds of irregularities, uh, whether primary or secondary. And if you plot these two indices, you can see that they form uh, the uh, keratoconus or actasia, and warpage forms two different vectors um, that you can see clearly on this two-dimensional plot. So uh, this would also, of course, show up if you do something automated like principal component analysis. 
this is a little bit mathematical, but uh, you can just uh, remember that on EM index, these two diverge, whereas on the FEPSD, these two are uh, follows increases, both increases because this measures any irregularity. So I think this concept applies to other conditions as well. Primary deformation is a concept that applies uh, not only to warpage, but also to dry eye and epithelial basement membrane dystrophy where epithelial changes is primary. And secondary modulation uh, applies to all the other types of corneal irregularity in, uh, besides ectasia, uh, surgical manipulation like LASIK or PRK, stromal scars and dystrophies all follow this pattern where uh, if you have a steep spot on the surface, the epithelium is thinner. When if you have a flat spot, the epithelium gets thicker. So in con conclusion, OCT maps can be used to distinguish between primary uh, deformation and secondary modulation of the epithelium. And this is a useful concept for classifying corneal irregularities uh, when you are able to map epithelial thickness. I'd like to thank the support of uh, NIH, RPB, and OptiView. Uh, and this is our research group, the Center for Ophthalmic Optics and Lasers. Uh, and if you're interested uh, in our research topics, you can find more information on coolab.net. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Great talk. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, to please keep your questions for the discussion session at the end of this. Um, if you don't want to forget them, please write them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce our second speaker in the session, and this is Dr. Jesse Shalek. So Dr. Shalek um, has been an assistant professor of ophthalmology and part of the basic science faculty here at the Flama Institute since 2015. He is fast becoming one of the nation's leading experts at using in vivo adaptive optics imaging to explore the microscopic inner workings of the retinal vasculature in the living eye. And Jesse's current research therefore involves imaging animal models um, of diabetes and also humans with diabetes um, to understand at a cellular level, um, subtle changes and interactions between blood cells, immune cells, vascular structure. Now, um, Dr. Shalek has already authored or co-authored close to 20 peer-reviewed articles, 50 research abstracts, and he's presented dozens of invited lectures, including at the American Academy of Ophthalmology Innovation Summit. His research is funded by the National Eye Institute, the Research to Prevent Blindness Foundation, and the Dana Foundation. Jesse received his Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering from Syracuse University and a doctorate in Neuroscience from SUNY Upstate Medical University. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Rochester Center for Visual Science under David Williams' mentorship before joining the Eye Institute faculty full time. And other than research, he teaches graduate students and undergraduate and graduate courses and has mentored more than 20 graduate and undergraduate students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shalek as he presents his talk titled Measuring Real-Time Retinal Blood Flow in Vivo. Jesse, take it away. Thank you, Crystal. So in today's talk, we're gonna to move to something um, a little bit different. We're gonna move from the front of the eye to the back of the eye. Um, and the reason that this talk is relevant uh, today is in light of our um, esteemed guest, Dr. Huang, who will be giving a lecture later today on OCTA. Uh, and as many of you are familiar, OCTA is, is revolutionizing what it is that we can understand in the clinic uh, about vascular perfusion. And what I will be building on today is what it is that we can understand not only at the single capillary level, but what it is we can understand uh, about the blood cells themselves that are flowing within these capillaries inside the living eye. So uh, the focus of my research group has really uh, built on the technology that was uh, innovated and developed here at the University of Rochester that use adaptive optics to allow us to, to measure and correct for the aberrations of the front of the eye so that we can get very detailed images of structures at the back of the eye. And the structures that I'll be talking about today are these cells. 
Uh, and I love showing this slide at the beginning of the presentation because it reminds us that the fluid that's pumping through our heart uh, during all of our living days is not just a fluid, but it's comprised of over 30 trillion uh, cells that are circulating between our biggest vessels to our smallest capillaries, from our eyes to our brains, to our nose, to our toes, all over our body. And with, um, with these blood cells, they contain tremendous information, not only about the health of the eye, but also of systemic uh, conditions as well. So here you can see a scanning electron micrograph of the familiar red blood cells, pseudocolored in red, a white blood cell, pseudocolored in blue, and an activated platelet. Uh, the focus of my research group has been to use adaptive optics to study these cells inside the living eye. And the way that uh, you might think that you can study these cells, uh, you would begin with this approach. You'd go in through the front of the eye and you'd park uh, your imaging beam with an ophthalmic scope at the back of the eye in which you could see uh, a dense vascular plexus. Uh, but as you might recognize at this scale, which is just about a tenth of a millimeter, uh, the pinch and zoom or the digital magnification really doesn't do it for us to see uh, where we should be able to look at individual red blood cells. And in fact, what you see is just this reddish tinge, uh, which is the macular pigment and all the hemoglobin at the back of the eye. So when we can correct for the aberrations of the front of the eye, we can regain a very sharp image of the back of the eye. And this is what adaptive optics allows us to do. So at this scale, we can measure and correct the aberrations to allow us to see the tiniest of capillaries in detail and also combine this technology with video rate mode so that we can see the movement of single blood cells within this network. And just to remind you uh, just how tiny those capillaries are, this is a human hair uh, seen with the scanning electron microscope uh, to scale to emphasize that these structures are really microscopic. So today's talk is gonna focus on blood cells, but I did wanna introduce that most of the data I'll share today is uh, taken from the mouse in which I, my lab has developed a, a custom instrument uh, to image these tiny eyes. Uh, of course, the mouse is a popular model for biomedical research and helps us translate some of our imaging innovations into the clinical population. So about 10 years ago, uh, the popular imaging modality with adaptive optics was in something called confocal mode, using the confocal principle of rejecting autofocus light. And that allowed us to see fantastic things like nerve fiber bundles, the smallest of capillaries, and of course, photoreceptors, which are now world famous uh, coming from the Rochester labs. But also over the just the past five years, there's also been um, a revolution in imaging uh, the translucent cells that exist in the retina. And this, of course, are the neurons, the glia, and blood cells that are equally, if not more important, to understand in vascular associated disease. We recognize that in the clinical uh, service that when you lump um, the leading causes of blindness in the developed world, almost all of them have a primary or associated vascular component with them. So we're very keen on combining adaptive optics to allow us to study neurons, glia, and blood cells uh, in the disease population. And of course, because we're uh, deploying this technology in a mouse, it also allows us to combine the resolution and contrast with fluorescent agents, which allow us to target very specific cell populations that have key proteins labeled. But for today's talk, we're going to focus on just the vascular perfusion. And because this is a clinical audience, I want us to think in the context of something that has come onto the scene uh, over the past decade or so. And this is, of course, optical coherence tomography and geography, OCTA, which Dr. Wong will talk about later today. In the mid 2000s, this technology came on the heels of OCT, uh, structural OCT, by looking at sort of the temporal variation of pixels or voxels within an image to give rise to the vascular blood flow of the back of the eye. And this has been a game changer for clinical diagnosis um, and understanding the progression of disease, of course, because it's non-invasive and even better than uh, fluorescein injections, uh, requires no label to be injected. What I'll be sharing today is where we can understand with adaptive optics and seeing single blood cells, how we can better interpret some of the OCTA findings that are coming out of the clinical work today. So three capabilities that I'll highlight, of course, adaptive optics is very good for imaging the very tiniest of capillaries. And I'll show you some work which allows us to resolve individual blood cells. You can also use this tool to park on the biggest of vessels and combine this with software strategies to now measure a fire hose of information of over 100,000 cells per second. And then if time provides also some very exciting findings captured in the past year and a half that allow us to see not only the blood cells that are contained within the capillaries and the biggest of vessels, 
but also importantly in disease, what happens to blood cells when they leak out of the vessels? Or in the case of inflammation where there's purposeful movement of a subset of blood cells, the white blood cells that move through the vessel wall and into the neural parenchyma. Let's start with the capillaries. About 10 years ago, this was the state of the art of what we could see inside the living retina with confocal imaging. And you combine adaptive optics with video rate mode, allows you to see the movement of those single red blood cells within this vascular network. And then again, we have innovated the way that we can provide contrast. So this is the same resolution, but now with improved contrast to allow us to see the shape and behavior of the individual moving erythrocytes as it moves through this vascular network. It's this contrast plus resolution that allows us to see the behavior, the detailed behavior of those individual blood cells. But of course, we'd like to study this with incredible temporal resolution and our strategy uh, has been uh, as follows. We take an adaptive optics image and scan very quickly across a single vessel of interest. And this allows us to regain temporal information. And the strategy is we park our single beam across a vessel and we let the blood cells self-scan as it crosses by uh, this imaging beam. What we have here is a literal uh, ticker tape record of the shape, anatomy, and behavior of every single blood cell that passes by that beam. It allows us to provide exact counts of blood cells and study the morphology and rheology of those blood cells. You might be asking yourself, why is this important? Well, it helps us understand and characterize the blood cell component of vascular associated disease. For example, you might have imaged capillaries that are equivalent diameter and all show that they're perfused, for example, in a technology like OCTA, but you'd never have the appreciation that the packing density of those blood cells looks dramatically different in similar sized capillaries. Here we have five different capillaries captured from the same vascular network that have exactly the same capillary diameter, but hopefully you can appreciate the blood cells packed within those capillaries in dramatically different ways. Some have high hematocrit, some have low hematocrit, some interdigitate. And this last example that I'll show you is called interrupted, shows this very peculiar case where capillaries are actually non-perfused for a period of time. This is a 10x speed up video of that interrupted flow pattern. And again, what we're seeing here is the formation of a clog or a clot within a single capillary branch, which becomes obscured, uh, uh, obstructed, and then reperfused over time. With this contrast and resolution, now we can ask the critical question, why is that capillary becoming clogged? I'm gonna draw your attention to just one cell in this uh, video sequence here. If you follow my cursor, this cell right here, that's in fact a sticky white blood cell, which is impeding the flow of all of the red blood cells that follow in front and behind that, uh, that train of, of cells. So in the same way that the box cars in a train cannot pass the locomotive, uh, this is the same sort of situation that happens with sticky white blood cells. And of course, this has been implicated for decades in conditions like diabetes, where you get sticky white blood cells. But we think that being able to visualize this now is going to give in vivo confirmation of not only the type of cells that are providing these vascular non-perfusion events, but also will be critical for pharmaceuticals, which are developing drugs that target the stickiness and deformability of those white blood cells uh, in cutting edge therapies to date. So I'd like to think about these examples in the context of OCTA. Here's that same example I just showed. What would OCTA see with this kind of image? This is not OCTA, but a simulation of what OCTA would see. And of course, as that vessel becomes perfused or non-perfused, the vessel appears to appear and disappear depending on which temporal epoch you happen to take that snapshot um, over. This is something that we understood uh, for a number of years in adaptive optics, uh, because when you look at a capillary perfusion network over time, we quickly noticed that just over taking intervals of several minutes apart, the vascular network is exactly the same, but you'll see these appearance and disappearance of individual capillary branches over time. Again, we think that we can resolve what it is that's happening within those capillary branches with adaptive optics. And here's the example. Here's a, a capillary vascular perfusion map captured with adaptive optics. Structural imaging allows us to see that we have capillaries here. This is structural imaging, no motion contrast. But when you look at what happens with the motion contrast, again, very similar to the SADA and OMAG techniques uh, developed on the West Coast. Um, when we look at the vascular perfusion, you can see several interesting things. I'll draw your attention to this capillary segment here. 
Notice that the capillary perfusion has stopped and then restarted. You see the same behavior in the motion contrast image. I'll also draw your attention to this vessel right here. Interestingly, this vessel, while clearly present and having equivalent diameter of its perfused neighbors, actually never perfuses, and you don't see it in the motion contrast image. So let's move away from the capillaries uh, for just a second. I just want to mention that the adaptive optics approach combined with software approaches allows you to image a fire hose of information from the biggest of vessels. We've now combined this approach to allow us to see the velocity of now hundreds of thousands of cells per second in the biggest arterioles and venules, the source and return of the vascular perfusion to the eye. But I really wanted to spend the balance of today's talk on understanding what it is that we can see uh, in the course of inflammation. Inflammation uh, in the eye, of course, is associated with uh, almost every uh, vas uh, vascular associated disease of the eye, but also retinal degenerative conditions as well. The example that I'll show here is a very popular one, of course, in diabetic retinopathy, where you can see the key landmark features such as arterial narrowing, nerve fiber hemorrhage, uh, vas uh, venular beating, cotton wool spots, and others that we're familiar with in the clinical setting. But then also, which is seen uh, low, relatively less well, is macular edema on a fundus image. But of course, OCT has revolutionized what clinicians can see with the vascular, the retinal thickening, uh, which associates with a lot of vision loss and diabetes. So in these textbook examples, we can see formation of cystic pockets, subretinal fluid, and, and uh, a thickening of the retinal tissue. But we'd like to ask the question, what's actually happening besides fluid mismanagement within that tissue, what's happening with the inflammatory components within this tissue. And this is again where adaptive optics can allow us to see what's happening at the single cell level in these conditions. We're going to model inflammation, which is seen in diabetes or uveitis with this model called endotoxin-induced uveitis. Basically, the strategy is this. We inject a very small amount of an irritant to the retina. This is lipopolysaccharide, LPS, which is injected into the globe. And then uh, there's been a fair amount of work in OCT. This is work from our collaborator, Colin Chu, which showed a parapapillary scan where you image the healthy retina and you see uh, an intact retinal uh, landscape. But shortly after the injection, what Colin thought was an increased inflammatory response where this debris here, he was suggesting were inflammatory cells that were infiltrating the vitreous. And then he also said there's hyperreflective spots within the B scan or the parapapillary scan within the tissue as well. Of course, we thought this would be a perfect avenue to understand with adaptive optics, so that's what we did. We studied these big vessels inside a living mouse eye, and we injected this inflammatory cue. And what we see is nothing short of remarkable, just 72 hours after that inflammatory response, that you see the arrival of putative immune cells at the vitreoretinal surface and within the neural retina itself. So this is exactly the same retinal tissue captured just a few days after the injection. But let's back up just a little bit in terms of asking the question, how did those cells get there? And if you uh, turn to your favorite immunology textbook, you'll see the movement and behavior of white blood cells has been characterized for decades. This is the inflammatory cascade at the single cell level in which white blood cells flowing within the vascular network become sticky with selectins and integrins that allow the cells to stick to the vascular endothelium and then actually purposefully move through the vascular wall. So what's remarkable, just six hours after we inflame the retina, we see something that looks dramatically similar to the textbook cartoons of what's seen in inflammatory rolling. Here, the phase contrast of adaptive optics allows us to see the tank treading and rolling behavior of these single immune cells. So here is another image of those immune cells. And I need to convince you that they're in fact immune cells and for example, not neurons or glia. And I think the most compelling data is video data. So here is a time-lapse image. I want you to pay attention to the time ticker in the upper left of this tissue over time. So the sped up video allows you to see the morphology and purposeful behavior of these immune cells as they're responding to the inflammatory cue. I love these images because every single cell tells its own unique story, but because we're limited on time, I want you to focus on just two locations. This first location in the red circle, if you pay attention to the event that happens right now, you'll see a single immune cell leave the vessel and go into the neural parenchyma. This is called extravasation and is again, the mechanism by which immune cells purposely leave the vessel and get into the neural tissue. Understanding the first time that this has been seen inside the living retina. 
but also taking uh, the field of immunology by storm uh, is this finding in the green circle where you actually see this lone immune cell come back inside the vessel. And this is very controversial in the field of immunology because most people believe that the early immune cells, the neutrophils that arrive to this tissue, leave the tissue, do their phagocytosis, provide cues for other immune cells, and then die and never return. We're finding that a population do return to the vessels. This is very important for understanding everything from autoimmune disease to how the inflammatory cascade works in, in people in the clinical setting. The power, of course, is that we can return to the same tissue over time. So I'm going to show you a time sequence here. Here's a healthy retina where we have a vanule and an arterial. We inflame the retina with that LPS injection. We now return to that same tissue just six hours later and look at the appearance of this tissue. Incredible immune cell activity within the neural parenchyma, but also pay attention to the rolling behavior of the immune cells in this early inflammatory response. That happens with them in the venules, but does not happen within the arterioles. Notice no rolling here. This is a known behavior of the inflammatory response. Come back to the same tissue 24 hours later. The rolling has largely stopped, right? No more rolling cells, but the appearance and density of the immune cells is dramatically different. And of course, we can return to the same tissue 72 hours later, 10 days later, and two months later. And this is, of course, what we dream would happen in the clinical setting, that an inflammatory cue ramps up in the retina. You get a helpful inflammatory response that subsides and leaves the neural retina largely intact. But unfortunately, this is what goes awry in a lot of inflammatory disease in the clinical setting, where you get this chronic condition of inflammation. We think that this approach will be very powerful for understanding how pharma understands uh, their targeted therapy strategies to suppress or even enhance the immune response in certain conditions. So just to summarize the talk very quickly, we've taken you all the way from the smallest of capillaries and studied the movement of single blood cells within that network. We can use adaptive optics to report the velocity and the cardiac pulsatility and laminar flow properties within the biggest of vessels, which allows to understand the source and return of all the vascular perfusion to the eye and then also uh, allow us to see what's happening within the neural parenchyma. Again, we think that this is helpful for interpreting OCTA images because um, it, you need the motion of those cells in order to provide a contrast media in order to see what's going on. We think the phase contrast approach with adaptive optics will allow us to see the important inflammatory component in a variety of uh, vascular disease of the eye. And before I hand this over to Crystal again, of course, to thank the, the members of my team that made this possible, and uh, our funding uh, opportunities, uh, our funding organizations that have made this, these opportunities possible, the NIH, the Dana Foundation, and the Research to Prevent Blindness. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Very nice talk. Um, much appreciated. Okay, so um, again, I see there are a few questions that are popping up in the chat in the Q&A, which is excellent. Keep them coming. Um, and now I'm going to introduce the last speaker in our session, um, Yunyang Yun. So Dr. Yun um, is a professor of ophthalmology and part of the basic science faculty here at the Thloma Institute. Um, he also has secondary appointments in the Institute of Optics and Biomedical Engineering, and he's a longstanding member of the Center for Visual Science. Uh, research projects in his advanced physiological optics lab focus on measuring, understanding, and correcting the optics of the eye. Um, some of these projects include tear film imaging, binocular vision, consequences of corneal refractive surgery, presbyopia and accommodation, corneal biomechanics, to name just a few. Um, he and his colleagues have developed a myriad of devices and methods to better understand how optics affect vision. And this has resulted in nearly 30 patents and patent pending. Uh, Gunyang's research has been funded by the National Eye Institute, New York State, Research to, Pre to Prevent Blindness Foundation, and the David Bryan Trust, to name a few. He has authored and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, mentored hundreds of undergraduate, graduate, and postdocs over the last 23 years he's been at Rochester. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Sung Kyun Kwan University in South Korea, and he completed his uh, master's and doctoral degrees in laser optics at Osaka University in Japan. 
He was a research scientist and research associate at the University of Rochester's Center for Visual Science, also under the mentorship of David Williams. I think I can see a trend here before joining the faculty of the Flama Institute in 2001. So please welcome Dr. Gunyang Yoon as he presents his talk on corneal biomechanics towards individualized vision correction. Gunyang, all yours. Great, um, thanks Crystal. Good morning to you all um, as well. Uh, let me share my screen here, you see my screen? All yes, right. all set. Great, um, yeah, so, um, so I think the uh, the concept of the corneal biomechanics has been around uh, for more than, I think, two decades uh, in the field of laser refractive surgery. You know, since uh, Dr. Cindy Roberts uh, at OSU uh, made this uh, very famous statement um, saying cornea is not a piece of plastic. So if it's a plastic, we don't have to worry about the biomechanics. So um, my talk will uh, try to um, provide some insight uh, into how the cornea biomechanics plays a role in developing individualized uh, laser vision corrections. So with the, um, uh, just a quick snapshot of the evolution of the laser refractive surgery uh, technology and uh, with the invention of the excimer laser in, in uh, 1970s, um, different surgical techniques, including uh, PRK, LASIK and LASIK uh, have been developed over the past uh, 50 years. Um, additional innovation of a femtosecond laser and, and wavefront technology, which uh, was born in Rochester um, under David Williams' uh, supervision, uh, further improves uh, accuracy and precision of uh, laser refractive surgery. So current laser effect surgery systems, if you look at the specs of um, you know, those systems, um, you know, combine a number of imaging tools and laser technology, as well as very sophisticated uh, computer algorithms, including artificial intelligence to optimize uh, laser uh, refractive surgery outcome. So no doubt that the, these advances have improved uh, outcomes of the refractive surgery uh, making us think that, you know, almost everyone should get the optimal outcomes. So, however, um, one of the limitations, in my opinion, uh, that uh, still exist uh, is uh, that the optical outcomes uh, vary between patients, as shown in uh, these two examples. On average, uh, achieved uh, spherical equivalent is well correlated uh, with the attempt spherical equivalent uh, for the surgery. However, um, the quite a few data points are actually outside the uh, plus minus portal diopter range, and some cases are uh, deviated uh, larger than half diopter. So high order aberrations are even uh, more variable, um, as you can see uh, in the plot on the right. So what can we do uh, more to uh, reduce this kind of a variability uh, in the outcomes? So I think, uh, that we need to have a better control or a prediction of the, how the cornea wound healing response and biomechanical response affect the optical outcomes. Um, so there are a bunch of um, uh, groups working has uh, have been working on the cornea wound healing uh, research project. So my presentation today uh, will focus on cornea biomechanics. So why is the corneal biomechanics so uh, important? Uh, looking at the uh, anatomy of the eye, the cornea is always uh, pressurized uh, by intraocular pressure. So biomechanical properties of the cornea directly affect the um, surface topography, uh, corneal topography maintained by the IOP and corneal surface topography has a significant impact on corneal optics or corneal waveform aberrations. Therefore, corneal biomechanics and um, you know, optics of the eye uh, are highly related. Clinically, uh, understanding uh, corneal biomechanics is also very important for improving uh, or understanding vision of patients with a pathologic corneal condition, such as post-refractive surgery ectasia, keratoconus, and even uh, corneal transplant. Main factors uh, that affect the uh, cornea biomechanics uh, include cornea geometry and material properties in, um, in intraocular pressure. The contribution of these three factors uh, can be investigated through uh, a very um, 
uh, engineering uh, tool called finite element modeling, which has been used as a great tool to provide insight into the interactions between uh, cornea biomechanics and optics. So from the model, uh, corneal topography can be simulated uh, with the given geometry, uh, material properties, and intraocular uh, pressure. The, uh, these three um, uh, dimensional uh, corneal topography uh, can be directly analyzed to uh, extract the uh, optical aberrations of the cornea by using optical ray tracing. Due to the uh, large uh, individual variations in um, corneal biomechanics and optics and uh, development of an individualized biomechanical corneal model is the key. To do that, uh, all of these three factors need to be quantified first. Uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, geometry of individual corneas can be measured by uh, using uh, several advanced imaging techniques already um, you know, such as a corneal topographer um, and high resolution OCT, just like what we saw uh, in Dr. Wang's presentation earlier. So IOP measurement is routinely uh, done in the clinic as well. However, um, the measuring the uh, material properties of individual corneas still remains as a very uh, difficult, challenging uh, problem. So it has been known that um, mechanical properties of the cornea are mainly determined by the material structure of the stroma, which can be considered as a composite material composed of a matrix embedded with a complex network of collagen fibers. The cornea stroma uh, consists of uh, hundreds of layers of uh, collagen uh, ramella uh, stacked on top of each other and uh, interlacing in each other sometimes. And, and also collagen fibrils uh, in the stroma are always aligned in uh, fixed directions. At some locations, collagen fibers are well aligned, uh, but other locations, they can be randomly uh, oriented. Due to the complicated structure uh, and uh, the um, interaction of the collagen fibrils and matrix, a more advanced uh, an isotropic cornea model is required to better represent its uh, biomechanical uh, responses. So we have uh, developed some methods to uh, quantify uh, some of these variables, including uh, matrix stiffness and fiber stiffness and nonlinearity. However, um, quantifying the uh, fibril uh, dispersion uh, distribution has been uh, very challenging. So with the uh, finite element modeling uh, tool, we recently found a very interesting uh, relationship between fibrillar dispersion and changes in cornea aberrations uh, induced by different levels of intraocular pressures. So based on the ex vivo X-ray data, we model the pattern of fibrillar dispersion as shown here, and then apply different pressures to the, to the cornea. So we found that the regional variation in fibril dispersion affects the way corneal surface is deformed. When IOP increases, the pattern of the fibril dispersion starts to be reflected in the surface profile of the cornea. These elevation maps allow us to compute a change uh, in the wavefront aberrations of the cornea from low to high IOP. So if you compare the fibril dispersion pattern within the same uh, cornea area, you uh, notice that they seem to be uh, very similar and well correlated. To further explore uh, this finding, so we uh, looked at the how cornea uh, wavefront aberrations change as a function of degrees of fibril dispersion in uh, IOP. The changes of two different aberrations, including astigmatism and uh, spherical aberrations, are shown here. The results suggest that um, there is a linear relationship, very strong linear relationship, between the changes in corneal optical aberrations in fibrillar dispersions. So this linear relationship was also found with uh, an increase in uh, intraocular pressure. 
So these are uh, linear, uh, uh, these linear relationships uh, we found are very important of uh, making it possible to establish this uh, somewhat uh, complicated mathematical equations. Um, so let me skip the details of these equations. Uh, but the point here is that uh, with the corner aberrations measured at two different IOP levels, uh, the fiber dispersion could be uh, quantified through some uh, mathematical modeling. We first uh, validated this idea and method theoretically by conducting a blind testing. First, one of our investigators uh, created a random pattern of the fibril uh, dispersion as shown here. And from this model, uh, change in aberrations, uh, corner aberrations induced by intraocular elevation uh, was generated by a simulated inflating uh, testing. Here we present uh, the uh, aberration information is only available for the central six millimeter cornea to represent the practical situations. Then we, uh, in, uh, with the information of the corneal uh, geometry, matrix stiffness, and uh, other parameters, including fiber stiffness and nonlinearity, another uh, independent investigator who did not know the um, original uh, fibril dispersion pattern estimated the fibril uh, dispersion using the proposed mathematical equation shown in a previous slide. So here's a result uh, due to the fact that we intentionally uh, used aberration data um, for only central six millimeter cornea, the magnitudes of a fiber dispersion in the peripheral area are underestimated. However, uh, within the central cornea area, the distribution of the fibril dispersion um, in the assumed pattern was successfully estimated. The validation um, of the method uh, was further uh, demonstrated by showing that um, the individualized cornea biomechanical model with the estimated distribution of the fibrillar dispersion can predict the optical behavior of the cornea very accurately. So we also conducted an uh, ex vivo um, inflation testing with uh, monkey corneas. So this figure uh, here shows a setup uh, of our experimental system. So monkey corneas extracted uh, with a couple of millimeter uh, scleral rim was mounted inside the wet cell filled with the optisol, uh, where the pressure to the cornea is controlled precisely by using a uh, water column. Uh, then entire uh, wet cell was then put in our imaging system and we then measure the, how the uh, cornea uh, wavefront aberrations change with the different pressures as these movies are showing. So with the additional uh, measurements of the cornea geometry and depth dependent matrix stiffness and individualized uh, biomechanical model of these monkey corneas uh, were constructed. So here is how uh, the optical uh, responses um, measure uh, experimentally uh, compared uh, with the predicted result from the individualized monkey corneal model. Similar to the um, theoretical validation, uh, the main features of the wavefront map uh, of the experimental data were successfully predicted and the magnitudes of the changes in individual aberration coefficients uh, are also well correlated with the values predicted by uh, the model. So we have um, demonstrated uh, so far the feasibility of quantifying uh, collision fibril dispersion, both uh, theoretically and uh, ex vivo experiment. Now, the, the question is uh, whether we could do the same in vivo, uh, ideally in, in human subjects. Uh, short answer is yes, if we uh, could overcome uh, these two challenges uh, shown here. So uh, first we need to be able to elevate uh, IOP uh, safely, as well as to measure the changes in corneal aberrations at the elevated IOP uh, levels uh, reliably. So to explore the uh, possibility, uh, so we came up with this new method to temporarily uh, induce the um, uh, IOP elevation using an inversion table. 
the principle is very simple, uh, is that the, uh, an, an increase in blood pressure by inverting the human body elevates uh, the intraocular pressure. So we tested three conditions, um, including baseline with the subject is sitting upright um, in uh, the uh, spine position on the inversion table at two uh, different angles, 135 degree and 165 degree. The subject's IOP was measured using a tonal pen and uh, the portable corneal topographer uh, was used to measure the uh, optical aberrations uh, of, the, uh, of the cornea. The stability and safety of intraocular pressure elevation in vivo uh, was first measured uh, by the time course uh, you know, monitoring on uh, six eyes. Um, during the test, uh, the IOP of each eye was measured at the three testing positions with the fixed time interval. So we found that the subject's IOP was elevated effectively and stabilized uh, within the three minutes uh, after the inversion. IOP can effectively be elevated from the baseline by inverting the body um, when the subject returned uh, to the baseline position, uh, IOP started to decrease uh, immediately and uh, return to the uh, subject's pre-inversion level uh, of IOP less than several minutes for uh, most inversion angles. So the uh, average IOP elevation from the baseline to the two inverted angles for, um, for the 15 measured eyes uh, is summarized here. Uh, IOP increases significantly uh, again uh, from the baseline to each of the two inverted angles with the uh, larger inversion angles inducing larger uh, intraocular pressure elevations. It was also found that this IOP elevation caused the significant changes in waveform aberrations from baseline to, uh, to each angle. So large uh, intersubject variability uh, was measured official, uh, especially in the uh, lower or, uh, order aberrations, uh, while some of the higher order aberrations, including coma and spherical aberration were changed uh, significantly from uh, the baseline. So this is a sort of my conclusion slide. You know, I hope I was able to convince that we could uh, quantify the collision febrile uh, uh, dispersion of the cornea, which is one of the key biomechanical uh, parameters uh, determining cornea uh, response to laser refractive surgery. So I'd like to finish my talk by showing how we could develop the truly individualized laser refractive surgery by incorporating cornea biomechanics. The first, the, the ability to uh, quantify the patient's specific corneal geometry and material properties uh, leads us to developing a uh, patient-specific three-dimensional biomechanical corneal model. The model will then predict the uh, corneal response to the surgery, which will be used to uh, refine a uh, laser uh, population protocol, uh, resulting in uh, optimal uh, surgery outcome. So there's a still a lot to do, but hopefully um, we could accomplish these goals in uh, near future. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, our cornea biomechanics research team, especially uh, Dr. Meng Chen Su, former PhD student in the lab, and now uh, works at uh, Parsha Health, as well as my lab members. I also like to thank uh, Graham support. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Gunyang. Um, and thank you to everybody. I think that now we can move to the panel discussion. Uh, let's see if I can change my view here so I can see more people. Um, and there are a few questions, at least one question in the chat that I can um, ask um, on behalf of actually David Huang. But um, if anybody else wants to ask a question, I would invite you to please uh, use the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. And hopefully that means that you will pop up to the uh, front of our view. Um, and hopefully Steve Coffin can help me with managing this if I don't happen to see them. Um, okay, so let's see, are there any questions from the audience to begin with? I am not seeing any, 
So I'm going to go to the chat for now. And um, David was um, asking Jesse a question about the time scale of intermittent non-perfusion in capillaries. Does it follow the cardiac cycle? Um, is it longer, shorter? How is it, is it related at all and how? Great, so I appreciate the question because we get asked this a lot um, because it helps to interpret you know, what a normal OCTA might look like. Um, as uh, everyone might be familiar, a typical OCTA is going to take a small uh, epoch of time in order to gather its information. And I think Dr. Wong's question is a great one. You know, what would you see if, um, if one of these events happened during the capture time of an OCTA uh, sequence or perhaps a longitudinal sequence that might be uh, taking place you know, over 10, 15 minutes in the same patient over time? So, our data, the response is qualified. This is data from a mouse. Um, we're finding that about you know, one to 3% of the capillaries uh, are non-perfused at any given time based on, on our analysis. And the duration ranges from, you know, just a handful of seconds, you know, three to four seconds. But curiously, there are some that last very long, uh, much longer than we would have expected, minutes at a time. And this is uh, interesting, you know, for not only understanding the eye, but, you know, conditions of stroke as well, because when you get durations that are minutes at a time, you start thinking about vascular non-perfusion that's going to release things like HIF factors and angiogenic uh, events, right? The accumulation of enough of those over time. Um, so I hope that answers your questions from seconds to minutes. And then of course, there's some populations which seem to have stopped perfusion that never reperfuse. Uh, and those are equally interesting. I see that we uh, have a uh, raised hand from Dr. Paulus, so I'm going to uh, bring him up and uh, he'll be able to answer, ask that question in a second. Dr. DePaulis, you can go ahead. Unmute my camera. Oh, thank you. Kun Yang, quick question. Uh, sure. You sense that the biomechanical properties of a cornea translate to the rest of the globe as well, i.e. the susceptibility of uh, axial length expansion in a young myopic individual or even the predisposition to glaucomatous optic neuropathy? Yeah, absolutely. There, there, are, uh, there, there are two different models, two, uh, mainly two different types of models. Uh, one is just, just like what we did, you know, the cornea and just a little bit of a sclera rim, you can develop the model with some, you know, known, um, you know, the boundary conditions. Uh, but there is another type of model uh, where you actually model the entire globe like the out of the eye so that you could actually see how the uh, sclera part of the eye affects the uh, deformation of the cornea or vice versa. So, um, so uh, I haven't really seen lots of difference between those two models, but it, because there's so many unknown factors in terms of, you know, boundary conditions, and you know, there's no really good way of uh, quantifying the um, mechanical properties of the sclera entire globe. So, uh, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a up in the air now, but I think uh, as we develop more sophisticated model, I'm pretty sure we're going to go into the, you know you know, relationship between the eye growth and mechanical property of the entire eye as well. Hey, David, you had a question for Gunyang. Would you like to ask it? Uh, yes, I'm wondering, uh, based on your biomechanical models, whether you can explain uh, why ectasia and keratoconus typically have, appear in the infrotemporal region of the cornea. That's a that's a great question. Um, may, maybe it's a, it has a very little to do with the mechanical model itself, but <laughs> I think that's how the uh, cornea uh, changes with the you know progression of the disease. But you know, as you know, the local thinning uh, actually causes more and more uh, kind of you know bulging out around that location of the cornea. So if you initiate the you know you know relatively smaller magnitude thinning. But they could actually amplify, you know, amplify, you know, more and more as the disease progresses. And we also found that um, the uh, uh, matrix stiffness uh, actually quite decreased around that uh, apex of the cone locations. So that could be part of the reason. And the, um, you know, the organization of the, you know, the collagen fibers around that apex of the cone 
also very different from the normal, you know, structure of the collagen fibril, uh, you know, in, in normal corneas. So if Thanks. you, you know, input right. all the parameters into it, then you actually see a lot more, you know, surface deformation of the cornea, the, given the um, magnitude of intraocular pressure. I have a question for uh, Gunyang or sort of um, the Damien Gantanel has this wonderful video if you ever get a chance to look at it from Paris, um, basically showing uh, patients eye rubbing. Mm -hmm. And it's he literally has a screen with about 20, 20 different patients that he's observed eye rubbing that all had keratoconus. And he, he also thinks that people with unilateral keratoconus tend to sleep on one side. Uh, and so that has some relevance to your, you know, your pressure studies. Um, any comments about, you know, eye rubbing pressure, external compression versus internal? Yeah, well, uh, well, by definition of the, um, I don't know, mechanical property of the cornea, the mechanical, uh, the cornea, is as a defined as an incompressible uh, structure. So meaning if you compress it, it comes back. And you know, that, that kind of thing happens over and over again. But I, I don't have any like a direct insights into you know, how the eye rubbing would affect the, um, you know, the mechanical property of the cornea. Um, but I think um, you know, the slipping style, I think, or you know, that's probably you know, myself is one of those categories too, um, you know, when you get up, you feel more pressure in your eye. So that might, I don't know, like a pressurize the uh, cornea surface too much, then, then all this, you know, the interlacing, uh, you know, collagen uh, fiber lamella kind of slips out a little more um, so that, you know, the mechanical, um, you know, connection gets weaker over time. Um, so that's kind of my hypothesis to explain that. Yeah, I have a quick question for David. Um, David, when do you think, do you think, first of all, do you think OCT will overtake sort of traditional uh, uh, corneal topography? Uh, and, and when do you think that might happen if you, if you think it's going to happen? I, I, I'm biased, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I do, I think, uh, because OCT can measure um, epithelium, uh, corneal epithelial thickness uh, accurately and, and non-invasively, that's going to be an advantage. Uh, and I also have some data that shows it can map the posterior cornea more precisely, and that might be another leg up. Uh, so uh, uh, eventually, uh, as OCT technology keep improving and the speed keep getting faster and the algorithm improve, it should be the uh, preferred uh, way to map the cornea. Uh, I think if it's easy to get FDA approval, this probably would occur in a few years, but since regu regulatory uh, approval takes a long time, this might play it out over more years. Um, but I think eventually it will occur. Well, it's a diagnostic, so hopefully it's just a 510K. So it wouldn't, hopefully it wouldn't take, you know, you wouldn't have to do a, cl a large clinical trial, if any, so. Um, hi, uh, sorry to interrupt. We uh, have a question from Dr. Ryan. I'm going to, uh, are you unmuted, Dr. Ryan? Dr. Ryan, unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Huang uh, with respect to whether or not your group has looked at um, the effects on epithelial thickness in the presence, say, of continuous wear contact lenses, you know, old hydrogel materials versus a new silicone hydrogel materials, maybe 30 day wear, maybe contact lens abusers as well as things like uh, overnight orthokeratology, you know, the effects that that has on epithelial thickness. Any insights on that? Um, I, I haven't done any study comparing the different type of uh, soft contact lens. I, I find that uh, with soft contact lens, uh, often they, patients come in 
Falesi Priyap, uh, and they, they have some typically inferior epithelial thickening and superior thinning uh, and some weird topography. And I, I asked them to come back in another two weeks or a month. And uh, often there's not a lot of change um, on the epithelium. And I also have a lot of patients who don't wear contact lens and has these uh, warpage patterns. So I think uh, as I see more of these epithelial warpage uh, cases, I'm not really sure that most of them are related to contact lens. I think uh, it's related to either eyelid or, or dry eye. Um, and it's actually quite common. Uh, and I hope to collect a big series so I can do quantitative analysis. Ortho K is a different case. Uh, ortho K patients that come in, I can, you, you can see very distinct uh, pattern of epithelial thickness change uh, that correlates with the, uh, the refractive change. So that, that's a big effect. But soft contact lens is usually a pretty small effect. And I'm not sure if I do a study, um, I would see a lot of change, you know, unless there's a significant epithelial uh, edema. Of course, in orthokeratology, that's intentional, right? That epithelial shift and migration is intentional, but I just wonder if there may be a better way for us to monitor the ongoing ocular health of our patients who choose to do, say, 30-day continuous wear hydrogel lenses or silicone hydrogel lenses you know, looking for things like microcystic changes and evidence of chronic hypoxia and things of that nature uh, before they get into trouble. I, th I think it's possible to look, look at uh, if, if you have microcystic edema that would show up. I, I just haven't done the study of those, those type of patient in particular. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Gonzalez. Dr. Yes, um, this comes from some, hello, uh, this comes from some of the work that I'm doing with Collins Lab, and it pertains to the question that Scott poses regarding the uh, mechanical aspects of keratoconus. And so what we find in floppy eyelid syndrome is a similar type of decompensation of relatively elastic structures, um, i.e. Uh, we have the tarsus, which changes, and that is also associated with obstructive sleep apnea slash sleeping typically on one side more so than the other. Um, our hypothesis is that this is related to the microtrauma that delivers and elaborates prostaglandins. The biological plausibility of this is seen in other systems such as cervical ripening. So microtrauma, prostaglandin elaboration and a mechanical breakdown of these um, relatively elastic structures. Thank you. Great comment. Thanks. Great comment. Thanks. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, uh, Dave, you, you showed the, um, you know. Yeah, uh, Dave, you, you showed the, um, you know, great. I think there's some echoing going on. Yeah, me. Okay, as long as Mithra can mute. Yep. Okay. Uh, so you showed th that the um, you know significant local thinning happening in in keratoconus patients, right? Um, you know, we have seen the similar thing uh, several years ago, and I was wondering whether you have any good you know explanations why uh, you know epithelial thickness uh, gets thinner and thinner as the um, keratoconus you know, disease progresses. Yeah, I, I've been wondering the same thing since we started measuring uh, the epithelium with OCT. Uh, and this is 20 years ago. Uh, I first saw it in when I was doing PTK of dystrophies and scars. I noticed that uh, there's dramatic modulation of epithelial thickness is thinner in the, the heel tops and thicker in the valleys. And then uh, looking at myopic LASIK and hyperopic LASIK, you also see that uh, it responds to uh, anterior surface curvature. And uh, I actually published a paper back in 2003 
showing that it uh, it's fairly predictable if you uh, quantify steepness or curvature as min min curvature, you know, the average of the curvature on the major and minor axes. Um, and based on that, uh, the the, uh, the the corner epithelium actually acts like a, a second order Butterworth low pass filter and uh, helps smooth the an anterior cornea. Uh, as to why that smoothing action occurs, uh, I, I speculated back then that it might have to do with cell migration and contact inhibition and a balance between migration, uh, generation and sloughing. And you can calculate, uh, I guess uh, migration constant and smoothing constant based on those forces uh, in a mathematical model. Um, and I, I haven't really done much more work than that since then, but uh, I still think that that might be the basic framework. Um, you know, uh, cells may migrate toward the side with less contact inhibition. And that, based on that model, you could derive some sort of smoothing action like this. There might be other uh, cell behaviors that I don't know very well. Um, I, I hope some of, you know, other people that understand cell motility and, and life cycle can model that better than I, I do. But I, I think it is understandable uh, if somebody wants to investigate it. Great, thank you. Okay. So do we have time for one more question, David? Absolutely. Okay, I have a quick question for Jesse, actually. Um, it's very, um, how can I say, more, more on the speculation side of things. And, and it also may, um, may fit in a little bit to the use of your technology for imaging the vasculature in the context of things like retinal degenerations, which start at the photoreceptor level. So I'm thinking RP, for instance. Um, so in RP, I mean, there's, there's a fair amount of effort now um, looking at neuronal plasticity in the inner retina with respect to photoreceptor degenerations, right? And I do wonder whether there are vascular changes or immune cell behavior changes that can either precede or become early flags for for impending massive loss of photoreceptors. Do you, is there anything known about that? Could this be something that can be done? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. We're really um, at sort of the juncture of being able to answer some of those questions with, with these technologies. So you, you propose two pretty massive fields. One is you know, vascular remodeling. Uh, the other is sort of neural glial remodeling. I'll try and answer those in turn. So the, for vascular remodeling, you know, there are a number of groups that are looking at uh, you know, vascular remodeling as a predictive measure for progression of retinal disease. Um, you know, as Dr. Wong knows, uh, that it could be a predictive biomarker for the progressive uh, features of things like glaucoma, right? Whether or not vascular deficits could, I think it's still <laughs> debated, but vascular defects could precede uh, the anatomical loss of things like arc defects in glaucoma. Uh, for neural and glial remodeling, in retinal disease, I think the immune cell imaging is gonna be really interesting for seeing not only disease, but uh, development aspects as well. So when you lose, um, for example, photoreceptor input in a variety of retinal degenerative disease, it's been long implicated that there's inner retinal remodeling as well. And that remodeling doesn't just happen in a vacuum, it's being medi mediated by something, an active process. And because especially immune cells and, and in particular microglia, are thought to be implicated in synaptic remodeling. We think that this will be a really cool tool to look at um, the remodeling process of the inner retina as the outer retina is lost. Thanks, Jesse. Well, thank you everyone for a wonderful morning. We're gonna take a lunch break right now and reconvene at 1240 and we'll introduce uh, David Wong formally for the Fred Deshay um, lecture. So everybody, thanks for this morning. Don't forget to visit the uh, virtual exhibits. And uh, remember, if you get lost, um, www.i2021.urmc.edu. See you all at 1240.
Thank you. The lecture was established in 2018 to honor our own Fred Deshaies, who has been a guiding light in resident education and a source of inspiration to us all. It has become a keynote lecture at our annual conference and will live on in perpetuity. Fred is a constant FEI res is Fred is a constant in the FEI resident clinic. For more than 20 years, he has shepherded a stream of trainees, helping them learn the nuances of ophthalmology and patient care. He completed his residency here at the University of Rochester in 1961 after completing medical school at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. He was one of three residents who covered Strong Hospital and Rochester General Hospital at that time. He then went on to complete a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary under David Kogan. And in 1998, after a successful career in private practice, Fred joined the faculty at the University of Rochester Department of Ophthalmology to provide resident education and educate he has. Since joining, he has helped train more than 60 residents with many of them going on into academic medicine. He continues to precept in the resident clinic today and as the consummate physician, teacher, and friend, embodying what it means to be part of academic medicine and carry the torch for resident education. You've already met today's Duche lecturer, David Huang, and I hope you enjoyed his presentation about classifying corneal, corneal deformities. I'm thrilled that he could join us and certainly wish he could have been here in person to meet and speak with us all. David's contributions to ophthalmology have been seminal. As co-inventor of optical coherence tomography, all eye care professionals owe him their admiration and gratitude. Today, this commonly used ophthalmic imaging technology helps us diagnose and treat patients at a rate of more than 30 million times per year. His original article on OCT published in Science in 1991 has been cited more than 14,000 times. David is truly a prolific researcher and inventor. He has 34 issued patents in the areas of OCT, OCT angiography, mobile health testing, tissue engineering, and laser surgery. He has published more than 300 peer review articles with over 40,000 citations. He's edited 11 books. And since the invention of OCT, he has contributed to the development of polarization sensitive OCT, swept source OCT, anterior segment OCT, Doppler OCT, and OCT angiography technologies. He has pioneered new applications for these technologies, anterior eye diseases, glaucoma, retinal diseases, and neurological diseases. For his efforts in developing OCT, in 2012, David was honored with ophthalmology's greatest prize, the Champagne Lamar Vision Award, the largest prize given for ophthalmic research. He received it next to our own David Williams, making his participation in this year's meeting truly special. David has also received the Friedenwald Award from Arvo and the Russ Prize from the National Academy of Engineering for Outstanding Bioengineering Achievement and the Senior Achievement Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology to name just a few. On a personal note, David attended high school here in Avoca, New York. Uh, David, welcome back to Upstate, and then attended college at MIT, followed by an MD, PhD at MIT and Harvard. He is a fellow L LA County USC resident graduate, and I guess I just missed you by one year there, David. He then went on to complete a Cornell Fellowship at Emory. I'm privileged and honored to introduce this year's Frederick Dusay Distinguished Professor Lecturer, David, Dr. David Huang, who will present OCT and Geography, State of the Art and Future Trends. Welcome, David. Thank you, David, for that uh, introduction and uh, for the honor of giving the uh, Duche lecture. And of course, it's also a great pleasure to uh, see Dr. Duche uh, virtually. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about OCT and geography, uh, state of the art and future trends. And I, I do have a financial interest in this uh, technology. 
So OCT and geography is possible because of uh, the speed of OCT's uh, uh, continual events. Uh, there's a Moore's law of commercial OCT speed that I plotted out over time and approximately it doubles every two years. So uncannily it uh, uh, mirrors the uh, Moore's law in semiconductors and integrated circuits quite well. So we can anticipate that the speed will continue to improve and would we'll be able to do more and more with OCT technology. Uh, and some of the things you can do here uh, include 3D volumetric imaging, which we already seen for a few years, corneal topography, which is uh, coming online. And of course, OCT and geography, which I think is even more significant. Uh, so first I wanna talk about the, the principles of OCT and geography. Uh, and a lot of this material was uh, prepared with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, Yali Jia, which is now a uh, associate professor uh, in our institution. Uh, so uh, high-speed Fourier domain OCT makes possible 3D volumetric imaging. Um, and OCT and geography is really an extension into the fourth dimension of time by taking repeated uh, B frames at the same location, you can detect the change in signal due to uh, blood flow. So OCT uh, and geography uh, was pioneered by uh, Dr. Yasu, Yaki, uh, Yasuno in Japan uh, in 2006. Uh, Dr. Ricky Wong here in the uh, US in 2007. I wasn't really even uh, that much aware of it until uh, 2009 when I uh, was visiting Wellman Lab and talked to Dr. Ben Vakash, really taught me the, the basic principles. And uh, I decided that this is a really important uh, direction that I wanted to explore and started working on it uh, around 2011. Uh, and it's, it was kind of uh, fortuitous. Ricky Wong was at OHSU and he uh, invented the, uh, the OMAG approach that is used in the Xi systems. And uh, I still one of his uh, students, Yali Jia, uh, and we uh, developed a, a different approach called SADA that was a basis for the, uh, the OptoView, AngioView uh, system. And, and the, these are uh, the, were the first OCT and geography system to become clinically available. And uh, uh, it, it was a coincidence that we were both at the same place at OHSU. But now there are uh, quite a few systems that are commercially available. Uh, and the, the speed has uh, increase into the second generation. Now we have systems running more than 100 kilohertz axial line uh, repetition rate, uh, both uh, using spectral uh, domain and swept source uh, technologies. And in the laboratory, there are very high speed megahertz OCT systems that can do even more impressive OCT and geography. So this is a, a, a and, technology that is certainly gonna to continue to improve as, as speed uh, increases. So the basic principle is, I think fairly easy to understand uh, based on uh, motion contrast, uh, an analogy can be made uh, between these flying tennis balls on video frames and the uh, uh, blood cells in capillaries uh, if you look at the difference in this video signal by just taking a subtraction, you can see that the uh, flowing component is highlighted. Um, but the, the shadow cast on the wall uh, is also highlighted. And this is the uh, projection artifact that I will talk about uh, later. Uh, probably one of the most important annoying artifacts in OCT and geography. And of course, the static structures are removed, which give you this very high contrast for flow even down to capillary level. Uh, 
so OCT angiography uses intrinsic motion contrast. So no dye injection or any other extrinsic contrast uh, is needed, which is a great advantage for clinical utilization. Uh, and so you can see here that you uh, acquire a series of uh, uh, OCT B frames and static structures has relatively constant uh, uh, reflectance while flow, flowing red blood cells produce this fluctuation in the signal, which can be measured uh, in amplitude or phase by a variety of uh, metrics. Uh, I favor decorrelation as something that's most normalized and unaffected by reflectance. Um, and what uh, was needed to make it clinically practical was high-speed OCT platforms and an efficient algorithm that doesn't require too many frames. And uh, one of our important contribution is developing the split spectrum uh, amplitude decorrelation and geography algorithm or uh, SADA in which we um, split the OCT images into spectral components to increase the number of effective frames available. Uh, and we compute, uh, so we can split each image into as much as many as 11 frames and compute the correlation uh, in these 11 frames and then recombine the flow um, signal. And this works because uh, at different uh, spectral components have individual uh, different uh, uh, speckle patterns. And in this way, we can in, in improve the amount of flow signal without increasing scan time. Uh, and this is uh, borne out in practice uh, with only two B scans in each position. Uh, SADA can increase the signal to noise ratio of flow detection uh, by a factor of four and uh, detect uh, twice uh, the amount of uh, blood vessels, uh, including capillaries. And this was published back in uh, 2015. OCT angiography is intrinsically three-dimensional. Uh, as you, you can see here, um, the, uh, the flow pattern is different at, at different depth. So the the best way to visualize OCT angiography is based on anatomic slabs in the retina. For example, here, um, you by uh, separating out the, uh, the outer retinal slab, you can clearly see the choroidal neovascular membrane. And uh, deeper down in the choroidal capillaries, you can see flow defect associated with, with this lesion. And these can be referenced to the normal uh, vasculature in the inner retina. And of course, you can composite this using color coding, which is uh, an, another powerful approach for visualization. So I, that, that is the, uh, the state of the art of OCT angiography. I also want to talk about some uh, future trends, which include projection uh, resolution uh, and uh, early detection of disease prediction of function, artificial intelligence, wider field, and higher resolution. Um, but first I will talk about projection resolve OCT angiography, which is uh, now available in some commercial uh, platforms. Uh, it uh, uh, was pioneered in, in, in our group, uh, again, uh, with uh, Dr. Yali Jia. Uh, so what are projection artifacts? Well, on a, a cross-sectional OCTA, they show up as these vertical streaks in flow signal that go from the inner retina where the real vessels are uh, streaking all the way down like a long tail, all the way down to the, uh, the RPE where, you know, it should be avascular. So those are clearly... Um, artifact and it's due to the fluctuating shadow being detected as flow signal. When you uh, divide the retina into slabs, you see that this projection artifact uh, shows up as duplication of inner renal vessels on deeper slabs. This really uh, hinders your ability to look at vasculature in the deeper planes. 
So how do we resolve it? Uh, so we take the uh, uh, an A line from the original OCTA, and you see the the pattern is kind of hard to recognize, but when you um, uh, compensate for the effect of reflectance, we see that real flow uh, shows up as successively higher peaks. So using this inside, you could uh, recognize real flow versus artifact uh, and recover uh, vessels in, in different uh, retinal layers cleanly. Another way is to recognize that uh, real capillaries tend to have higher reflectance uh, compared to the surrounding retinal tissue, whereas the, uh, the artifacts tend to have lower reflectance. So by a transverse analysis, you could uh, remove the uh, flow artifacts. So this was uh, uh, also published uh, in 2017. And uh, currently, we actually combine both techniques to get even cleaner removal of flow artifacts. And this allows us to uh, provide clean visualization and accurate measurement of uh, capillaries layer by layer. Uh, and it, these are uh, retinal plexuses, corneal capillaries, CNV, and uh, plexus specific pathologies. Uh, in the normal retina, uh, in the macula, uh, you can recognize actually four separate uh, um, plexuses. The uh, nerve fiber layer plexus and the ganglion cell layer plexus together from the superficial vascular complex. And this perfuses basically the ganglion cells. Um, deeper down in the intermediate capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus, um, they together form uh, the deep vascular complex. These are basically uh, mostly capillary layers without large vessels. And they uh, basically perfuse the bipolar cells roughly. Uh, projection resolution also help you visualize the choreo capillaries more cleanly to obtain an anatomy closer to uh, what you would see on electron microscopy. And it allow you to see the choroidal neovascular membrane more cleanly. There were an older technique where you, you su subtract the uh, uh, signal from the inner retina, uh, but this suppresses the uh, real flow signal too much. So our PROCTA algorithm is better for this purposes. So now that we can cleanly visualize uh, blood vessels layer by layer, we, this can help us classify disease by uh, looking at the, the layer uh, pattern. Optic nerve diseases, for example, glaucoma, primarily affect the superficial vascular complex. Outer retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa primarily affect the deep vascular complex. Renal vascular diseases such as diabetic renopathy or vein occlusion affect all plexuses. Uh, neovascularizations can be classified as those above the ILM, for example, in proliferative um, diabetic retinopathy. And the uh, AMD related CNV can be classified into type 1 and 2. And diseases can be staged in some cases, MECTAL and RAP. Uh, occupy different layers at different stages. So this is an example from glaucoma, where we see that the uh, reduction in capillary density primarily uh, occurs in the superficial vascular complex, as shown on lower left, pointed out with the yellow uh, arrows. And in the parapapillary region, it uh, affects the SVC and uh, this pattern is especially cleanly visualized if you just focus purely on the nerve fiber layer plexus and uh, by focusing on this layer you can obtain high diagnostic accuracy uh, in this case uh, a rock of 0.985 in uh, mostly early 
glaucoma uh, group. In retinitis pigmentosa, uh, primarily the deep capillary plexus uh, is affected, as you can see on the uh, lower right. Uh, the uh, intermediate capillary plexus is affected to a smaller extent in the superficial vascular complex. Uh, it's uh, very little, very little affected. Uh, in diabetic retinopathy, all of the plexus are affected. You, uh, you can see different patterns uh, in a superficial vascular complex. Primarily, you see these non-perfusion uh, areas and deeper uh, layers that are primarily capillary. You can see malformations such as microaneurysm and dilated uh, vessels. By dividing into uh, Plexuses, you can recognize non-perfusion better, and you can actually detect non-perfusion even in uh, diabetic without uh, clinically apparent retinopathy uh, by using three separate slabs. Seventy percent of these uh, have some capillary, detectable capillary dropout. Uh, this is an example of a CNV with both uh, component uh, above the RPE, uh, type 2, shown in green, and below the RPE, type 1, shown in yellow. And these correspond to uh, the, uh, the classic and occult components on flourishing and geography. And these, they are, uh, if you look at the lower right, the cross-section of OCT and geography that's color-coded, they are very apparent. And they have um, prognostic uh, uh, value, especially in terms of how fast they respond to uh, anti-VEGF therapy. So with OCT angiography, in some cases, you can detect uh, diseases early be before even the uh, symptom onset. I want to give two examples. One is pre-parametric glaucoma, and other is non-exudative CNV. So uh, there are two uh, articles in the literature that shows uh, earlier, more sensitive detection of uh, pre-parametric glaucoma and the, uh, the uh, apparently normal eyes of unilateral glaucoma. And I think this may be due to the ability of OCT and geography to detect uh, reduced metabolism of sick ganglion cells before they undergo apoptosis and uh, structural thinning. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the detection of non-exudative CNV, uh, which is pioneered by Dr. Steve Bailey and Yali Jha in a uh, NEI-supported research at Casey. Um, so I want to talk about a study where they uh, follow a group of 63 eyes with intermediate AMD. They're the fallow eyes of exudative AMD where they surveyed uh, with OCT and geography every six months. And they uh, detected non-exudative CNV lesions in these fallow eyes uh, in a fair number uh, over time. And these often uh, have no findings on fluorescein and geography, no fluid accumulation on structural OCT, but on OCT and geography shows up uh, as type one uh, neovascular nets uh, under the RPE. And over time, these grow. And then at some stage, uh, converts to uh, exudation and need uh, uh, treatment. So uh, if you look at this group, uh, the eyes with uh, de detection of non-exudated CMV at baseline or during the follow-up have a much greater rate of developing uh, retinal fluid or exudation. Uh, and this typically occur within six months. Uh, and the Cox hazard ratio is 18. So the, these eyes are uh, very at very high risk. Um, and if you look at the size of the CNV, uh, the non-exudative CNV, they grow uh, typically rapidly. Um, and once they start leaking and uh, receive anti-VEGF therapy, this growth uh, tapers off. 
there are some lesions that appear to be long-standing and grow very slowly, and these tend not to uh, progress to exudation, although they can at unpredict unpredictable times. So uh, non-exudative CMV, I think the best found by OCT angiography, uh, because you can do surve surveillance uh, frequently uh, as compared to ICG angiography. Uh, so I think intermediate AMDI should be screened with OCT angiography. And these are at very high risk for developing exudation once you detect them. So uh, monthly OCT angiography is probably warranted in the first six months after uh, detection. Rapid growth may presage exudation. Uh, and I think uh, it may be worthwhile to uh, attempt a prophylactic treatment. Of, there's no current indication for that with any of the anti-VEGF uh, medications, but I think a study is possible. Uh, people have asked me that if they're not leaking, then what would, you, what would be your endpoint? I think a potential endpoint is measuring the rate of growth. For example, you could uh, uh, pose as a target uh, controlling the rate of growth to less than 4% per month. I want to come back to glaucoma. Uh, we have a longitudinal glaucoma study, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, our co-investigators, uh, Dr. Liang Liu, Ai Yin Chen, John Morrison, uh, Wang Jie, and Yali Jia. So the impetus is the, for using LCT angiography really is that visual field, although it's a commonly used uh, diagnostic are, are poorly reproducible. Three visual fields are needed to produce a, a reliable diagnosis in the old study and the uh, uh, significant progression uh, re really require a long time to uh, confirm at uh, a, a statistically significant level. Uh, and in a, a paper by Madero, they found that uh, it takes four to five years at, by which time you already have 60 to 70% loss in retinal sensitivity. So we would like to uh, detect significant change uh, earlier, and you can do this with uh, structural OCT, uh, which works very well in early glaucoma, but it doesn't work well in late glaucoma because the structure approach a floor value, uh, for example, nerve fibular thickness by moderate uh, glaucoma already reach a floor value and doesn't change much with additional progression. Uh, and this is a limitation even if you convert it to a dB scale. Whereas nerve fiber layer capillary density has a greater dynamic range and has better correlation with visual field over a wider range of severity. Uh, we, we published this uh, in a visual field simulation paper in 2020 in AJO. Uh, and uh, in the, that visual field simulation paper, we show that uh, conversion uh, in a visual field equivalent dB scale uh, is useful in improving correlation uh, with actual visual field. Uh, and I think this is needed to get a more accurate sense of the speed of progression, because otherwise um, this same amount of progression would appear very differently in early glaucoma compared to uh, moderate or late glaucoma. So uh, our visual field simulation works on a sector basis. We extended the garway heath sector uh, scheme to correlate nerve fiber layer uh, sectors with the visual field and we measure the capillary density using nonlinear transformation. We can predict a visual field sector by sector. Um, and we study that in a, a group of glaucoma and normal patients. And here's a normal example. Uh, you see that the uh, simulated field is normal, just like the actual field. Uh, in early parametric glaucoma, we typically get fairly good uh, correlation of the pattern of the visual field loss, although we tend to get slightly more uh, damage uh, 
severity assessed by uh, the simulated visual field based on OCTA. In this case, a moderate uh, parametric glaucoma, the actual visual field and simulated visual field correlate very well, both those in terms of pattern and severity with the identical uh, mean deviation. And in advanced parametric glaucoma, uh, again, the pattern matches very well, but now the uh, simulation tend to underestimate. Uh, the neurofibro layer plexus, OCTA-based mean deviation, is more reproducible than the actual visual field mean deviation uh, based on the pool standard deviation. And uh, it also has higher diagnostic sensitivity. Um, so neurofibro layer plexus mean deviation had a 97% uh, sensitivity and 99% specificity, uh, significantly better than actual visual field or even uh, neurofibro layer thickness. So the, uh, the weak spot for this is that the correlation uh, is still uh, not as good in advanced glaucoma. I tend to underestimate the severity of glaucoma. So um, this is still early work, but uh, what we can conclude now is that OCT and geography-based visual field simulation uh, can achieve higher reproducibility and diagnostic accuracy than actual visual field. Uh, and it generally correlates well, except in advanced glaucoma. And this, so this may, may, may be useful in glaucoma diagnosis and monitoring. Of course, more experience in clinical studies are needed. Next, I wanna talk about the use of artificial intelligence uh, in OCT and geography. Uh, this is definitely gonna grow and it can be used in many areas in segmentation, pathology recognition, and uh, uh, quality uh, improvement. I wanted to talk uh, in two specific uh, projects in our uh, research group. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, distinguishing avascular area from shadow artifacts, work done by uh, Yukun Guo and Yali Jia. Um, so when we look at uh, OCTA on FAS, we often see these area that look like dropout. Uh, that also had lower signal. So it's a, a conundrum on whether it's really uh, just a shadow versus a real um, capillary dropout. And it's not an easy problem because uh, you can have them coincide. Um, you know, for example, here, uh, you, you can have a real shadow from vitreous floater that produce low reflectance signal but you can also have cysts uh, in the retina that give you low OCT signal, but it's not due to shadow. Uh, and you need to distinguish between these. So it's not that straightforward. Um, so for uh, training this artificial intelligence, we uh, rely on uh, manufacturing some shadows that we know for sure is shadowing by using little filaments in the beam path. Um, and this is a, a convolutional neural network that take into account uh, the inner retinal thickness, the inner retinal reflectance, and also the uh, inner retinal OCT angiogram. And uh, as an output, it uh, classifies areas of uh, low flow or avascular areas and low signal sh shadow areas. Uh, it's a MedNet 2. Uh, it's uh, a multi-layer convolutional uh, neural network. And the, uh, the results uh, are good uh, according to uh, uh, a six-fold cross-validated uh, um, assessment of the uh, uh, classification uh, accuracy in uh, diabetics as well as in uh, healthy uh, control. The, uh, the ground truths were based on uh, a manual grading uh, from three graders uh, by majority vote uh, on the pixel level. Uh, and you can see um, that we are able to recognize uh, 
shadows uh, shown in yellow on the bottom and the uh, uh, FAZ, which is avascular, shown in blue on the bottom. Um, and these are in actual diabetics uh, where uh, the, the yellow is actual uh, pathology, uh, diabetes related uh, capillary dropout. Oh, I'm sorry, this is actually uh, a series of uh, healthy eyes where there are uh, vitreous floaters. So these uh, yellow is uh, uh, shadows. And then the next, this next slide shows the uh, vascular dropout in blue. So uh, this scheme works in uh, disease and in including severe diabetic retinopathy and also works in uh, OCT angiograms with uh, poor signal. And there, there is a, a reasonable uh, coefficient of variation, uh, actually better than manual delineation. So in summary, uh, MATNAT and CNN can be trained to distinguish between avascular area and signal reduction. Um, Next, I want to talk about boosting transverse resolution of OCTA. Um, and this is uh, an effort to improve the ability to obtain um, more detailed OCTA without increasing the scan density, which takes more time when you have limited OCT speed. So uh, as an input, we take a low uh, low definition 300 by 300 pixel OCT angiogram of the uh, superficial vascular complex. Uh, and as an output, we obtain a high definition 600 by 600 OCTA. And as you can see, the, uh, the art artificial intelligence uh, harnet um, is able to uh, obtain much more uh, detailed and cleaner uh, angiogram. And this was published in Optics Express in 2020. It works um, in normal eyes, mild diabetic retinopathy, as well as severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So in summary, uh, artificial intelligence can uh, double the OCT image resolution. Uh, and next, I wanna talk about real enhancements in uh, resolution using optical methods, uh, specifically sensorless adaptive optics OCTA. So we know that in commercial OCTA systems, um, the uh, beam Spot size is about 20 microns, which is actually two to four times bigger than actual capillary diameters. So it really makes the capillaries look fat. Um, that's apparent when you look at these images on the lower right with histology, you can see very thin capillaries and OCTA, you see grossly fat capillaries. And of course, uh, this is also apparent when you look at the ad adaptive optic uh, uh, OCTA and other angiograms uh, produced at Rochester, which show these very fine capillaries. So we, we want to recover the true dimensions of the capillaries. And uh, an approach we took was to uh, uh, use sensorless adaptive optic OCT. And that is different from the regular uh, adaptive optic system where the uh, deformable mirror is driven by the wavefront sensor. And we took the wavefront sensor away and used the OCT signal itself uh, to directly drive the deformable mirror uh, using GPU processing, which can be run in real time. The advantage is that it, this is lower cost, lower complexity, lower bulk, and uh, it's easily can be easily manipulated to focus on any layer. Disadvantage is that it's slower, work in seconds rather than milliseconds, as uh, 
uh, you guys have achieved it in Rochester. Uh, it's computationally more intensive. So it tend to work better for moderate rather than ultra high resolution. Uh, but as you can see here, the system is actually very compact, uh, really no bigger than your regular uh, OCT system. And uh, it can achieve uh, a resolution of six microns uh, in a publication in 2020 that we produce. It can converge um, in about 1.5 seconds, correcting defocus astigmatism and coma, and it's sufficient to uh, visualize uh, capillaries in fine detail, as, as well as photoreceptors in uh, eccentric locations. So it definitely uh, improves the uh, level of detail uh, of capillaries and uh, obtain uh, images with where the caliber is more uh, realistic. Um, sorry, what I wanted to show also here is that it reduces uh, projection artifact even without the use of any uh, PROCT algorithm uh, post-processing as seen by the uh, location uh, pointed out by the yellow uh, arrow. And if you blow up the images, you can see that uh, the capillary detail is greatly enhanced. And we can obtain uh, uh, with registration of uh, redundant uh, scans, um, very continuous capillary networks without uh, motion artifact and probably to a partial extent uh, uh, overcome the, the problem of pulsatile uh, variations and intermittent non-perfusion. So in summary, uh, Sensorless AO can improve OCT and OCT a image resolution um, uh, improve continuity and contrast and reduce projection artifacts. And it's a low cost and compact uh, approach to uh, achieve that. And uh, it, it should be uh, applicable to uh, clinical imaging. I also want to uh, talk briefly about Whitefield OCTA. Uh, one approach is uh, to uh, montage several scans, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, here with the OptoView system as well, uh, montaging 12 by 12 uh, scans to obtain fairly good coverage. This is uh, uh, applicable to diabetic retinopathy. We also have very fast systems that can get a very wide feel in a single shot. So uh, in summary, OCT angiography is a paradigm change in angiography involving no injection. It's faster because you don't have to wait for a dye transit. It's cheaper and it's uh, better in some ways uh, and it's getting better all the time with improvement in technology. And uh, I think a main advantage is that it can be used in every visit because it's non-invasive. So it has screening and monitoring uh, efficacies. And I predict it will be used a lot more than fluorescein angiography ever was. Uh, there's a 15 year lag between the first papers on OCT and OCTA, uh, 18 year lag in uh, commercial introduction. But in terms of publications, they are, uh, it's OCTA is uh, rapidly catching up with structural OCT. I'd like to acknowledge the support of uh, NEI, RPB, and OptiView in our research. And again, please visit our group website, uh, coolab.net. Thank you. David, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating and really shows where we're going. And you don't know how excited I would be not to have to do a forcing angiogram in my clinic. So that would be absolutely fabulous. Um, I'd like to open up for discussion. Let's see if we have any questions. Um, please raise your hand or speak up, please. You can just talk. I have a question. Hi, Fred. Of course, by virtue of my age and my years of training, it was long before OCT was even a glimmer in anyone's mind. 
But my question that I have now for Dr. Wang is, we see a lot of people who are labeled ocular hypertensives. Would OCTA around the optic nerve be of any value in predicting whether or not these ocular hypertensives are truly going to go on into glaucoma or just going to remain ocular hypertensives? Uh, I think in some cases, uh, OCT angiography will be able to detect uh, loss of perfusion first before uh, visual field changes or structural OCT changes show up uh, in these ocular hypertensives. Um, I, I don't think it'll be all the time, but it, it could possibly be most of the time providing earlier detection. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jennifer Hunter. Um, she liked your presentation and she thought the sensorless OCT improvement was very nice. And her question is, why were so few aberrations considered for the correction? Why is spherical aberration not corrected? Um, well, because of the speed limitation, we want to uh, achieve correction in as few seconds as possible. We, we skip spherical aberration because of this uh, first group of patient we scan have normal corneas and uh, really uh, did not require spherical aberration correction. It didn't really make any difference, but of course, that's not true in general, and we could uh, easily add uh, spherical aberration in. Uh, it would take slightly longer. So instead of 1.5 seconds, it might have taken two seconds to converge. Um, that's just our first attempt. I think we could make it faster in the future uh, with more efficient algorithm and faster GPU. Um, and uh, um, Certainly for, uh, if we wanna achieve five to six micron resolution, I think uh, generally we would want to correct spherical aberration. Uh, Sometimes we just want nine or 10 micron resolution, then uh, we probably don't, don't need to take that into account. It really, we can dial in the speed versus uh, resolution trade-off. Great, we have another uh, question in the chat box from one of our residents, um, Kyle Green. He says, Dr. Huang, thank you for your great talk. Do you think there is a future for OCTA to overcome some of its limitations compared to FA, specifically regarding pathology that requires temporal resolution, for example, detecting leakage? Um, well, I think leakage is uh, one thing that OCTA probably will never be able to fully replace. Although, uh, you know, wh where you have leakage, you tend to have fluid accumulation. And uh, with these volumetric high definition OCT, you can detect small fluid pockets with high sensitivity. So that's uh, that partially make up for this deficit. There are other um, uh, temporal changes like in per intermittent perfusion, for example, uh, where uh, OCTA uh, could, um, could detect by scanning the same place several times over a certain period of time. I'm very interested in that. That's why I was asking about uh, what the characteristic time scale is. We can design scan patterns to try to detect that quickly, uh, more, uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, it might be a new, new disease biomarker. Great, I, we got Steve Felden. Uh, Steve Coffrin, can you bring Steve on to ask the question or would you like me to read it? I can bring Steve right up, just give me a second. Thought you'd like to say hi to Steve. <laughs> One second. Steve, you should be able to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello. <laughs> there Hi, Steve. Hey. Yeah, great to see you. Wonderful talk. Yeah, great to see you. Um, so my question really had to do, as you might guess, with the optic nerve head and how helpful it would be to have OCTA that could really segment the various uh, layers 
of the nerve head to differentiate ischemic optic neuropathy from optic neuritis, from papilledema, all the things that uh, we need to, tools we need to have in neuropathology. But uh, it seems like uh, the irregular contour of the topography of the disc makes this quite difficult to achieve. Is there some way around this? Um, I, I think that topographies of the disc actually is not that difficult. Um, but uh, in, in terms of mesh, measuring the structures, it, because it's complex, um, it probably would take some artificial intelligence to recognize various aspects like, um, you know, laminar cribosa defect or uh, edema or rim defect. All these things are um, the, that a human can read real well. It's hard to use some sort of simple metrics to to measure and detect abnormality. But I think in the future, some sort of AI approach would be able to do that. In terms of LCT and geography, the disk is really uh, difficult to analyze because the, the capillaries are so dense and there's projection of not just uh, simple projection from one capillary net, but overlapping projections, uh, which make, make it really difficult for um, the algorithms to, to tease out, especially at the lamina cribosa level. Um, so uh, we, we are working on a higher resolution system like these, uh, the, the sensorless uh, adaptive optic systems where we can uh, have less projection artifact and a finer resolution to see the capillaries and the lamina cribosa. That's one future project I really like to do to see if we can see a uh, small defect that might have to do with the pathogenesis of glaucoma or our other optic neuropathies. Um, and I, uh, I have a focus on the macula and peripapillary region so far because those are much easier targets in terms of simple anatomy and relative lack of artifact. The optic nerve have is certainly the most challenging. Uh, and we'll, that's, that's why I leave it, kind of leave it for last, but we, I think we, we <laughs> will get there with uh, higher resolution systems and artificial intelligence. So our jobs are safe for a little while as an ophthalmologist, but not forever. I think so, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great to see you. Excellent, thanks Steve. Um, a question from Jesse Schalick. Um, David, wonderful overview. Can you please give your opinions on the future of visible light OCT and its applications in oximetry and other applications? For example, GIA et al. work. Uh, yes, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring that up in my uh, talk, but I'm very proud that uh, Yali was able to uh, do oximetry with uh, visible wavelength OCT at the capillary uh, level uh, recently, uh, which is difficult to, to do and give us uh, really uh, a good measure of uh, ischemia at the, the local level. Uh, it, it works well in rodents and probably it's easy to do and anesthetize animals. Uh, to do it in clinic is um, more difficult because how of how bright the, the light is. Um, and, uh, but I think uh, it's, uh, it should be doable once we have lower noise uh, um, light sources that give you more efficient detection. So you can use, so that you can use less light uh, and have higher speed. Uh, and I think that that, that is possible uh, with various approaches. So I think clinically it, it will be feasible to do it in humans uh, with more efficient uh, systems. Whether, whether uh, we need to do it as a common clinical practice, I don't know. It, I think it will always be somewhat more difficult to do. And whether um, there are many diseases where we need that metabolic details, I don't know. Well, you know, it will take more study to, to see if that would become a common instrument. But uh, certainly it's a great uh, research topic. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Did I see someone raise their hand? It went on and off. Um, I guess we have completed all the questions here. Well, David, it was simply a pleasure having you come to speak and it's fascinating where to see where OCT is going. Um, I'm excited to see if we can improve upon that even further clinically. Um, and I think your adaptive optic images were absolutely beautiful. Uh, so keep up the good work. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time here and um, thanks for spending it with us. Yeah, thank, thank you for the nice comments. I was a little bit worried talking about adaptive optics at the <laughs> home of, of adaptive optics. You may think it's relatively primitive, but I try to do, a, do things a simple way. And uh, Dr. Duche, it's an honor to uh, meet you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you very much. Dickerson. Ken is a senior clinical instructor of ophthalmology at FLOM and plays a key role at FEI's Refractive Surgery Center. There he manages preoperative and postoperative candidates for refractive surgeries and also co-manages keratoconus. He's a graduate of the um, State University of New York College of Geneseo and completed a doctorate of optometry at the New England College of Optometry. He's been in practice as a licensed optometrist since 2006, joining the Flama Institute in 2013. He's a member of the American Optometric Society and the New York State Optometric Society including the Rochester chapter where he has held senior leadership positions. Ken, the session's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, let me get my screen going here. Looks like we got all our panelists counted for now. Okay, so we're gonna be basically turning gears over to uh, population health and well eye care and with speakers of Mike DePaul's, Dr. Rashid uh, Ram Chandran, and Bob Ryan to bring up the rear of this, and then we'll take questions. Of course, please put any questions in the Q&A or chat and raise your hand if you feel so inclined. So to start off with, we're going to be, let me introduce Dr. Mike DePaul's. Now, Dr. Paulus um, is an associate professor of clinical um, ophthalmology at the Flama Institute and is co-founder of Visionary um, Eye Associates, which became part of the University of Rochester in 2016. It's hard to believe it's already been five years on that, Mike. Prior to the merger, he has been uh, held a voluntary clinical faculty position, uh, teaching our residents quite a lot about uh, contact lenses over those years and regarded as one of the leading uh, experts in the world of contact lenses and has been a consultant with dozens of um, ophthalmologic companies over the years and a part of numerous uh, clinical trials during that time period about contacts and anterior segment care. Mike is also a member of the American uh, Optometric Association and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. And he is the uh, optometric editor of primary, um, primary Care Optometric News and has served on the review boards for uh, all about vision.com, contact lens spectrum, optometry, eye care and contact lenses, review of optometry and refractive eye care. He's a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salis University. He's authored over 100 articles and uh, textbook chapters and has lectured at more than 600 eye care symposia to count to date. A great accomplishment there, Mike. And in 2007, he was the uh, recipient of the American Optometric Association Contact Lens and Cornea Selections Sections Luminary uh, Award for Distinguished Practice. And in 2010, he received the New York State Optometric Association's Association's Disting Distinguished Achievement Award. So please help me welcome Dr. Mike DePaulis and his talk on myopia management, foresight for short sight. You should be able to share your screen now. There we go. Uh, Ken, first and foremost, thanks for moderating the symposium, uh, this section. Steve Coffrin and Associates, thanks for your uh, logistical expertise. Uh, Dave DiLoretto, thanks for chairing the weekend's event. And for those of you out there uh, joining us in cyberspace, thanks for taking time from your busy schedules to be with us and to support our educational initiatives. So in the spirit of public health, uh, my topic is myopic 
management, uh, foresight for short sight. And uh, the question or the uh, rationale behind this uh, lecture is simply given the changes in prevalence and progression in myopia, not just here in North America, but globally, is a time that we as an eye care community collectively take a little different tack on the way in which we view myopia and its management. In the spirit of full disclosure, I've had the good fortune of working in a variety of capacities with a number of industry partners, but no one is paying me to take the podium today to sell you a product or a consult. I have no financial disclosures. So global myopia, uh, is it really much ado about nothing or cause for concern? I mean, many of us are myopic. Uh, we have family members are myopic. We care for myopic patients in our practice day in and day out. Um, and indeed, even my good friend down here in the corner, Rebel Retinoscopy tells me he's myopic. Is it really much to make a deal about or should we really show some concern, particularly given the given, uh, demographic changes? Well, I think to answer the question, the first thing we need to do is look at the significance of myopia and its societal impact. And how does this set up the population at large for risk of ocular disease? And if this is indeed a concern, how do we identify those who are at risk, get a better understanding on myopia progression and therefore its management? And what can we do pharmacologically, optically, behaviorally uh, to help our patients who are on the track to becoming either moderately or severely myopic? I don't want to bore you with the details. I'm sure you've all seen these numbers. Uh, the World Health Organization expects that by the year 2050, half of the world's population will be myopic here in the United States. Almost 50% of high school seniors today are myopic. Uh, in Singapore, the average myopic individual can expect to expend about 20, 21,000 Singaporean dollars on uh, eye care related to their myopia through the cost of uh, their course of their lifetime. And loss of uh, direct and indirect loss of productivity globally is about $200 billion US dollars per year. But the big concern, of course, are those individuals who are on track to become highly myopic, estimated to be as many as 1 billion by the year 2050. And again, I know I don't need to tell anyone attending this presentation about the potential adverse effects of high myopia. Uh, virtually any continent across the globe affecting both the anterior segment through the posterior pole, we all know the associated risk between high myopia and a variety of ocular pathologies. In fact, my good friend Noel Brennan has modeled this and has said that if we can simply reduce myopia progression by a third, we probably can reduce the frequency of high myopia by over 70%. Now, how do we identify those at risk for high myopia? Well, we know genetics comes into play and certainly the greater the number of parents who are myopic, the greater the likelihood of offspring being myopic. But this study done at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University published in Optometry and Visual Science in 1999, looked at over 3000 Chinese children, their parents and their grandparents. And whereas they found myopic parents did have an increased odds ratio for myopia in their offspring, this effect seemed to diminish between generation two and generation three, implying that today's myopia may be much more than just genetics. Uh, Grabowski and co-workers looked at PubMed, Medline, meta-analysis of 80 worldwide studies and found that indeed, low levels of outdoor activities, near work, dim light, poor sleep, urban setting all play a role above and beyond genetics. And this has given rise to a variety of uh, risk calculators you can find online. I think if you are subscribing to these risk calculators, you should notice their strengths and their weaknesses. If you're consulting parents of a five-year-old who's showing early signs of myopia, myopiaprofile.com is a reasonable site, but their database is predicated on three to five-year-olds. Uh, if you're looking for a much more robust website and risk calculator for high myopia, Brian Holden's bhbi.org is a great place to go. Why the concern for identifying as early as we can? Well, this study uh, published in JAMA Ophthalmology just last year followed over 400 children over a 12 year period of time and found, as you can see, the earlier a youngster shows signs of myopia, the greater their likelihood of developing high myopia. So just what goes on to give rise to myopia and high myopia in particular? Well, we know it's this emetropization process gone awry um, and there have been attempts going back as long as 4,000 years ago to uh, try to find ways to rectify 
uh, the emetropization mechanism. Uh, things like periorbital acupressure has been around for over 4,000 years. William Bates, over 100 years ago, wrote a definitive text on different strategies for mitigating myopia. And even Robert Morrison made the pages of Time magazine 60 years ago talking about contact lenses to slow the progression of myopia. So we know it's all about controlling axial length growth and therefore indirectly spherical equivalent prescriptions. And to do such, we're looking at genetics, pharmacology, optics, and again, behavioral considerations. Genetics, we're still some way, time away, but for the others, uh, you know, we have a lot of good tools in our armamentarium to help us manage these folks. We look at pharmacologic regulation of myopia progression because that's what's been around the longest. Um, we know antimuscarinic agents are, can be very effective. Uh, we don't quite understand exactly how they work. It doesn't appear to work on ciliary body cholinergic receptor-driven mechanisms as evidenced by the fact that you can slow the progression of chicks, uh, myopia in chicks, even though they don't have ciliary body muscarinic receptors. Doesn't appear to be retinal amacrine mediated. Likewise, in chick models, you can ablate the retinal amacrine cells and still mitigate myopia with atropine. We do think that it may be mediated through RPE cells, either acting as a signaling mechanism through dopamine release or through the choroid and the sclera, uh, both locations uh, having positive effects by antimuscarinic agents. And as we all know, atropine has been studied now for well over 50 years in slowing the progression of myopia, but it really wasn't until the ADAM-1 and ADAM-2 studies that uh, this became uh, clearly a legitimized process for controlling myopia. What we've seen over the past decade is a plethora of studies all looking to answer one simple question, what is the lowest possible concentration of atropine that we can use in clinical practice to slow the progression of myopia with minimal side effects? And the industry has pretty much settled somewhere between 0.05 and 0.01% atropine. Uh, very recently, since the LAMP study was published, uh, most clinical sites are gravitating towards 0.02 or 0.025%. I think the rule of thumb when using uh, atropine and managing myopia is it's best to use it as early as possible, but not before four years of age, with the intent of using it during the prime four to six year period of time in which the eye is at greatest risk of having myopic progression. Another selective M1, M4 muscarinic receptor antagonist is perenzepine. Uh, Jimmy Bartlett showed years ago that it had less medriasis and cycloplegia than atropine, but was quite effective in managing uh, myopia progression. Uh, and Sikowski's uh, work showed that it could slow the progression of spherical equivalent refractive error by up to 50%. I sat on the advisory board of a company, Valley Forge Pharmaceuticals, back in 2004, and we looked at every conceivable way of commercializing perenzepine, but basically what we found at that time was parents had no interest in slathering up their children's eyes with a 2% gel twice daily in the spirit of slowing uh, myopia progression. For those of you who are parents and have tried to put sunscreen on kids when they're little, you probably understand exactly why that was the case. I don't think the uh, perenzepine's out of the picture altogether. Uh, I think with some of today's delivery systems, uh, enhanced uh, gels, enhanced suspensions, uh, certainly with uh, nano uh, particle technologies, we may see perenzepine resurface as a more patient-friendly uh, anti-muscarinic management strategy for myopia progression. Another agent is 7-methylxanthine, uh, which is an adenosine antagonist and caffeine metabolite, which seems to alter scleral collagen content and fibril size. It's been uh, shown to slow axial length uh, growth in guinea pigs and in clinical trials uh, with humans to slow the progression of axial length and spherical equivalent refractive error by about 25%. Um, it's commercially available only as an oral agent in Denmark um, and for that reason hasn't gained a lot of attention in global circles. What about the optical management of myopia progression? Well, this is all about trying to uh, optically manipulate the retinal image shell um, by modulating retinal defocus. And we'll get a little more of that into the detail of that in a moment. Uh, it's largely based on the work of um, Dr. Smith out of the University of Houston uh, College of Optometry, who showed that this myopic defocus effects are mediated 
uh, in a local regionally selected manner. And that does seem to be more the peripheral retina than the macula that plays a role here. As it relates to eyeglasses, uh, there were numerous attempts early on to look at using single vision glasses, either full-time, part-time, under correction, over correction, none of which seemed to have a positive impact on slowing axial length growth or spherical equivalent refractive error. The Comet study did show that uh, bifocals and progressive addition lenses can have a benefit, albeit a modest benefit in slowing myopia progression. I think the take home here is if you're prescribing bifocals or progressive addition lenses, you really wanna do it for younger myopes who have a shorter uh, working distance or reading distance and a lag of accommodation with a high AC to A ratio. Uh, that seems to be the subset of population for whom these lenses work best, we at least get the most robust uh, response. What is interesting is the plethora of novel spectacle lenses that have emerged over the past decade. All of these uh, use basically a common theme of a central clear aperture surrounded by some optical array that's intention is to create an element of defocus or reduce contrast in the peripheral retina to slow axial length and spherical equivalent refractive error changes. And as you can see, um, we're starting to see the integration of large players in the optical space, such as Hoya and Essilor in this area. And I would expect that these will all be commercially available, uh, certainly within the next five years. Something that has been available for some time is executive prismatic bifocals. Uh, using an executive bifocal with three prism base in, again, in children with accommodative lag and or high ACA ratios uh, can prove to be beneficial. As it relates to contact lenses, again, the emphasis, much like glasses, is altering the amount of uh, myopic defocus, for lack of a better term, in the peripheral part of the retina. And to do such, uh, there have been numerous attempts through the years to identify what is the best optical strategy here, ranging from manipulation of accommodative lag to reducing peripheral retinal hyperopia defocus to sustaining myopic defocus. And our own Dr. Goon Young Yoon uh, is in this last article here by you and coworkers published last year, largely credited with helping us better understand that there's probably some elixir of higher order aberration induction in these lenses that regulate or slow uh, axial length growth and uh, myopic progression. What we do know is that simply fitting rigid gas permeable contact lenses doesn't seem to have a benefit uh, in slowing the progression of myopia, um, but there are plenty of studies that again have shown that orthokeratology can play a significant role. Um, and as it relates to whether or not kids are on board with orthokeratology, um, you know, Bob Ryan and I have been doing this for 20 years now, and Santo Domingo's study pretty much echoes the sentiments of what we've seen, and that is that uh, children embrace it, and more importantly, their parents embrace it, and that's an important consideration, uh, particularly as you get uh, families to try to comply with what might be a rigorous schedule for orthokeratology. Just how does it work? Um, this is a perfect example of a youngster who was referred to me in 2018 with progressive myopia over a course of a year of simply uh, watching them, watchful waiting. Uh, they had increased by a diopter and a quarter. We had fit them in orthokeratology. And I think you can see in the topography slide down here in the corner, they have the central flattening with the mid peripheral steepening that seems to be consistent with a good outcome. Does uh, orthokeratology and low-dose atropine work in an additive fashion? And uh, these two studies seem to point out that, in fact, it does. Uh, why the additive effect? Is it separate mechanisms, or is it just that even low-dose ortho or low-dose atropine will dilate pupils? Uh, in the increased pupil size, allow for more of that optical effect. We don't know the answer, but clearly uh, there's a consensus that you can partner pharmacologic agent, namely atropine with contact lenses, namely uh, orthokeratology for an additive effect. One of the big concerns of orthokeratology, of course, is that these are youngsters wearing contact lenses overnight. And is there an increased risk uh, for infectious keratitis? Uh, and there have been studies both globally and domestically that have shown cases of microbial keratitis associated with overnight wear 
or orthokeratology lenses, but the increased risk seemed to be uh, as related more to mishandling of the lenses, improper care, improper storage than the actual overnight wearing of lenses. So do the benefits of orthokeratology outweigh the risks? Well, you know, certainly Chalmer and coworkers studies have shown that kids are, can wear contact lenses pretty safely. Uh, Mark Bullimore has shown that the relative risk of microbial keratitis in orthokeratology is about 14 per 10,000 patient wearing years. And if you look long-term uh, at what significant myopia can do uh, as it relates to myopic macular degeneration, glaucoma, and overall uh, lifelong visual impairment, one could argue that the risk is rather modest. As it relates to soft contact lenses, again, same strategy, provide a central clear optic window through which the youngster can see and create some sort of chaos in the, in the peripheral part of the lens uh, to discourage axial edge length growth. Uh, two lenses that are commercially available here in the United States, the MySight by Cooper Vision, that's the only FDA approved lens, the Natural View Multifocal by Visioneering Technology, um, their research or their uh, publication data is not as robust as what we see with the MySight clinical trial, and it will probably take some time for them to get a sanctioning or full label approval from the FDA. If I can spend just a minute or two closing talking about uh, behavioral and lifestyle considerations, does outdoor time uh, play a role in mitigating myopia production or, or myopia progression? And the answer seems to be that it does indeed. And uh, you know, if you look at a uh, meta-analysis of all the research in this area, the optimal amount of time seems about 11 hours per week outdoors to help mitigate myopia production. And as it relates to near point activity, uh, near point activities with accommodative, high accommodative demands, kids who read at a shorter reading distance and kids who use cell phones tend to be at much greater risk of having uh, myopia prog progression, uh, the age old screen time versus green time debate. Does light play a role? Well, there's a sort of burgeoning body of evidence that suggests that violet light may in some way, shapes or forms inhibit axial length growth. Certainly there've been studies that have looked at violet light blocking spectacles and contact lenses compared to lenses without violet light blocking and even using FACO IOLs in those particular respects. Um, and they've demonstrated that, again, violet light uh, tends to inhibit axial length growth. And this brings up a bigger question, and as is, should we be recommending blue blocking computer glasses to adolescents? Uh, many practitioners do that because they're hoping to uh, better modulate melatonin production and, and regulate sleep patterns. But I think you need to take a clear look at where the blue blocking uh, cuts off. If it's encroaching upon the violet light part of the spectrum, you may ultimately be doing the youngster a disservice in terms of myopia progression. How do we follow these kids over time? Generally with refraction, either wet or damp, you pick your choice. I think consistency is important. Corneal topography, the, the premise here being is if they're refractively stable and topographically stable, they're probably in all likelihood axial length stable. Uh, axial length is rapidly becoming the gold standard for myopia management. And fortunately, we're starting to see the uh, commercialization of biometry units, Myo Myopia Master by Oculus, Lenstar by uh, Hogstrite is two examples that have um, incorporated within their devices um, population-based percentile curves so that you can just not look just at how a youngster is progressing from a pure axial length standpoint, but how they compare with uh, age-related norms. So if I gave you the final 1,000 foot view, um, I was gonna say 30,000 foot view, but we don't have 30,000 foot views here in Western New York. We do have a 1,000 foot view here from the top of Fox Run at Hun Hala, looking down over the Honeyoy Valley, north and east up towards the city. Um, I think it's safe to say that the prime years for progression for most kids are from eight to 16 years of age with a rate of uh, 0.75 diopters per year or greater being of concern. And if you prioritize uh, lifestyle behavioral considerations, spectacle considerations, contact lens considerations and pharmacologic agents, 
you can have a pretty good control uh, over the future of these kids' myopia. So final slide, what do we tell parents? Well, we tell parents that myopia prevalence is increasing worldwide and there does seem to be more than genetics involved. It's an area of significant interest and the good news is there's a lot of evidence-based recommendations coming out of the eye care community. Time outdoors, optimizing near point activities, proper lighting are important considerations and that we have pharmacologic and optical strategies to slow but not to stop the progression of myopia. And in the final analysis, do I think it's a worthy pursuit? Not for every myope, but certainly for those youngsters who are showing a predisposition towards high myopia, because for them, life is a mild to moderate myope will be much easier than is a high myope. Ken, thank you. Very nice job, Mike. All right. Go back to my screen. And our next speaker is going to be Dr. Rajiv Ramchandran, who is an associate professor of ophthalmology at Flama Institute, where he's part of the Vitreo Retinal Service. He is also director of FEI's Population Vision Health Initiative. Much of his work in population health specifically focuses on diagnosing and treating um, diabetic eye disease using photographic screening and uh, telemedicine. These efforts um, have been grant funded at this point in time in the regional level and by the NIH. He also has a keen interest um, in this field at the international, international level and has been working closely with the LV Prasad Eye Institute in India. And through his collaborations, he has been extensively involved in using machine learning to better recognize and treat disease and developing an understanding of how diet and lifestyle affect population susceptibility to eye disease. Rajiv studied medicine at the University of Rochester, then completed his ophthalmology residency at Duke University, and then he returned back to Rochester to do a vitreo retinal fellowship at the Eye Institute here, and subsequently joined the fellowship, joined our joined our faculty. And as a member of the Eye Institute, he went on to complete his MBA at the Simon School, and he is also a member of. Uh, uh, the AAO, ARVO, the American Society of Retinal Specialists, and the American Telemedicine Association. So today, Dr. Rajiv Ramchandran is going to give us a update on health disparities and accessing eye care among patients with diabetes. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Ken, for that excellent uh, uh, and very humbling um, account of my accomplishments. So I, I need to get that in writing and, and use that in my bio somewhere. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I hope everyone is doing well. And uh, it's really interesting to uh, see everybody virtually and to uh, talk to everybody virtually about this very pressing uh, matter in our healthcare system, especially as we focus on disparities and uh, the need for equitable care in our communities. Uh, I uh, have a telemedicine program, as Ken mentioned, um, and also do consult for other telemedicine programs, including IPACs. Uh, thanks to our tele-eye care team, which is our local telemedicine program uh, for di uh, detecting diabetic retinopathy and vision issues um, in the community. Uh, thanks to our students who've helped, the stats teams, and also the clinics that we're working in, funded by local insurers and also the university, as well as the Great Rochester Health Foundation to make this happen. Before I start, um, you know, we are usually all together and all looking at each other and, and, and uh, getting together during lunch and uh, break times, but unfortunately we can't be there. And this time um, I really miss um, Dr. Mina Chung and I uh, really always remember her sitting in the front of the auditorium uh, where we have our lectures and, and talks and always um, you know, giving an encouraging uh, smile when we begin our uh, talks, especially for those of us who've been fellows and, and medical students under her guys. I was a medical student when I first met her and she was always one to uh, promote uh, those uh, coming on board. And she's whatever she said has always come true in my life. So uh, I really uh, do miss all the great acknowledgements that she's given. And I thank everybody who's been uh, supporting her memory by giving to the uh, Chung and Dowd professorship here. 
So eye health is an important public health uh, screening uh, endeavor. Unfortunately, uh, the community doesn't recognize that. They don't really include um, eye screening, at least in the United States, as part of a lot of public health endeavors. Uh, unlike the international setting, especially in the developing world, my work uh, in partnership with a lot of the folks in India, especially Lavi Prasad, has shown that you know vision screening is a part, part and parcel of public health screening. The WHO also recognizes vision screening and eye health screening as important uh, because it addresses an important problem in the United States. 40 million people um, have vision threatening eye problems in the United States, uh, 4 million are with poor vision, and this costs over $130 billion annually. There's a prolonged latent stage and you can detect and treat early when you do uh, find a disease uh, in screenings. And this is across the lifespan. So starting from retinopathy to maturity with screenings in the NICU, all the way to our school screenings with refractive error, uh, to the working age population where uh, folks with diabetes are especially at risk. And then our older adults where glaucoma, cataract and macular degeneration all come into play. So the idea is that the screening must be cost effective and reach target populations with minimum inconvenience and that WHO criteria is definitely carried out um, in a lot of our screenings that we do in the community. Um, and, and it still needs to be done even in our local community, even though we are in a developed nation, we have a lot of health inequity and that's what I'm gonna focus my talk on today and special look at a local situation. So in 2016, the National Academy of Science and Engineering Medicine made a population health report, which is supported by Prevent Blindness America, the Academies of Ophthalmology and Optometry, the NIH and the CDC. And this really looked at six various uh, uh, mechanisms to increase population eye health. The first is the call to action, and 2020 was supposed to be the year for that call for action until COVID hit. We actually had a lot of events planned in our own eye center to commemorate the year, but unfortunately plans had to change due to a public health crisis. The CDC also is in, in, encouraged to develop a coordinated surveillance system, and they're trying to do this with uh, EMR data and various public health sets uh, of data that are there uh, regarding vision, but these are still limited. And the CDC only has a few people devoted to eye health. In fact, the eye health folks are all uh, under the diabetes uh, group and the diabetes group actually has um, uh, uh, more uh, relevance in that regard. And so this is where diabetes uh, becomes a big uh, factor in dealing with eye health because the CDC themselves see that eye health in terms of a public health issue is really couched in the, in the setting of diabetes. Common sets of standards. So, you know, uh, we all practice a bit differently. You know, the Academy of Ophthalmology has standards. The uh, uh, Academy of Optometry and the American Optometric Association has their standards. And the states often have their own standards for school screenings, especially, or don't have standards in some cases. So it's really important to get together with uh, the stakeholders and come together with common guidelines. We all can approach this together, whether you're an OD, an MD, or you're an administrator in the state health system, we all need to work together to make this happen. What I'm going to focus on today is increasing access to eye care, and this is something that providers can really focus on. Uh, Steve Feldman coined this of uh, population health being uh, a way to get to people or reach people before they become patients, and that's really a game changer and a disruptive innovator that we really need to push if you want to promote wellness and health in the community. Unfortunately, our system is a pathology or pathogenesis-based system where we're looking at sickness and disease and attracting that into our clinics. We are not there to promote wellness uh, uh, in, in our training or in the way the system is set up. And the cell to genetic um, uh, care, the cell to genesis that we need to develop uh, to develop health is really, really important. Community and state and national needs need to be assessed in terms of vision. So this is not uh, alone, but it's in the keeping with cardiac disease and cancer and, and other uh, factors that affect the human being, including mental health. You know, when humans uh, come into our clinics and we treat them as, as, as our patients, they are human beings. They have uh, a whole set of issues that are more than just their eye issue that they're presenting with. And we have to realize that and see how our care fits in that setting. Also developing community networks is not just the providers, it's not just the uh, healthcare team that's gonna make a difference, but it's really the community. In fact, being in schools and being in social organizations such as Lions Club, we know that it's really important to get the community involved in this type of setting. 
the, the ultimate goal, uh, issue with all of this is we're uh, siloed. We're very siloed in our uh, healthcare system and, and our public health system. Excuse me. <clears throat> we need to overcome that uh, silo and we need to uh, work together in an organized fashion so that we can go out in the community, triage folks who need care, identify those at risk, and then bring them to uh, further care as needed. And we all work together in doing this to help our health system in general. So here's a Western New York population. There are locations where our I Institute is currently right now developing a surveillance and risk stratification model to identify uh, populations at risk uh, across the lifespan. So figure out who and where these folks are and then implement the prevention strategies to prevent uh, uh, vision loss preserve site uh, and even improve site in many cases as many of the lectures today have shown. Eventually wanna lower cost and maximize efficiency to care, which is very important and include all care providers in this process. So diabetes, again, why do we focus on that? Well, that's the only thing that's tracked uh, nationally. The CDC uh, has these numbers for many years now, and it showed uh, the, the blossoming of diabetes uh, across the country over the last few decades, especially. And you can see the Southeast being particularly hit, especially at the Appalachian area as well. And, and these are areas where um, there's often uh, inadequacy of eye care providers to help this population. It's also that diabetes is incentivized to, to, for eye exams because the HEDIS metric uh, is something that primary care physicians, not ophthalmologists or optometrists, but primary care physicians are graded on uh, to, in order to make sure their patients have a eye exam, something that they can't provide necessarily, but it's something that they are graded on as far as a quality metric to making sure that their patients are getting this exam. So about 12% of adults uh, with diabetes have reported vision loss in the BRFSS uh, national survey in 2018. And diabetic retinopathy is still a leading cause of vision loss in the working age population. If you look at New York State, though, and especially our region, we do pretty well with screening for diabetic uh, eye disease and getting uh, folks with diabetes into getting eye exams. We are national average for the Medicaid population is about sixty-three percent. Or sorry, the New York State average is sixty-three percent, and the national average is about fifty-four uh, percent. This is a few years old data. Um, but we still need to do more in terms of uh, diabetic retinopathy surveillance and screening in the community. So here's a population density map 2015 up there on your left-hand side. And this is a distribution of ophthalmologists and optometrists from a, a recent paper around that time as well. And you can show that the Southeast still lacks a lot of um, uh, optometrists and ophthalmologists to serve the burgeoning population in that region. Now, diabetes is also more in that region too. So this sets up a, uh, a problematic situation where you have uh, more people who need uh, such exams and less uh, folks who are getting it. In, uh, in, in the URMC, uh, we have about 5,000 uh, folks who need uh, eye exams still that have diabetes. It's about 31% of the population. So we do pretty well. We're you know, almost 69, 70% of the population getting uh, their annual eye exams or according to the HEDIS metric at least. And uh, though the issue is, is that those needing eye exams are concentrated in the inner city area and also rural areas that are poor. If you can see that this inner city of Rochester, which is in there in Monroe County, if those of you are familiar with, with New York State, um, are areas where the highest concentration of folks who need eye exams. Of course, there's a large population, so there's also folks who have diabetes as well. But if you look at the eastern suburbs of Rochester, um, those areas with, with uh, higher socioeconomic status, which are the lighter colors here, those areas tend to do a little bit better in terms of having their needs met with eye exams than the city of Rochester or some of the rural areas um, where there, there are brighter colors here in this heat map. So of the 15,000 folks with diabetes in your MC system, about, still about a third um, need um, eye exams. And those getting eye exams uh, tend to be older, and this might have to do with insurance. Um, you know, Medicare population tends to get uh, eye exams more, maybe this because they have cataracts, maybe they have vision issues, so they're actually coming in to getting eye care um, more readily. So, you know, after uh, 4450, you know, start reading, reading glasses, um, you know, start taking, taking more interest in your vision, maybe that's the reason why these people come in and get care. There was no uh, gender difference when looking at this population in terms of those who have had and had not gotten eye exams. 
but there was a race difference. Those of the white race who identify themselves as being of the white race had um, a much greater chance of having uh, completed an eye exam than those of, who identify themselves as being of the black or African-American race. Uh, you know, 75 almost a percentage to 60%. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, three fourths to two thirds right there uh, of folks. So there is a definitely a racial uh, disparity and that has to do with a socioeconomic disparity, which we'll talk about in a bit. Those who are of non-Hispanic ethnicity also had a higher rate of completing eye exams than those of being Hispanic ethnicity, similar to those being African-American. So here is insurance. So those who have Medicare or commercial insurance had a very good rate of, of completing their eye, eye exams, but those of the Medicaid population and, and, and then uninsured, which are not listed here, had a low, much lower rate. And so this is definitely a concern. And this is the health disparities that you know we all as providers in the community are trying to address, whether it be uh, through working with our residents, whether it be doing community screenings uh, or seeing them in our own offices. So the, the uh, socioeconomic status group, and we'll go over a little bit how this was determined by Common Ground Health, which is a local uh, uh, group, uh, community group uh, promoting um, health and, and wellness in our community, um, showed that those of the highest SES status had a, over 75% uh, rate of completing their eye exams. And again, this we have a very great medical care system in, in our region. Um, we have very healthy people overall. Um, so we're, we're doing very well overall. But again, there's a disparity because the lowest SES group had less than two thirds of that population getting their eye exams, better than other areas where the, the rate may be less than 50%, but still we can improve and we can do better. And again, the darker areas in this map here show those low socioeconomic areas where this issue is, is a greater factor and the most populated areas, which include the city of Rochester, are the ones that um, really need a focus and emphasis. So here is a race distribution by SES category. And here again, you can see the African-Americans make up a, a, a great percentage of that uh, population, the lowest SES category. Latinos are next. And, and again, that's also showed in those who are not getting their exams completed. So SES status has by far probably the most influence is why people aren't getting care. It may have to do with some insurance status, but it has to do other factors such as travel costs, time off from work, um, maybe um, health awareness or, or health literacy. Those type of things may also be an issue in this population. So we created the tele eye care uh, program for diabetic eye disease uh, a few years back, and we've been implementing slowly throughout our uh, URMC clinics. Their idea is to triage folks in their primary care setting to get further eye care, and hopefully to uh, include uh, technologies as we heard today of AI and, and other things to get folks into eye care in a more uh, proactive way. We're at seven clinics right now. We've identified over a thousand uh, patients and assessed them and actually had uh, a, a good show rate to ophthalmology, at least a good um, scheduling of exam rate to ophthalmology for those people needing such care. So we cover those areas where there's greatest need. So we're in the city of Rochester, as you can see on the right-hand graph there, uh, right-hand uh, figure there. And we're also in rural areas, such as Hornell and Williamson um, and uh, Steuben and Wayne County, respectively, where there is greater need for uh, eye care in those regions. Um, so this is the SES index methodology. Basically, they took various factors in the American Community Survey that had to do with um, overall uh, social determinants of health and then ranked uh, folks based upon uh, their, their scores for those various categories from one through five. Um, so those that lower SES categories had lower average income, higher poverty rates, and lower prevalence of college degrees and health literacy. They're, City of Rochester, unfortunately, is the third poorest uh, inner city region in the country, and it has one of the highest child poverty rates, so nearly 50%. So although we have uh, wonderful um, affluent suburbs with great schools, so Pittsburgh, Brighton, Fairport, and uh, Penfield, right, Webster, you know, right nearby, but um, the city of Rochester, which is a few miles away, suffers from a very lack of um, care and, and very inequitable situation. So in our program, we identified almost 30% uh, percent of our population that needed some uh, further care, whether they had retinopathy, whether the images couldn't be uh, graded because of cataract or small pupils, um, or if they had uh, poor vision. So we did check vision in these eyes and about 8% of the population had no retinopathy, but did have poor vision, at least in one eye, which is less than 2040. 
And we found that the staff uh, and patients thought this program was very helpful. They thought the program was very quick and convenient. It was something value added for patients to come into their clinic. And patients thought it was very helpful. And, and they were very pleased to have such a service uh, performed. And integrating this into the workflow of the clinics have really made this helpful to triage patients and get them to care um, in a timely fashion. And not only care with FLOM, of course, uh, care with the community as well, because many of these patients are seen by many of you all in the community as, as well who are not FLOM providers. So looking at our follow-up rate, we just looked at it briefly in the pre-COVID and COVID levels of care uh, time periods. And so pre-COVID, about 46% of patients requiring follow-up in the three-month period did follow up uh, to eye care at FMOM, with another 10%, about 30 patients followed up to a non-FBI provider. So this is very, very encouraging overall. So about 46% follow-up. And about 68% of folks who need an appointment actually make an appointment, which is wonderful. And uh, about a similar percentage who needed an appointment actually uh, keeping an appointment. So getting that appointment is very, very key. Once you get the appointment, you have a good chance of, of, of keeping that appointment. So that's something that we learned in this process. However, after COVID uh, hit and during the pandemic, it's been tough, you know, not only that we were closed for a little bit, FLOM and a lot of our, you know, uh, fellow uh, folks here on this meeting were also facing uh, closures, um, but uh, patients had a harder time getting into care because they didn't go see their primary care provider uh, physically, they saw them virtually. So telemedicine really picked up for our, vert for our primary care folks. And about 70% of care was being delivered through uh, telemedicine. You can't, can't do screening uh, with a camera when they can't access the camera. And the camera happened to be in primary care group. So uh, we couldn't go out to patients during this time to do any screenings. So um, they, they were relying on them to come into primary care. And without them coming in, these rates of, of follow-up really did drop um, over time um, to try to get them to care. But they're still seeing um, you know, the community uh, providers, you know, those who needed to care to a similar level. 57% um, of, of patients made uh, the appointment um, that they were asked to do, and about 48 of those patients kept the appointment. So slightly less percentage here of folks making and keeping appointments that was significant over time. So COVID, uh, you know, or whatever time period was, um, we think it was the uh, issues dealing with COVID has had an impact in, in our program as well. So we tried to look back and see how we more proactive. And so we took the last uh, three months basically to see how could we up the numbers. And we started uh, calling each uh, patient for the week and just to, to get on the radar screen and say, hey, you know, please come early, half an hour early to get a camera exam in your uh, primary care office. Um, and we found a lot of people couldn't be contacted. So, you know, we captured about 29% of the population coming in the last three months, but almost 40% were unreachable by phone. So contacting these patients, finding uh, out how to get a hold of them and to um, tell them their need of care was very, very challenging. Another thing uh, we found in clinics was that, you know, patients weren't showing up to their primary care clinic. And even if they showed up, we only got a half uh, of that population, and that was due to some workflow issues. Uh, the patients would come late to their appointments, transportation was always an issue, and then they didn't have time to stay for their exam. We wanted them to come a half an hour early to get their exam done so they would know they would be uh, ready for their provider, because you don't, one thing we know as providers, we don't want to upset the provider's timeline or provider schedule in doing our, our care. Uh, we we're only providing eye exams on certain days because the trained staff were only there for certain days, and so we couldn't do it every day, but this is changing. More trained staff are there, and hopefully they'll um, use the camera more. And a lot of these primary care clinics will open later. Uh, in addition to doing uh, video visits, uh, which you know preempted us from um, doing uh, the, the, the camera exams, um, the, the clinics were only uh, would stay up till nine, but the person taking the photo will only be there till 4.30 or so. So we were losing out on that population. So reaching people uh, before they become patients is the key thing. Um, thanks to Dr. DiLoretto's vision and C uh, Dr. Felden's vision, we are um, having a vision ban now, and this is uh, great funding that Megan King has uh, obtained uh, working with Dr. Felden. And uh, we have this vision ban to uh, gonna work with Lifespan Health and hopefully to deliver care at residences um, and senior living communities. We welcome the community to participate in our efforts to address our own health inequities and to really 
improve health overall. And please uh, visit our website here on population health. Um, Anthony Delano, Dr. Delano is doing great work um, in his uh, iECHO program to deliver education, especially the optometric community in New York and beyond. And we welcome all of you um, who would like CME credits uh, or uh, to uh, join uh, the ECHO uh, programs are happening about every other month or so. So please contact Dr. Delano on that. And please do visit our site to learn more on our population health mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv. Nice job. And I have that introduction in writing if you want it, so. All right. So up next, we're gonna have Dr. Bob Ryan, who is also uh, an associate clinical professor of ophthalmology at the Fly Eye Institute and was also at one point in time, uh, five years ago, part of that uh, team of uh, DePaulis and Ryan at Visionary Eye Associates, um, former director of uh, optometry at the, uh, at the Eye Institute. And his clinical interests generally include optometry, where he specializes in contact lenses and co-management of patients with retinal disease. Uh, Dr. Ryan received his doctorate of optometry from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, Salus University in 1989, and he's lectured and published extensively in issues pertaining to anterior segment topics, including contact lenses. He's also participated in FDA clinical investigator and in many contact lens uh, manufacturers, in addition to providing um, consultative services. Before we're coming to the uh, Eye Institute, um, in 2016, as I said, he was part of the Visionary Eye Associates, and where he successfully grew that practice into a multi-location practice that uh, uh, merged with us and was also a voluntary um, faculty member at the University of Rochester, working with our residents for many years in teaching them um, about contact lenses. In addition to his extensive experience with contact lenses and clinical trials, he has recently been involved in clinical research using handheld aperometry to measure refractive error, sits on a num numerous editorial boards and committees, and has served um, as a president of the Rochester Optometric Society. So today, Dr. Ryan will present with us. I hope I'm up to date on this, but... Um, Wavefront analysis for clinical applications. Is that right, Bob? That's close enough, sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I will let you take it away. So okay. the um, how important are lower order aberrations? We know that they predominate the work that we do each and every day. And um, we know that they account for the uh, majority of the people that we, we serve. In a normal eye, lower order aberrations will account for 80 to 90 percent of all refractive status that we see, and in some cases, you know, beyond that. Uh, and we know that there's also a very important, um, they play an important role in high contrast acuity as well. These are most critical when the pupil diameter is uh, small. If we look at some uh, work that was done by Brian Holden many years ago, looking at the level of astigmatism that we see in the population, we know that the majority of the population has some degree of astigmatism. And fortunately, most of that is, is very mild or modest, uh, more than 50%. But we know that traditionally, this has also been undercorrected or underserved when we look at the uh, contact lens industry as a whole. If we look at the metrics that are generated from, from studies there and from surveys, we, we recognize that those two don't correlate very well. That in fact, um, the um, predominating trend is to you know, go for spherical, spherical contact lenses rather than toric lenses. And we know the effect that that can have on our patients as well. You know, we, we look at obviously measuring high contrast Snell and acuity in our offices. And we know if we, if we do that with a spherical equivalent, as you see in the uh, upper left-hand side of the screen there, while patients may be able to subtend a uh, resolution of the, of the 2020 line, it certainly is not as clear and sharp and concise as you might see when you put patients into toric lenses. Um, so correcting lower order aberrations obviously is very, very important. When we then tend to look at what sort of higher aberrations contribute, you know, these are the people that, as I alluded to earlier uh, in my introduction, these are the people that vexed and perplexed us, you know, early on in my career. 
and these are the people that we thought were, uh, you know, we labeled them as, you know, pe people that may be, you know, crazy. They were reading 2020, and yet we didn't understand what we didn't understand. And that is that many of these people were trying to articulate to us that they had other limitations that we just couldn't measure, couldn't identify, and therefore we thought didn't exist. But we've come to learn now that, that the, all these uh, aberrations do exist and they can create significant limitations for our patients. We also can see on the point spread function that what sort of things you know, people may experience. And, and you know, we've had a chart on our practice wall, Michael DePaulis and I you know, had this um, po posted on our, on our exam room uh, walls and patients could look and point and identify and say, hey, I think I have vertical coma because when I look at a point source of light after dark, this is what I see. So it, it kind of elevated our understanding of what was going on with patients even before we had the opportunity to physically measure these things and identify them and quantify them. Even so, we had no opportunity to fix them at that point in time. And traditional teaching told us that, well, if you put a rigid contact lens on somebody, you're going to have a tendency to mask these aberrations, which is true if they happen to reside on the anterior coronal surface. But we know uh, from our earlier lectures today, we heard quite exquisitely that there are plenty of other sources for these uh, aberrations that can confound patients' visual acuity. So what sorts of things are out there? Uh, the number of, um, um, the, the number of instruments that are out there that can measure these are numerous and, um, and becoming more and more widely available in, with, in practice in general. Um, the opportunity that I've had to work with this, this group out of the university um, is listed at the bottom as the X-Wave by Ovitz. And I'm going to share with you um, in a few slides some case studies that will be uh, the result of the, some of the early work that we did with that. I think this unit has some advantages over some of its competitors in that you can see it's a fairly small footprint, very lightweight, and uh, easily um, shifted around the office if you have a um, diagnostic testing room that resembles ours where there's uh, equipment stacked on top of each other uh, nearly you can you can this is very portable can be slid away in fact we can even detach this the head that you see here we can actually detach and uh, it becomes handheld and portable which can be very useful for um, some of the screenings that Dr. Ramchandran has put together for us this works well in the community um, and very lightweight and very easy to capture. Um, offers a complete ocular HOA profile um, and, and links with a proprietary HOA correcting contact lens design. Uh, you'll see the software that's demonstrated in the following slides shows that it's quite simple to uh, submit to the laboratory for uh, ordering lens as well. And the hardware is um, available by a subscription model. So there's not a large outlay of, of um, revenue to, uh, to acquire this. Um, it's regularly updated, both the software and the hardware is, is regularly updated um, as they continue throughout their development. If we look at which HOAs are important, um, we know that to some extent, all of them are, and, and it's certainly a degree of magnitude as well. But uh, we can look at some of the early work that was done coming up on 20 years ago now, just a study that looked at 40 eyes, 20 of which were healthy eyes without any media opacity, 10 of which demonstrated nuclear sclerosis, 10 of which demonstrated cortical sclerosis. The mean uh, best visual acuity in the cortical sclerotic group was uh, six over nine with the mean VA in the nuclear group being six over 15. These eyes were subjected to wavefront sensing with the BNL's eye wave. And we noted from that study that um, cortical cataracts tend to have a increase in coma and tetrafoil, while nuclear, nuclear sclerosis has a tendency to increase spherical aberrations in tetrafoil. So this may, um, explain to us why 
we see folks with nuclear sclerotic changes oftentimes demonstrating a myopic shift later on in the disease process. If we then look at what implications this has for our soft contact lens industry, Kohlbaum out of Indiana uh, demonstrated that although um, you can take a contact lens in air and measure it, or more appropriately in a wet cell and measure it, on eye contact lens deformation does occur, obviously with draping these lenses over a variety of topographies and precorneal tear lens combining those two can actually alter spherical aberration. Um, this goes to explain uh, some of the work that was done by Hammer and how this ultimately influenced uh, mo much of our contact lens industry, excuse me, much of our contact lens industry that we witness today that we have available to us. But early on with Bausch and Lam and their Pure Vision 2 design, taking advantage of this to say, we know that the majority of the population has uh, an average amount of spherical aberration of, of 0.15, but we also know that the contact lens itself, depending on its Rx, will induce some degree of spherical aberration. And so they incorporated into that design the ability to try and mask, they, they correct the induced spherical aberrations from the, uh, from the Rx, but then also add in this population average of 0.15 mean uh, root mean square of spherical aberration. And so that <clears throat> lended their, their labeling to read this high definition or HD Pure Vision 2 design, which I think works quite nicely in that average population, which does mirror that degree of spherical aberration, but also goes to explain why we put this on some eyes and patients feel like they see less well than they do with other designs. We know also that numerous studies have, have basically um, stated the importance of contact lens hydration upon parameter stability and therefore optical performance. Said differently, we know if lenses tend to age or soil that they perform less well and less reliably on the, on the ocular surface. We then look at the importance of pupil size on these wave fronts as well. And we can see clearly that the same wave front demonstrated over a wide range of pupil sizes can elicit um, significant visual distraction all the way down to a very small pupil of one millimeter, a pinpoint pupil basically showing you a very clear and pristine, basically airy disc uh, picture that, that's noted there. And we'll see this reflected throughout some of the um, case studies that I have to show you coming up now. So if I can just share with you over the little, limited time that we have left a few case studies and demonstrate the uh, benefit of this technology, both in diagnostic by both in diagnosis, as well as in treatment and management of these folks that otherwise would have to uh, live on with, with limited, uh, limited vision and, and visual compromise. This is a young, uh, young gentleman who I actually met probably when he was 16 or 17 years old, a young Asian male who uh, has a history of keratoconus, uh, anxiety, depression, how much of that is, is spurred on by his visual compromise is, is unknown to me, but certainly a point of interest, uh, suffers from OCA, excuse me, obstructive sleep apnea and also seizures. He had a history of, uh, in April of 2017, uh, undergoing an epithelial on corneal cross-linking procedure for his keratoconus in an effort to arrest progression and uh, just a few months later presented to uh, my service for a second opinion while uh, currently under the process of a scleral uh, rigid gas permeable contact lens fitting uh, elsewhere in the community. Things looked very reasonable to me uh, at that point and I recommended that he uh, continue the process with his current provider uh, and thought he would, he would come out just fine through that, through that process. Unfortunately, he resurfaced uh, in early 18, um, suggesting that he's, he's not able to tolerate the gas permeable contact lenses. Uh, these ophthalmic challenges had resulted in difficulties in school. He was un unable to attend uh, high school on a full-time basis. He had to have an IEP plan in place, um, and it had significant impact on his life. 
<clears throat> at the time, based on his limited tolerance, I attempted a Kerasoft uh, custom torx soft contact lens fitting. Uh, he was dry at ocular surface uh, issues, so I did include his puncta as well, but we reached a limit of about 2040 acuity binocularly. You can see from his refractive analysis, it, certainly spectacles were not an option for him and he had already been cross-linked at this point in time. So we decided to undertake the um, task of fitting him in a, um, a different type of uh, uh, scleral gas permeable design where we could add some of these special optics to the surface in an effort to get his acuity to a level where he uh, felt more functional. <clears throat> this will show you a representation of the screen with the X-Wave uh, system and you might appreciate uh, with the on-eye image that the contact lens is in place and you might be able to look carefully and pick up on some of the little uh, markings that you might see overlying the pupil. The lens that's provided by this vendor actually has base markings that will help us determine orientation but also help the laboratory determine precise orientation of this lens and stability of this lens to the extent that they can ultimately uh, add a wavefront profile to this in an effort to serve him. If you look at the um, area down below the, um, the, the right eye indication there, you can see there's a list of um, topics that you can, you can drill down and look at wavefront maps. Uh, you can see the table of all the Zernike values, the Zernike plot, which we'll see in the next slide, a visual, a visual simul simulation as well but I wanted to demonstrate this on-eye lens with the um, note that the pupil size is quite large here, uh, owing to part of his, uh, his symptoms and his complaints. You'll see over on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see a uh, spherical ovary, or excuse me, a sphere cylindrical ovary fraction, as well as the HOA root mean square total um, and the pupil diameter down below. <clears throat> you might take note of the, uh, button in the lower right hand corner that is the uh, submit lens order function which makes ordering these products um, very simple with a click of a button. So this is a Zernike plot that I promised you earlier and you can see that this individual despite having the lens on the eye and these aberrations being taken through the lens you can clearly see that it is not um, managing all of his issues. Um, so we find that in this situation he still suffers from a fair bit of coma and um, you can now understand why he had persistent complaints moving forward. You see from this slide that there is a simulated visual acuity, which you might not expect with that uh, wavefront profile that you saw before, but take note that this simulated visual acuity is simply based on the optical findings and has no um, no effect from what the human eye would, would benefit from, and that is the neural processing of some of these blurred images and controlling, um, controlling the, uh, the limitations. The point spread function compares very favorably to the visual simulation that you saw earlier, and might note that that would still be quite debilitating to somebody uh, throughout the course of their day, and particularly at night. All of this still uh, through that seven millimeter pupil. If we then uh, allow the unit to shrink down for us to a three millimeter, three millimeter pupil diameter, we can see that those aberrations are substantially reduced through no optical benefit other than, uh, other than uh, making the aperture a smaller size, which we know is important in our optical backgrounds. We then look at the point spread function as a function of that and see that now he, the visual quality that you might expect through this would be substantially improved providing we can maintain that small aperture, which is not always the case. If we look at case two now, a case of keratoactasia, this is a 62 year old uh, Caucasian female with a history of LASIK in 2001, north of the border in Niagara Falls, um, who ultimately was diagnosed some five years later with keratoactasia managed at that point by um, spectacle correction. In 2014, her packs, you can see were on the thin side. Uh, her manifest refraction shows a, a, refra a refraction 
is not going to be too exciting to any of us, particularly somebody that went through uh, keratorefractive refractive procedure. And you can see that while her right eye may have reasonably good corrected acuity, uh, her left eye is, is less than desired. She did ultimately undergo cross-linking, uh, again, north of the border in 2015, was fit with a Kerasoft lens, provided 2040 acuity in that left eye, um, ultimately due to tolerance was and cost, was refit into a biofinity toric, uh, still providing only about 2040 acuity. So she presented uh, to my service in November of 2020, was the first I met, a, met her uh, for her annual exam. And she had some early NS and again, the refractive error, not much different, but certainly not uh, acceptable for her. So we uh, allowed her access to this um, technology and showed her um, what, what we could do with this technology. And, and she was quite interested and quite excited um, she works as, in the healthcare industry as a, as a nurse and was struggling with things like night driving and, and acuity in general. So you can see here her wavefront profile certainly shows some significant aberrations consistent with her re, uh, limited acuity and her pupil size at uh, 5.9 is modest, um, perhaps a little on the large side for someone of her, of her age. Point spread function does show that she's got some uh, scatter significant and, and certainly debilitating. And so if we <clears throat> then shrink that pupil down to three millimeters, you can see again that uh, her aberrations reduce commensurate with that quite significantly. But these recall, these are all naked eye images now that we've looked at for her. And so you can see that the refractive error on the left-hand side of the screen there is still pretty substantial and would have to be contended with. Her left eye tells a similar, although worse uh, story. And um, so we went through the process here as well and reducing that pupil while it reduces the overall HOA root mean square, still leaves behind some significant um, aberrations that, that she would otherwise struggle with. So <clears throat> as you might imagine, we refit her into a scleral rigid uh, gas permeable lens as well. And um, the following slides are now with the lens on eye. And so while her refractive error certainly has been reduced significantly through the lens, you can see um, from the um, wavefront that she still has significant vertical coma that's, that's limiting her outcome here um, and, and certainly needs to be addressed. Similarly, visual acuity shows quite a scatter and, um, and, and supports the visual uh, limitations that she has. And uh, if we now incorporate her simulated spherocylindrical correction into this, which with a click of the uh, lower right hand, excuse me, the lower left hand box, um, the system will then filter out what the lower order aberrations contribute to her profile. And you can see it has very little bearing on the um, overall uh, vertical coma that she was struggling with. We then shrink that pupil down and see that there's a significant reduction in her aberrations in that regard that you might expect. And indeed, the simulated visual acuity is improved as well. <clears throat> we, from this slide, we can see a comparison of her, um, of her eye with a pupil size remain fixed at 5.3 millimeter on the left-hand side without the simulated RX, on the right-hand side with the simulated RX some improvement, but certainly not where we would want her to ultimately wind up. But if we can shrink that pupil down, you can see now that we're getting into a range that she certainly could be much, much more functional. So we ultimately designed her a set of lenses from Valley Contacts. The um, Aries design, you notice that this is an oblate design because she does have a history of refractive surgery. So it's a, a reverse geometry type design. The over refraction uh, in her right eye at this point in time was Plano with a minus two and a quarter that got her 2020 acuity. Her left eye required no over refraction. It was 2020, and she was she is absolutely delighted. We saw her earlier this week, and we have the uh, process in order to add that um, residual cylinder into the contact lens and provide her the outcome that she's she's looking for. 
We have um, another case now, which is um, a post LASIK individual who's a, a very nice young fellow that I've known for a number of years who had an interest in um, the um, law enforcement career and went on to uh, undergo Zyoptics LASIK, Femto in 2016. You can see what his preoperative refractive error was, um, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, his postoperative outcome uh, measured uh, recently, uh, just a year ago in 2020 was uh, excellent with 2015 acuity with simply a minus a quarter sphere in each eye. But he does report flare after dark uh, working now in the uh, sheriff's department, which probably does not bode well. So we looked at his naked eyes and you can see that he does have some uh, significant issues that could contribute to that. Uh, but again, a very large pupil size north of seven millimeters and um, with a mild degree of myopia noted on the um, wavefront sensing equipment that was not picked up in a, a standard refraction. Point spread function does show significant scatter as well. And, um, and you can certainly understand why he might be frustrated. Even if we shrink that pupil down to three millimeters, which we do in this simulation, you can see that there's still some significant flare issues there that could cause him problems uh, in his line of work. However, if we shrink that to three millimeters and add the refractive error, you can see that that collapses down pretty nicely. So let me finish here and close with a final, um, with a final study of probably everybody's nightmare patient, uh, the 56 year old uh, engineer who um, had a pre-surgical uh, refractive error, I believe was in the minus 11 to minus 12 range, um, very highly myopic. Um, and so ultimately he went on to develop some early cataract changes and was very motivated to move forward with cataract surgery. Um, you can see that he was implanted with an AO60 uh, IOL in 2016 and his left eye with a, a target of minus one and a uh, slight myopic surprise uh, showed us a minus two outcome. His fellow eye was, was commensurately adjusted uh, two weeks later to take that into account and aim for a minus one, which was achieved quite nicely. Uh, despite the best intentions. Uh, he was he was less than overwhelmed. He did ultimately develop some significant PCO for the right eye that was um, that was lasered, and you can see where his refractive error wound up wound up in that right eye, plano minus one and a quarter to twenty twenty. However, he ultimately had poor tolerance of the residual anisometropia and decided a year later that he was interested in a lens exchange, which was carried out successfully um, to reduce the anisometropia. And that was the reason that we had held off on doing a capsulotomy in the left um, to facilitate that IOL exchange. The capsulotomy was carried out in late 2017. And you can see by most measures, what uh, all of us would consider a very nice outcome. So the end of the story is he's happy now, not a chance. Um, we attempted contact lens correction with spherical disposables, uh, tried bromonidine, uh, ordered, and now he's going through a process of ordering spectacles at my, uh, you know, he's asked me to print prescriptions for him so he can order spectacles in quarter diopter increments to determine his desired refractive outcome. So. Uh, Scott McRae, I'm going to apologize in advance, but this gentleman will be gracing your doorstep in the coming days. Um, so just to look at his um, wavefront and see, does he really have reasons for complaint? I think you might agree that he does. Uh, there certainly is some coma that's present there, despite all the work that he's undergone. And you see the, the visual simulation uh, can corroborate that. Uh, reducing his pupil helps quite a bit, um, but he does still have some residual refractive error. If we reduce his pupil size and give him his simulated RX, uh, he does better, but still uh, not happy. Again, a comparison of the- Bob, Bob you're gonna need to wrap.
it up here, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. 5.3 millimeter pupil without the um, RX and 5.3 width shows better, but improvement here as well. So um, in closing, how important are the aberrations? 80 to 90% um, show um, it's important to have accurate cylinder correction as well. We know that coma and spherical aberration are the most important and are certainly pupil dependent as, as it depends on, um, you know, HOA contact lenses, the future is here. Um, just some uh, conclusion take home points um, show that um, we can manage these things and we can manage them very effectively. Quite important to make sure that the lens is centering well, has very little movement and is orientationally stable. So I certainly do uh, appreciate your kind attention and hope that you all think that this may be an opportunity to serve your patients to a, to a greater degree. Thank you. All right. Go ahead and stop your share there, Bob. So there we go. Okay. Um, good official word. Do we have some time for questions, yeah. Dave, or no? Let's take some questions. Okay. So we've got one in the chat for Dr. Ryan um, from Rachel Wozniak. Um, have there any, been any studies on higher order aberrations in corneal transplantation patients? You know, for P T PK patients that end up in an RGP, wonder if there's the ability to also improve um, their HOAs uh, that are typically associated with those. Thoughts on that? Yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> the With respect to the literature, I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is that um, we've had tremendous success with correcting these folks with uh, scleral contact lenses as well. Uh, many cases, um, simple scleral lenses can satisfy that. And then now we do have the opportunity in other situations to address their um, higher order aberrations as well. So from a physical fit standpoint, from a physiological standpoint, uh, with respect to health to the graft, no issues. And certainly we can satisfy these patients' uh, visual demands now. Great. Ben, this is Mike. Uh, I've got a question for Bob as well. Uh, Bob, your last patient, we've all been there and done that and know how challenging those patients can be. You know, with all these presbyopia drops on the, th on the threshold of FDA approval, would you consider a low dose pilocarpine for someone like that um, to see if it mitigated their higher order aberration symptoms? Well, my personal feeling is, is I'm not a huge fan of in a patient who's a minus 12, has a history exactly. of minus 12 myopia. Um, but the good news is that there's also uh, some early work going on with adding presbyopic correction to these uh, lenses as well. So we'll be able to put multifocal um, corrections on these. We'll be able to decenter the optics as we need to. And so I think the future is bright. Rajiv, I got a question for you. Sure. Thanks for your great work on um, health equity and addressing that in Rochester and for your population health efforts. It's a great, it's great for all of us. Um, do you do you feel there are any unique barriers to delivery of healthcare in Rochester as opposed to other places, or do you think these are just the standard barriers we're facing here? Well, I think one of the unique things is that the need isn't as ubiquitous as, you know, one would, would think and you go to a developing world where you just see, you know, the need all around you is more. Um, so just helping, you know, in, in certain areas may be uh, beneficial, but here you really have to go out to those folks who need the care. They're, they're hidden in, in, in the communities. Like, I don't go into the city for, for much, you know, you don't really go into those neighborhoods that the, the community has a need in. Whereas in other, other areas of the world, you, you drive past areas that, you know, you can see the care is needed. So I think that visibility factor is a big issue and you know, only 5,000 to 15,000 folks really need the care and they're concentrated on areas that we don't go to that. And, you know, of course, the same thing, bureaucracy and other things that we get and systemic um, uh, segregation, systemic issues that, that exist. And those things aren't gonna be surmounted by us necessarily, but we can make inroads at least and connect with the community more and the vision van is a great way to do it. Thank you. Hey, Michael, um, do you um, have any sense uh, with respect to myopia control 
um, <clears throat> some of these newer soft lens designs versus the uh, traditional RGP Ortho K. What's your what's your early sense on that? You know, Bob, that's a great question. If you look at the studies, um, and most of them again have looked at axial length and spherical equivalent cycloplegic refractions, they look pretty consistent across the board, whether we're talking about an orthokeratology lens or a soft lens, or even some of these novel spectacle lenses. So I think optically, there's a lot of options there. Great. I have a quick question for Mike there then. Um, so how do we prevent myopia? How do we, how do we, how do we prevent refractive error and, and get all these guys who are doing LASIK surgery out of business? Well, the good news for Scott McRae and all these guys doing LASIK surgery is that they'll never be out of business. I think our goal, uh, Rajiv, is to deliver them a more palatable or manageable candidate. I don't think we ever eliminate myopia as we know it. I think we just try to manage it and rein it in so that we all deal less with the sequelae of that very highly myopic eye later in life. None of us like to see that. You mean you're going to try and make my job easier so I don't have to say no to all these minus 12s coming in the door? Absolutely. Oh, I appreciate it. It's good stuff. I think that brings us up to our time. So I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, great job. And we'll get on to the next session. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we'll be finishing up this afternoon with glaucoma and welcoming uh, Joseph uh, per Panarelli here, um, as well as our own uh, Regina Smoliak. The session will be moderated by uh, Sarah Klein. Sarah is our chief of optometry and is assistant professor in the department um, at the Fall My Institute. She practices comprehensive eye care including the co-management of glaucoma patients at FEI's main campus and college town locations. She's a graduate of the New England College of Optometry and completed an optome optometric residency at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland Veterans Hospital. After relocation to the Chicago area, she provided primary eye care and ocular disease management, as well as student mentoring to the Advocate Health Clinic at the Illinois Eye Institute, Illinois College of Optometry. And she joined our faculty in 2012. Welcome, Sarah. Take it away. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Panarelli. Um, Joseph Panarelli is a glaucoma specialist at NYU Langone Health and an associate professor at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Panarelli works with a diverse patient population in managing both adult and pediatric glaucoma. Through his clinical practice, he has developed and published several new surgical techniques, been a part of numerous clinical trials with the latest surgical devices, and published new findings comparing traditional glaucoma procedures. This includes a manuscript comparing the clinical impact of eight landmark glaucoma trials that has been cited at numerous conferences around the country. With much, much of his research focused on clinical trials, Dr. Panarelli remains highly involved in the study of microinvasive glaucoma surgeries and MIGS devices, working to quantify the role of these surgeries in the involving treatment, of, treatment algorithm. He is also involved as one of the first clinical investigators on US soil to study the safety and effectiveness of an ophthalmic surgical robot. Dr. Panarelli is dedicated to resident education and is director of the NYU Langone Glaucoma Fellowship Program. He has precepted more than two dozen fellows, developing their clinical and surgical proficiency, and many of his past residents have gone on to careers in academic medicine. Dr. Panarelli graduated from Georgetown University School of Medicine before pursuing his ophthalmology residency at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. He completed his fellowship at Baskin Palmer before returning to the metropolitan New York area. He has delivered dozens of invited lectures and has authored or co-authored nearly 50 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. He is also a reviewer or sits on the board of several noted ophthalmology publications. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Panarelli as he presents The Truth About MIGS. Do we have data to support the hype? Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks, thanks to really everybody involved. It's, it's really fantastic to be here with all of you. And uh, the lectures this morning were all really fantastic. I feel like we have to take the, the level down a bit here. We're gonna, we're gonna start with some glaucoma 
feel like we had some uh, real high level talks from uh, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Wong and others. And uh, we're just gonna talk about glaucoma now. So um, trying to save myself a little bit of stress, I decided to record my talks. And so I'm gonna try to play these all for you. Um, right now, let's see how we go. Good morning, my name is Joe Panarelli. I'm from NYU Langone Health. Thank you guys so much for the invitation to speak here at the University of Rochester uh, meeting. I wanna thank Dr. Smoliak, Dr. DiLoretto, uh, Mr. Kafran, and others who have helped put this uh, great symposium together. So um, I'm gonna start off the glaucoma portion of this symposium, and we're gonna start off with a, uh, a lecture that is, is one that I haven't given before, but one that I think is uh, pretty important. We've heard so much about MIGs over the last decade or so. Um, and really, um, the question is, do we really have the data to support all the hype? I mean, every meeting you go to, there's lecture after lecture on MIGs. Um, and there's been a good number of studies that have been performed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of these procedures. But I thought I'd spend the next 20 minutes or so taking a, a deeper dive and really looking at um, what the literature says about each of these procedures. So let's get started. Uh, financial disclosures, I do consult for a number of companies that make uh, many of these devices, uh, but I would try to remain as unbiased as possible as always. So here's an outline. I always like to start with this to let you know where my mind's going to kind of go over the next 20 minutes. So we'll start off by talking about really what, what defines a MIGS procedure. Really, um, it seems like the definition kind of encompasses almost any new procedure that's out there. Uh, that is not a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt surgery. Everybody wants to be a MIGS procedure. Um, how much literature is there on MIGS? Um, what are the most commonly used MIGS devices and procedures and which have been evaluated really with what I consider the gold standard, which is a randomized clinical trial. You'd be surprised at how few have actually been evaluated this way. And then I'll spend probably a little more of the time um, on a project that's near and dear to me, which is the Preserflow Microshunt. That's probably the newest glaucoma device that is coming out. And I'll go over the results that we have from a randomized uh, controlled trial uh, that is likely to be published within the next uh, several months. And I think the device should be FDA approved soon. So um, it'll be a little sneak peek at one of the newer devices coming out in the field of glaucoma. So let's start. What is a MIGS surgery? Um, Really, is, is there a definition? And Hadi Saheb and Ike Ahmed several years ago wrote a piece in Current Opinion, and they described five qualities of a MIGS procedure. So the procedure really has to be performed via a micro-incisional approach. Often that is a clear corneal incision, but it doesn't have to be. It's actually been expanded. Some of our subconjunctival filtration procedures are now performed through a small opening in the conjunctiva. So again, it kind of depends on what you consider a micro-incisional approach, but essentially we're not doing large pyridomies. A second quality is that the procedure must be minimally traumatic to the targeted tissue. So again, unlike trabeculectomy, where we're cutting into sclera or tube shunt surgery, where we're putting implants under muscles, we're really doing very little damage or, or destruction to the, uh, to the eye. Uh, a third feature is efficacy, and that's, that's huge. I mean, with any procedure we do, we want to make sure that we're getting good efficacy. A fourth quality is a rapid recovery with a minimal impact on the patient's quality of life. I think this is very important, uh, especially for all of our monocular patients. Um, you know, so many of my patients ask me, well, doc, how long is it going to take to recover from, you know, this surgery that you're just consented me for? So say it's a trab or a tube, and I, I tell them it can be as long as three months. And, and for some of these patients, that's a you know, that's, that's a tough time to be dealing with, um, you know, a procedure that is going to decrease their vision, that's going to cause them significant discomfort. You know, a lot of these patients want to maintain their independence. They want to be able to see quickly after surgery and get back to their normal activity because many of them are traveling to and from appointments by themselves. So, you know, I think one of the nice things about these mixed procedures is that there is a more rapid recovery. A fifth and very important feature is high safety profile. And again, that goes without saying why that is so important. I think the key with the MIGS procedures, though, is balancing point three and point five. It's efficacy and safety. And they really, they're kind of at opposite ends of the scale. So the procedures that get us greater efficacy 
often carry greater risk. And so, you know, I always tell my patients, no pain, no gain. If we want to get low IOPs, we often have to take on a significant amount of risk. And so you'll see as I go through this uh, lecture and I talk about the different procedures, you'll see you know, some get us mild to modest IOP reduction while having a great safety profile. And there are others which are going to have more risks, um, but they have a greater chance of getting a low final IOP more consistently. So let's talk about now how much literature is there on NIGs. And so um, this was a question a few of us had several years back. And Ike Ahmed and one of his uh, former fellows, George Durer, who's uh, now a specialist in Canada, did a really nice job doing a summary analysis. So what they did was they did a MedLine or PubMed search on all the MIGS devices and procedures and yielded almost 2,400 results. And they found that there were about 275 papers under the classification of trials, and these were ones that were relevant. And so, you know, the rationale for doing this was that there seemed like there was a paucity of comparative randomized controlled trials evaluating different MIGs. This slide is tough. I got to tell you, I've read this several times. I even talked to Ike and George and asked them to really break it down for me. But essentially, on the left here, and I'm going to get my pointer ready, so... On the left here, we have all the different MIGS procedures. So some of these are devices and some of these are procedures. Uh, up here, we have the length of time and follow-up in the studies. And over here, we have the ends in terms of the number of patients in total in all of these studies. And you'll see sort of the, the top graphic is those studies that had about a year or less of follow-up. And then below it is going to be studies that had over a year of follow-up. And again, how many were prospective and how many were not prospective. So in general, to break it down, if you look at the, the I stent here, the I stent has a good number of randomized clinical trials, a good number of prospective studies with a good number of patients. The thickness of these bars represents sort of the total number of studies. And again, this is the length of time in terms of follow-up. So um, again, the iStent has a good amount of literature out there on it. Uh, the Zen, um, you know, not many prospective studies outside of a year. The Hydrus does have a good number of prospective studies with greater than a year of follow-up. And again, the GAT here, not many prospective studies. Uh, Trebectome is mixed. KDB, really no prospective studies. And again, these are standalone studies. So, um, you know, kind of supports what we were talking about before, that there is a paucity of literature, randomized controlled trials. Now, we do a little bit better when we look at combined MIGS FACO. There are definitely more studies that are prospective that have been carried out for a I think we lost volume. Of our procedures which target the juxtacanalicular trabecular meshwork. These are either going to be stenting procedures or stripping procedures. And I'd say the most common ones are the eye stent uh, G1 or eye stent inject. We have the trabectome, we have the hook dual blade, and we have the GAT procedure. And, you know, in terms of which of these procedures work best, which of these procedures should I do? Well, I think that kind of depends upon the surgeon and it depends upon the patient that's sitting right in front of them. And it's always very hard to sort of say, hmm, this one procedure works well um, for this person, this one procedure works well for that person. It is very hard. You have to really individualize your surgical approach and it's all about patient selection. And that's how you're gonna get your best outcomes. I'd say if you're looking for, you know, mild to modest IOP reduction and you're trying a new MIGS procedure, the eye stent is a very nice procedure to start with, especially the eye stent inject. And they do have a newer one that has just come out with a wider flange that prevents over implantation. But, you know, I think the eye stent inject is very nice, helps get your patients off, you know, a medication or two. Uh, for patients who need a little more pressure reduction, maybe you would go with the Kahook dual blade or the trabectome. Here, you're stripping away a segment of the trabecular meshwork to expose the inner wall of Schlem's canal. And then I think if you want to get even more pressure reduction, you try to treat the entire 360 degrees of the alpha pathway with the procedure like the GAT. And so, you know, you might say, well, which one is better than the other? Well, again, there's not a lot of literature that, that really has compared these devices. But let's look at what the new literature is for 
you know, several of these devices. So let's start with the iStent Inject. And really we have to credit Tom Samuelson out in Minnesota, um, who's done some of the great work. This was a randomized prospective trial published in the Blue Journal, um, probably our best journal out there. And what this was, was a study that compared FACO plus implantation of two of the iStent Injects to FACO alone. And they were randomized in a three to one fashion. So you had nearly 400 patients uh, in the eye stent arm and about 120 patients in the FACO alone arm. And what we found was that at 24 months, about 75% of the eyes that underwent FACO eye stent implantation versus about 62% of the control eyes had a 20% reduction from baseline unmedicated IOP. And of those that responded, about 84% of the treatment eyes and 67% of the control eyes were off topical therapy. So that's pretty good. And if you want to sort of look at how they did in terms of pressure reduction, about a seven millimeter drop in the FACO eye stent group and about a 5.4 millimeter drop in the FACO alone. So what do I take out of this study? Well, this is a very safe procedure that does get us a, a, a good IOP reduction. But I also get out of this that FACO alone works pretty good for lowering the IOP. I mean, almost 62% of eyes had that 20% IOP reduction and they dropped about 5.4 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you want to get an extra millimeter or two, and there is some literature out there that does support the fact that every millimeter of mercury counts when you're uh, treating glaucoma, um, it may be beneficial to your patient to implant one of these or two of these devices into the uh, canal of Schlem. So let's look at um, procedures that target the collector channels or Schlem's canal. Uh, canaloplasty, uh, the ab internal canaloplasty or omni are two very nice procedures. I personally don't have great experience with them, but they're nice procedures. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the hydrus, which I've uh, performed several of, and I think there's some good literature out there on the hydrus. And so let's talk about this horizon study, which is a newer study that came out, very similar to the study I just described in that uh, we're doing FACO alone versus FACO plus implantation of the hydrus. And so what is the hydrus? It's this uh, long uh, device that's going to sit in Schlem's canal and it's going to dilate and open the canal and it's going to allow, has an inlet. So fluid is going to pass uh, through the inlet directly into Schlem's canal. Patients in this study were randomized in a two to one fashion. And you'll see we had a similar uh, outcomes compared to the eye stent inject study. Almost 77% of patients in the hydrus group versus almost 60% of patients in the FACO group had that 20% IOP reduction. That's a typical primary endpoint for a lot of these types of studies. And again, how about the pressure reduction? Very similar. About seven and a half millimeters of mercury in the hydrus FACO group and about five in the FACO group no serious ocular adverse events in either group. So again, if you're looking for procedures that get you, you know, modest pressure reduction with great safety, uh, the eye stent inject or the hydrus microstent are nice procedures. Well, you might say, which one's better? Well, we actually do have a study that compared the two of them. Uh, this was called the compare study. And it's a little bit different because this was a standalone procedure, no fake emulsification. So it was the hydrus implantation versus two eye stents, but not the inject. These were the G1 eye stents. And at 12 months, the hydrus had a greater rate of complete surgical success So um, and, and reduced medication use. But I think if you look more critically at the data, you'll see both groups actually did quite well. Um, and there were some issues with the methodology. So I do encourage you not just to read the abstract, but to actually read this entire paper um, to formulate your own conclusions. But I'd say that in general, both procedures did very well in this study and both were very safe. This is a little more of um, you know, procedures that, that, that I perform more commonly. And this may be stretching the definition of a MIGS procedure. Some people call these LIGS procedures or less invasive glaucoma surgeries, or maybe you'll hear the term MIBS for micro um, invasive bleb surgery. So these are new bleb forming procedures that are maybe not quite as risky as trabeculectomy. Um, and they are ways to get a filtering bleb with a micro incisional approach. And again, um, I think you sort of uh, will judge it on your own whether or not you really consider this uh, a mixed procedure, but we're talking about two main procedures. So we have the Zengel stent and the Preserflow micro shunt. The Zengel stent is currently FDA approved while the micro shunt is uh, under FDA investigation. So what are these? These are micro shunts. They are small tubes that are gonna shunt fluid from the anterior chamber 
into the subconjunctival subtenon space in a very regulated manner. Okay, so the way they do this is that they have a certain length and a certain luminal diameter such that they restrict flow. So the way I kind of describe them, they are basically tubes without an end plate or without a reservoir. And to me, these procedures are sort of a hybrid between a tube and a trap. Both of these microshunts are made of material that's been well, that's been tested and is proven to be well tolerated by the human body. Um, however, there is still scarring with these procedures and they need to be performed with mitomycin C. And so the Zen gel stent is six millimeters in length with a 45 micron lumen. So it's very, very tiny. It's made of porcine gelatin. And you can implant this device in a number of ways. You can do a closed conjunctiva approach, an open conjunctiva approach. I could spend two lectures going through how to implant the Zen gel stent, but Suffice it to say, the jury is still out on what the best way to implant it is, but it is a device that does get us nice pressure reduction with a good safety profile. The procedure below is a little bit different. That's the present flow micro shunt. I'll spend a little more time on that. That has to be implanted via an ob external approach. And the device is made of SIBS material, which is the material used in cardiac stents. It's eight and a half millimeters in length with a 70 micron lumen. So it's a little bit longer and a little bit wider than the Zen gel stent. Let's talk about the Zen. So what is the pivotal study? What should I know is, is sort of the data on Zen? Well, there's a lot of new data. There's actually a ton of it out there. But if you want the original study that was published in AJO, it's from Devinder Grover. This was a study that looked at implantation of the Zen gel stent in patients with refractory glaucoma. So most of the patients in the study were those at high risk of filtration failure. So the majority had, had already had a prior trabeculectomy or other glaucoma surgery. There were a handful who were just on maximum uh, medical therapy, but most were refractory patients. And at 12 months, about 75% of patients experienced a greater than 20% IOP drop from baseline on the same or fewer medications. There was a rather high needling rate of about 32%. And the rate of hypotony was around 20, 25%. But keep in mind, that's really mostly patients with numerical hypotony, not clinically significant hypotony, which for most of us, it's hypotony maculopathy that worries us. So again, a really nice study. And you'll see that there was a good drop in pressure that was pretty consistent over a year. What is the weakness of the study? Well, it wasn't a randomized study. It's um, only had about a year of follow-up, but you know, it was the probably the pivotal study. And hopefully we will see some more data uh, that comes out uh, on this device. And uh, I point to some current opinion articles. Uh, I co-authored one of them with uh, two of my uh, students, uh, Anadeh, who's now on faculty at NYU uh, and Hardik Greek. And uh, Arsham Shabani has done a lot of great work with the Zen Gel Center. These are nice reviews of all the literature that's out there on these two devices. And I encourage you to pick these up if you want to dive in a little further. So let's finish up by talking about the Preserflow Microshunt, which is something I'm excited about. Um, what was this study? This was a two-year randomized single mass multi-center study that was conducted in the US and Europe at 29 sites. And it compared the safety and effectiveness of standalone microshunt versus trabeculectomy. So again, what is the microshunt? It is this device that is pictured here. It's a microshunt that's going to move fluid from the anterior chamber into the subconjunctival subtenon space in a regulated manner. I'll show you a video in a minute. Um, the methods, again, this is more for the residents. This is, this is kind of how you want to design a good randomized prospective study. So key inclusion criteria, you have patients age 40 to 85, controlled IOP between 15 and 40 millimeters of mercury. And actually 15 is on the lower side. Um, these are some tough patients to get a good drop in pressure. What were our outcome measures? So the primary endpoint was a 20% reduction in IOP. You're going to see this over and over. This is what is used in most studies without increasing glaucoma medications at one year. We also looked at the IOP over time, as well as the number of glaucoma meds. And in terms of safety endpoints, we looked at endothelial cell density, post-operative interventions, and adverse events of special interest. So what is this procedure? Again, because uh, many of you may not have seen this before, uh, I'm going to walk you through just a very quick video uh, illustrating how to perform the microshunt implantation. So we start off by making a conjunctival pyridomy, probably about three to four o'clock hours. We do some posterior dissection. We like to apply cautery. Then we uh, will use mitomycin C because we do need to prevent uh, scarring and episclerotic fibrosis. In this study, we used four half moon pledgets uh, at a concentration of 0.2 milligrams per ml. That is what is approved by the FDA. You cannot inject 
mitomycin in um, uh, FDA studies. And so here's our needle track into the eye. It's about a three millimeter tunnel. And through this tunnel, we will insert the micro shunt. And so you'll see the micro shunt here. Um, it has a uh, little fin in the back, which is going to get tucked into the sclera that, that prevents migration of the device. Here we are priming the device, and you'll see this nice regulated flow out the back of the device. And then we bring the conjunctiva and tenons up, and we close the conjunctiva in a watertight fashion. And that's it. So again, this is kind of a hybrid between a tube and a trad. So how did the patients do? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about demographics. Whenever you critically read a paper, you want to make sure that the two groups were balanced. And you'll see here, they were randomized in a three-to-one fashion. We had a really nice balance, no uh, significance in any of our p-values. You'll see a good number of patients, almost 30%, had a starting IOP under 18. And look at the visual field mean deviation, minus 12. So these were patients who had pretty real glaucoma. How did we do? So that primary endpoint, 20% IOP reduction without increasing uh, medications. And we met that in about 73% of patients in the TRAB group and nearly 54% of patients in the microshunt group. And if we took out those patients with the low starting IOP, because some of those were really hard to get, you know, those pressures down, and we just looked at patients who were more characteristic of what we treat, treat so patients over 21, almost 75% of patients in the TRAB group and 64% of patients in the microshunt group met that endpoint. Here are our pressures. As you'd expect, the TRAB group, because there is you know, titration of flow, the pressures came down a little more gradually, but you'll see they finished with a wonderful IOP of around 11 at year one. The micro shunt, really nice, smooth post-operative course here with a little bit, you know, higher pressure at year one, around 14 millimeters of mercury. Glaucoma meds, this is a big slide. Most patients were on about three or so glaucoma medications. Look at how many patients at year one on medications, 0.6 in the micro shunt group, 0.3 in the trag group. Nearly 72% were medication-free in the microtrunk group and 85% in the TRAB group. So there definitely probably were patients uh, in both of these groups uh, who had functioning blebs, but maybe didn't quite have that 20% IOP reduction because they started at a pretty low IOP. So they may have been considered failures. Um, you know, when you read the paper down the road, you'll see some of the, you can dive more into the data and really take a look at sort of uh, how each of the groups did. In terms of adverse events, both really safe procedures. And I think, you know, if you look at the Microshun group, you'll see the overall incidence was lower, though this was not clinically significant except for hypotony. Endothelial cell loss, very similar between both groups. And I think this is an acceptable amount of loss for procedures that need to be performed um, in patients who have more severe glaucomatous damage. Post-op interventions, definitely higher in the trabeculectomy group, but that really owes to the need for laser suture lysis, which really some people just consider to be part of the procedure. No reports of endophthalmitis or uh, other serious vision-threatening complications in either group at a year. So conclusions, the micro shunts, we saw about uh, a final IOP of around 14 millimeters of mercury at year one, trabeculectomy around 11 millimeters of mercury, both on very few drops and a similar amount of adverse events and cell loss. So, um, you know, this is a, a randomized prospective study that I was uh, very lucky to be a part of with uh, the great group at Santen and many other great clinical investigators. And so, you know, hopefully this was a nice uh, uh, summary of all the different uh, trials that are out there. There's so many more, and I encourage all the residents and fellows out there, when you read these papers, don't just look at the abstract, actually, you know, read the methodology, understand what is being done in each of the studies, and, um, you know, hopefully you'll be a part of one of them uh, one day down the road. So thank you again for the invitation. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll happily take them during the discussion. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Regina Smoliak is an associate professor of ophthalmology at our own University of Rochester Flum Eye Institute and is the glaucoma service. Um, besides providing expert patient care and helping to train residents, she is also actively involved in the university and the FEI administration, where she sits on numerous committees, including co-chairing FEI's electronic medical record committee. Her surgical specialties include the treatment of glaucoma and cataracts, and she has been involved in adaptive optics research to image the optic nerve head and parapapillary vasculature in normal tension glaucoma. Dr. Smoliak earned her undergraduate degree here at the University of Rochester, where she then went on to earn her medical degree. She was a resident in ophthalmology at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine and completed a glaucoma fellowship at WashU in St. Louis. Dr. Smoliak is certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology and is a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. 
She also is a member of the New York Glaucoma Society and the American Glaucoma Society. Please give her your warm attention as she presents update on new narrow angle glaucoma treatments and recommendations. How do I make my choice? All right. Uh, can I share my screen? I cannot share my screen. Do you want me to try to play the video? No, uh, now I can share the screen. Hold on. Now I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually I'm going to go live. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. All right, well, first of all, Joe, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. When I've heard that you're gonna talk about current mixed procedures, I just said I'm gonna to stick to something more, less sexy. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about um, update on narrow angle glaucoma uh, screening and treatments. And uh, how do I make my choice now with a kind of new studies that are coming out? Uh, how do we screen patients and how we treat patients with uh, this disease? So let's first talk about the nomenclature and uh, the definitions of glaucoma. So the first one is the most common in narrow angle is primary angle closure suspect. What does it mean? That means that these patients do not have any evidence of glaucoma disease. They have no visible posterior trabecular meshwork over 180 degrees. So the angle is narrow and sometimes closed. Um, their intraocular pressure is still less than 95th percentile of the population within normal limits. And the most important thing is they have no disc or field damage at this time. Here are just a quick review of the open angle. Um, it's uh, taken from the L word slides. Um, you can see iris, ciliary body, scleral spur, pigmented and non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, and it ends with a Schwabi line that is usually identified by the corneal wedge on your gonioscopy, uh, small slit, uh, slit limb beam. And here's we're looking at the pictures of the closed angle or narrow angle. Here on the top, you can see a little bit of pigmented trabecular meshwork, but you can see how close the iris is coming towards the iris, to, towards the trabecular meshwork. And on the bottom, we do not see any angle whatsoever uh, that can be visualized. And that brings us to category of primary, primary angle closure, which includes iridotrabecular contact, like we saw in one of the pictures. It has evidence of the secondary effect, so pressure is usually starting to come up. But still, these patients have no evidence of disc or damage on the visual field. And here is the picture of the angle where the iris starts coming up toward trabecular meshwork and start uh, slowly zipping it up and occluding it. And unlike with the regular primary open angle glaucomas, we do bring intraocular pressure into definition to these patients. And the reason for that is the elevated intraocular pressure in narrow angle glaucoma is unlikely to happen due by chance. If the narrow angle present in about 20% of people and elevated intraocular pressure can be present in about 5% of people, both of them occurring at the same time will occur in less than 1% of patients. So the next definition would be primary open angle glaucoma where intraocular pressure comes into the definition. But we also have to have the iridotrabecular contact we have disc or field damage at this point, like it is shown in the pictures. We have, um, we have a disc damage with a notch and corresponding to the visual field defect, which is on the right. And as we're all well aware of acute angle closure glaucoma definition, this is a subset of patients who present with uh, emergency glaucoma, intraocular pressure, uh, elevation, sudden elevation associated with a closed angle, and typical classic symptoms that we're all well aware of that um, include but not limited to mid-dilated pupils, swollen cornea, high pressures, uh, red inflamed eyes, uh, vomiting, nausea, and very sick patients. And we usually treat these patients according to the protocol, lowering their pressure, performing PI, and uh, removing the lenses when we can. 
So what about, of the, what about the patients who do not have acute ankle closure or do not have a disease? They are in the category of the suspect. So how many of these people are actually floating around and do we really need to screen for these people and uh, treat them with a peripheral aridotomy? So there are not really a lot of studies um, currently available in the United States for that. But in uh, other countries like China and India, uh, people are looking at the prevalence of narrow angle glaucoma and narrow angle glaucoma suspect. So one of this is Chennai study that actually looked at the comparison of urban and rural population and development of primary angle closure disease. And the interesting that the studies look at the life population kind of in vivo, looking at the population, living their lives, and how many of them them actually will develop a disease. So they looked, the numbers of the study actually showed that they found that 278 people had angle closure suspect diagnosis, 106 were primary angle closure, and only 34 developed primary angle closure glaucoma. And the prevalence of disease was less than 10% of the real disease in the population. Um, China has um, quite a large uh, population, first aging population, and aging population has the narrow angle glaucoma or narrow angle glaucoma suspect diagnosis. So the next study I will be talking about was done in China. And the reason for that is the population in China is aging quite rapidly. And they have, uh, in 2005, they had about 290 million people over 50. And estimate that in uh, 2050, the estimate will be about 641 million people. So if we take 10% of these people with an angle closure glaucoma suspect, we're talking about 64 million people that will need to be screened, not only screened, but treated. So what can we do with all these people? And what should we do with all these people? So should we PI people? And uh, here's the picture of my patient who had a PI. And uh, luckily for this patient, after the PI, the angle was slightly open. But does it make a difference in the, um, in the, in the um, progression of the disease? So let's look at the safety of the PI. And um, the procedure itself, has blood aqueous barrier disruption. It can cause acute intraocular pressure rise. It can burn the cornea, lens, or retina. Um, it does cause uh, glare and diplopia in some patients depending on the placement of the PI. And also the question is whether PI can um, play, it play some role in progressing cataracts or endothel endothelial cell loss. So the uh, Jungenstein angle closure prevention trial was actually conducted to evaluate whether the laser iridotomy play any role in prevention of angle closure glaucoma in Southern China. So the study looked at whether LPI can prevent angle closure. And um, as I said, they was done at Southern China. There, there was 10,000 people who were screened already and 889 subjects were enrolled in the study and they were randomized. One eye of the same person was randomized to the peripheral iridotomy and the other eye was randomized to a control. And the study was completed with a follow-up of six years. The methods of the study uh, was uh, quite legitimate. They have two glaucoma doctors that looked at the angle and they had to agree on the, on the um, angle assessment. It was done in a dark room with a one millimeter beam, uh, Goldman lens and um, with indentation and the angle was estimated in degrees and modified to the Schaefer classification. The endpoints of the study were that intraocular pressure has to, uh, has to be elevated above 24 millimeters of mercury on two separate occasions, or uh, it has to be a formation of PAS at least in one clock hour, or it has to be an acute angle closure attack. The patients in the study consisted mostly of the older people of um, 59 plus minus five years. So majority of people were over 50 years old and 83% were female. 
This is the uh, screening. This is not the typical study population that we see in our clinics. These people were already pre-screened. And so they definitely form into the statistics of narrow angle glaucoma. And the rest of the statistics basically shows that because the control eyes and the treated eyes were in the same patients, they kind of followed the same, they were very similar um, according to all the measurements. So what was the, first, first of all, when they PI people, they looked what happened after the PI, how safe is the PI? And obviously we probably all know that the spikes from the YAG laser peripheral iridotomy will occur more if we use more energy and more shots. And the study just confirmed that. Um, also, if the bleeding occurs from the iris, there's more cases that had some intraocular spikes, intraocular pressure spikes after the PI versus those who did not have bleeding. So longitudinal, how, how about the angle? So if we look at the angle with the PI and not PI people uh, or PI eyes, the angle opened after the laser peripheral iridotomy. It was unchanged in the control eyes. Interestingly, 25% of angles did not change after laser peripheral iridotomy and remained near the trabecular contact. So the recommendation of the study was actually that there's absolutely pointless to keep looking at the angle after the performing of peripheral iridotomy since such a large percentage of people do not show any opening. Interestingly that over the time, the angle will narrow uh, about the same, maybe slightly less in the PI group, but still will continue to narrow whether people had PI or did not have a PI. So let's look at the endpoints of the study. The endpoints of the study show that in the composite endpoint, the LPI people did slightly better than the control eyes. Um, with a small p-value. Uh, intraocular pressure was elevated in um, three people in the PI, three eyes in the PI group and five eyes in the control group. Uh, the only big difference was that the PES formation was much less in the PI group, in the PI group versus the control eyes. And interestingly, acute attack occurred in one um, I after the LPI and in five eyes after the control. Um, I have to say that every person, every person in the group was dilated after the PI and checked the pressure. So they actually were provoking the eyes to go into the narrow angle attack and looking at whether PI was helpful. So how about acute attacks after the dilation? So five control eyes and one LPI treated eye had an acute attack after the dilation. 6.3 um, acute angle closure cases per 10,000 dilations in control eyes. And there was only two attacks occurred both in untreated eyes outside of dilation. So after doing all the fancy statistics, the conclusion was that it's about 4.4 uh, per 10,000 eye years in untreated eyes if dilation induced cases are excluded, or you can say it's about one attack per 2,000 people. Was the PI safe? So there was really no serious uh, adverse side effects. Um, localized hyphema occurred um, in about 29% of patients. Localized kernel burn was quite rare and intraocular pressure detected more than 30 millimeters of mercury right after the PI was happening about less than 1% of people of eyes. And um, after 72 months, the endothelial, endothelial cell loss and cataracts formations were about the same in both eye groups. So PI is fairly safe procedure with kind of no long-term side effects. Uh, looking further into the endothelial cell damage, they found there is not a lot of difference between um, reduction in endothelial cell density uh, in PI eyes versus control eyes. Uh, the size of the cells and hexagonality of the cells did, were pretty similar in both groups. And LPA parameters did, was, not, were, was not associated with any decline in endothelial cell density. 
So the overall conclusion of the study was that LPI was protective, but mainly it was protective against interim outcomes and mostly against the PAS formation. Most cases of the acute attack were following dilations. Two control eyes uh, over six years had an acute angle closure attack. So maybe we are doing way too many PIs, given that the numbers of acute angle closure attacks and acute angle closure uh, glaucoma development is quite small. And screening for narrow angles is probably not necessary because epidemiologically and statistically in a large population, it may not make a, a big difference. So how about treatment of primary angle closure glaucoma when it's developed? What is, the, what is our choices? So the recent study, uh, EGLE study, was performed, and it also was done in Europe and Asia. And it's actually looked in early lens extractions with intraocular lens implantation for the treatment of primary angle closure glaucoma. So this study was multi-center randomized study in UK and East Asia. They have about 400 subjects, 200 in each arm, with newly diagnosed primary angle closure glaucoma in patients over 50 years of age. They were randomized to standard care or to clear lens extraction. The outcomes of the study were measured with um, several uh, parameters. Three of the main parameters were European quality of life five dimension questionnaire for the patients, intraocular pressure and incremental cost per quality adjusted life year uh, gained. After the informed consent was obtained, the patients were randomized into two groups. The intervention group went into the clear lens extraction. Then if that did not control pressure, escalation of the medical treatment, and if that failed, um, the glaucoma surgery was performed. The other arm was standard management, how we, at this point, um, managing narrow angle glaucoma, laser peripheral iridotomy, then escalation of medical treatment, then if that failed, glaucoma surgery is performed. So what did they find? They found that the patients in the clear lens extraction group have higher mean of health status score. So patients were much more happier after their lens was removed, their vision was restored, and their pressure was controlled. The health status score increased in clear lens extraction group, but decreased in the standard treatment group. Intraocular pressure was actually lower in the clear lens extraction group, and the procedure provided to be highly cost effective over the period of 10 years. So in the conclusion of, of both of those studies, uh, there is actually no evidence at this point to support screening for narrow angle glaucoma suspects. PI mainly prevents peripheral uh, posterior anterior synechia formation, but the numbers are very low to support PI as a prevention of primary angle closure glaucoma. It is also okay to dilate patient without screening for narrow angle, and that's um, it, mostly directed to our um, retina colleagues who worry about dilating patients in the waiting room. Uh, also, I think it's, it's a very good um, result, uh, especially in the time when we're talking about telemedicine and screening patients for diabetic retinopathy in the primary medical uh, doctor office. So dilating people without screening for narrow angle is okay because the numbers are extremely low. So, and when we do detect primary angle closure glaucoma, it looks like clear lens extractions for people over 50 years old seems to be a reasonable choice of treatment. They have better clinical outcomes, they have lower intraocular pressure, and it seems to be highly cost effective. And I think that's what I'm going to leave you with for thinking. So thank you so much. Thanks, Regina. That was fascinating. And I have so many questions, but I'll hold off until the, uh, the chat. Um, but uh, it's interesting. It seems like that study, both of them would have a lot of implications for how we take care of our patients. So that's really yeah. very interesting. Um, I'll try to sort of share my screen again here. Um, so we're just going next. Um, sorry, I'm not sharing. Just going next back to um, Dr. Panarelli. 
and his last talk today uh, will be on new medical therapy and new drug delivery platforms for glaucoma. Thanks, Dr. Panarelli. It's back to you. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, play this video and I'll share my screen and uh, hopefully everything will work. I think you may need to unmute. Like we had decades go by before we had uh, new topical therapies hit the market for glaucoma. And in the last two or three years, we now have seen about three or four medicines um, appear on our shelves. And we even have new drug delivery platforms. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'll talk about what new medications are available. I'll talk about where they fit into my drop algorithm. And then we will conclude with uh, a new drug delivery platform that may or may not change the way we deliver care to our glaucoma patients. So the first medicine we should talk about is Mifarsidone, uh, also known as Lopressa. Um, that was probably the newest medicine to hit the market. I'm going to briefly go over what it is, how it works, and the kinds of pressure reduction I can expect from this medicine. And for all of these medications, I'm going to go through the phase three pivotal trial, because I think it's nice to see some of the data uh, that supports the approval by the FDA. And so, you know, we talk about topical glaucoma therapy. Most of our medicines work by inhibiting aqueous production. So that's our beta blockers, our carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, even our alpha agonists. Our prostaglandins work by increasing uveal outflow. But really, there's no medication that works primarily at the level of the trabecular meshwork, which is where we think, you know, really the disease is when it comes to glaucoma. So remember, glaucoma is an outflow disease. It's not that patients are making too much fluid. It's that the fluid can't get out of the eye quickly enough. And so you might say, we have pilocarpine. Doesn't that work at the TM? Well, kind of indirectly. Repressor is really the first medicine that works at the level of the TM. And it was uh, developed in part by Dave Epstein, uh, a great glaucoma specialist from Duke. And so natarsidil is designed to target the TM. It's converted by corneal esterases into an active metabolite that has five times higher potency for rock inhibition. Well, what does it do? Um, I listen to a lot of people talk about natarsidone. I tried to understand it. And so, you know, I can give you a whole schematic of how it works with actin, myosin, but I think this, this statement really puts it most simply. It inhibits the creation of stress fibers in the TM to relax the tissue and enhance outflow. Quite simply, that's what it does. It relaxes the tissue and increases the outflow uh, through the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal. Well, what kind of data did we see? Well, with any new medication, we look at the phase three clinical trials, and often there are two phase three trials that need to be done before a medicine can get FDA approval. These medications are often compared to Timolol, and they have to meet non-inferiority at all endpoints. Um, and typically they are uh, diurnal IOP measurement readings obtained at week two, week six, and month three. Almost always, one of the trials has a safety analysis carried out through 12 months. So I said two studies, but you see three studies here, and you actually see Rocket 1, 2, and 4. So kind of confusing. Let's break it down. So Rocket 1 was the initial phase three study comparing Ropressa to Timolol. The issue was that non-inferiority was not met, and that was when the primary population study had a starting IOP of 27 or less. When they actually did a post hoc analysis and looked at patients who had a starting IOP of 25 or less, they found that Ropressa met all of the endpoints. So the future studies were designed with that in mind. So the primary efficacy population had a starting IOP of 25 or less. These were ocular hypertensive patients or patients with mild POAP. And we had two studies, Rocket 2 and 4. There was a third study, uh, Rocket 3, that was done outside the US, but um, Rocket 2 and 4 finished up quickly enough that they did not need the data from Rocket 3. So let's look at how Ropressa did when we combine the data from these studies. And so patients in the protocol um, met non-inferiority to Timolol at each of the endpoints. So here's week two, week six, uh, and month three. What we saw was about a 4.8 millimeter drop from these baseline IOPs that were between 22 and 24 millimeters of mercury. So again, pretty solid as monotherapy for patients with ocular hypertension 
or mild OA. Another way to look at the data, let's look at how many patients got a 20% ILP reduction by month three. And again, this is pooling the rocket studies. Um, this is pooling one, two, and four. And again, look at the higher starting IOPs. Uh, you'll see Timolol performs better. I think I would say that that's fair. In clinical practice, Timolol is a great medication for some of our patients who have higher starting IOPs. Repressa did a little bit better here at the other end, where we had lower starting IOPs. And these are traditionally some of our harder patients to get a drop in pressure. Again, another way to look at the data, let's look at sort of how many, how many millimeters of mercury the pressure dropped depending upon the starting IOP. So again, Timolol better at the higher IOPs, maybe not quite as good at the lower starting IOPs, and repress are pretty consistent across the board. Well, what have I seen? I gotta tell you, I've kind of seen pressure reductions all over the place. And I think that's just because, you know, the way I use metarsidil at first is not the way it was used in these studies. So whenever a new medicine hits the market, many of us don't use it as a first or second line agent. That's just the way we are. We have other medications. And so we try this as a third or fourth line agent. And I'll say I had some patients who I didn't see much of a reduction. It was probably because they had a very diseased outflow pathway. And I had others where I saw a huge home run where patients had a significant drop in pressure. And so, you know, as I used it more and more, I did find that I was getting pretty consistent IOP reductions, you know, depending upon where I added the medicine. And that's not typical for the most part. When you add a medicine as a third or fourth line agent, you don't get as good of a reduction as you would if you added it, if you use it first or second line. And so I'll show you some of the data on that in a few minutes. Um, the other thing about Ropressa, if you look at some of the work by Arthur Sitt and others, it doesn't just work by lowering, uh, by relaxing the stress fibers in the TM, it also can lower the episcleral venous pressure. So I would say that for some of my low tension glaucoma patients, I've had some nice pressure drops into the single digits using the tarsidol. So those are just some pearls in terms of, you know, how I've used this medicine so far. Well, I told you it worked well, but what are the side effects? Because there's always got to be a trade-off. It's all about pressure reduction compared to the side effect profile and actually for medications cost. But we'll keep the cost aside for now and just talk about side effect profile. Hyperemia. No one's going to deny that this medicine causes hyperemia. Um, in the pivotal trials, they saw about a 53% rate of hyperemia, but that was physician reported, not patient reported. So that's what they saw on clinical exam. And about 15% to 20% of patients had that at baseline. What have I seen? Eh, about 20, 25% of patients actually have hyperemia. As it states here, it often begins immediately or by the second week, and it doesn't get better. Unlike a prostaglandin analog where you encourage them to use it more because the hyperemia goes away, it doesn't really go away with these uh, medications. I'd say I discontinued it about 10% of the time and about another 10% can actually tolerate the hyperemia. Verticillata, um, it's often more mild. This is amiodarone example, this is Repressa. I will say I have some patients on Repressa with this kind of Verticillata. So um, it doesn't bother me though, because really it doesn't have any effect on visual function. It doesn't bother me with cataract surgery. It does resolve when you discontinue it. Um, and it often is first noted at four weeks. And so I, I don't consider this a, a major issue. Hemorrhages, we do see these petechial hemorrhages. You know, this medicine does seem to have a vasodilatory effect. Um, the hemorrhages typically will last for several weeks. I have seen some even larger hemorrhages for which I often get those calls on Saturday or Sunday. But again, just some education to the patients and they do fine. Let's talk a little about the most study. So this was a phase four multi-center open label study that looked at using Repressa in a real world setting. Again, people who added it as either a second or even third or fourth line agents. And so um, this was a 12 week prospective multi-center study and they looked at the percent change from baseline IOP at week 12. So again, let's look at the two groups, Repressa plus a PGA, about 55 patients, Repressa added to patients who were on at least two medications and there was about 64 patients. The change from baseline, about four millimeters of mercury, so about a 20% reduction. It's pretty good. Uh, again, we don't often see that. When we add a medicine to a patient who's on two or more meds, I don't often get a 20% drop. And so now this is some nice data, and I'd say I have seen this in my own clinical practice. Um, this is looking at the um, proportion of patients who had pressures of you know 18 or below or, or even lower as we move across the um, the axis down here. And so, again, pretty good pressure reduction we saw across the board. 
Adverse events, now again, this was patient reported, really not physician reported. So this is about what I said, about a 20% rate of hyperemia. That's what I see. And they had about 11% of subjects discontinued to adverse events. Again, kind of what I've seen. So again, Repressa seems to work pretty well regardless of the number of baseline agents. That's what this study showed. And again, um, I think it depends on everyone's clinical practice, depending upon where they use it. And they found about a 20% rate of hyperemia, which I think is pretty fair. I'd say it's between 20 and 30%. So most of us, when we heard that Repressa came out, we were all waiting for Roclitan. So Roclitan is the first medication that is a prostaglandin plus. So it's latanoprost plus metarsidil. So we're getting a pretty powerful agent that increases uveoscleral outflow, trabecular outflow, and even decreases your episcleral venous pressure. So what did the data show on this? So again, phase three study. Now keep in mind, when you do a phase three study of a combo agent, what the FDA requires is that you prove non-inferiority of this medication against each of the individual components. That's a pretty hard thing to do. Not many paid people want to go up against latanoprost, the PGA. Most of the time when you do a phase three study, you're going up against Timolol. So this was, a, this was an important study. This was one that, um, uh, you know, many of us weren't sure what the results were going to look like. So again, primary efficacy analysis for the residents when you look at a phase three study, they look at non-inferiority up through three months. It's typically two phase three studies, so mercury one, mercury two. We have three time points at week two, week six, and month three. And we have a safety analysis carried out through 12 months. And so, you know, Rocklatan met non-inferiority at each of those time points. And if we pool the data and look at the IOP reduction from baseline, they did pretty well. Almost 90% of patients had that 20% IOP reduction. It's pretty impressive. 30 to 40% of patients in the Roclitan group got a 35 to 40% reduction. So keep in mind, Roclitan is dosed once daily. It is a combination agent. And so if you tell me you have a patient who's newly diagnosed with glaucoma um, and we want to put them on a once daily medication, if I can get a 40% reduction in 30% of my patients, that's pretty good. I'll even take 62% of my patients getting a 30% reduction. That's, that's pretty, pretty impressive power here. Um, let's look at it again in a different way. Let's look at the number of patients or percent of patients who had pressures uh, under 18 and those who had pressures even lower, say under 14. Pretty good. 30 to 40% of our patients had a low teens final IOP, which is uh, quite good. And so, um, again, I show you good data, but it all comes sometimes at a cost. What about the side effects? Very similar side effects that we saw with Ropressa, which was conchyperemia, verticillata, and conjunctival hemorrhages. Again, I'm not so worried about the verticillata and the conch hemorrhages. It's the hyperemia that is the issue. A discontinuation rate of about 5%, up to 50% of patients had that mild hyperemia. So the biggest question, will it become first-line therapy? Uh, I think the answer is maybe. Uh, do I use it first line? Uh, in certain patients, yes. Um, especially my low tension glaucoma patients, I like getting that prostaglandin um, with the rho kinase inhibitor. I do like the fact that we can lower the episcleral venous pressure. But again, if I'm totally honest, it a lot of times comes down to cost and availability. Not uh, quite as easy as I'd like to get this medication into all of my patients' hands. But we will see, you know, where it fits down the road uh, into all of our treatment regimens. Visolta. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We talked about a rokinase inhibitor. We talked about a combination agent, which was a rokinase inhibitor plus a prostaglandin. And this is what I consider sort of a prostaglandin plus. So this is latanoprostine bunode, which um, essentially it's a medication that gets broken down into a prostaglandin and a nitric oxide moiety, which actually targets the TM and again, sort of relaxes the TM to increase outflow through the physiologic outflow pathway. Two studies were done, the Apollo and Lunar, which compared Visolta to Timolol. And again, um, Visolta met non-inferiority at each of the endpoints. And so, you know, I think many of us will use this medicine in similar ways to uh, the way we use both Roclitan and Ropressa. And as I said, it is nice to have so many medications out there, but it's actually confusing. Um, which one should I use? Which one does better? Well, this was a comparative study. This was the... Uh, uh, a study that compared the Voyager, it compared latanoprost alone against Visolta. And they found that latanoprost in Bunos got about an extra one to 1.2 millimeter reduction in pressure. So, you know, if you are somebody who believes every millimeter of mercury counts, uh, you may get a little more uh, bang for your buck with Visolta. 
Where do I use it? Again, um, it, it just depends. Um, I use it in a similar place to the aforementioned uh, medications. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, it does work uh, rather well in a lot of the patients that, that I get it in, but a lot of times it's all about availability and cost. So let's shift gears a little bit. We talked about new topical therapy. How about a, a whole different drug delivery platform? How about this new injectable medicine called the Mataprost SR or known as Jurista? What this is, is a small intracameral implant. It's about a millimeter in length and it contains 10 micrograms of the Mataprost. So it's essentially a single drop of the Mataprost put into a basically an Ozerdex like pellet that gets injected into the eye. The implant is supposed to degrade over several months to a year. The device comes preloaded with one implant and it's, uh, it has a 28 gauge needle. Now, the big thing to keep in mind, the Mataprost SR as of right now cannot be re-administered to an eye that has received a prior implant. So it's approved right now for one time dosing only. Um, and that's per FDA guidance. And I'll explain to you possibly why that is the case. So we talk about the Artemis I study, which was the phase three study that compared the bimatoprost implant in patients with open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension to Timolol. Here's a nice picture of the implant sitting perfectly in the inferior angle, courtesy of the Vinder Grover. So I'm going to take this opportunity just to give you a little bit more information about this implant that, that I don't want to forget to tell you as I move on. You'll see this implant here. As I said, it kind of looks like an Ozerdex pellet. What's kind of interesting is that the medication is typically eluded over four months, but this implant does not fully go away by the end of four months. Often this vehicle can last or, or be seen in the angle up to 12 months. And that is one of the concerns is that if you have to re-inject the patient, these implants tend to stack on top of each other. So there's really no medication left in the eyeball, but you still have the implant sitting in the inferior angle. Um, and we'll talk about how they designed the Artemis I study in terms of how many injections the patients had. So let me just first give you a little bit of an illustration. This is how they have designed the implant to be uh, injected, typically in a minor procedure room, um, injected into the eyeball where it's going to sit in the inferior angle. And again, it loops the Mataprost for about four months. Um, I think in reality, many of us just do this right at the slit lamp. It's a rather easy procedure to do with the speculum in the eye and takes, you know, just several minutes. So questions I had when this implant came out and I still have is how often do I need to inject this patient? Is this a patient who's gonna to need to be injected every four months for the rest of their lives, every six months, once a year? Is there a loading dose uh, after which, you know, say I gave the patient three injections for the first year, can I not inject them for another year or two? You know. These are questions we all want to know. Are the injections safe? What's the risk to the cornea? What's the risk of endophthalmitis? Will the patient still need drops? So you might say, well, if a patient's on a prostaglandin and a combination agent and they're compliant maybe 50% of the time, if I inject this medicine into the eye where I'm essentially ensuring 100% compliance, can I get them off three agents? And so I think these are all big questions that many of us have. And I'll try to answer some of that with some of the data that we saw in the Artemis I trial. So this trial essentially had three arms. Patients were going to receive an injection of either the 10 microgram implants, a 15 microgram implants, or they were going to be put on Timol twice a day. This study was carried out um, over uh, about 52 uh, weeks. Um, and what they looked at was non-inferiority compared to Timolol at various time points. And they looked at sort of how well this implant worked over time. And so the conclusion was that both dose strengths of the Mataprost implant met the primary endpoint of non-inferiority to Timolol through week 12. One year after three administrations, the IOP was controlled in most subjects without additional treatment. So let me break that down because this is kind of complicated. Again, the patients got Timolol twice a day in one arm. The bimatoprost injections, which again, were either one of two groups, either a 10 microgram implant or a 15 microgram implant. They got injected at day one, month four, and month eight. And then they were followed for another year after month eight to see how the patients did. And so let's talk a little bit more. So again, subjects got three administrations at 16 week intervals and then were followed for another year. They all met non-inferiority compared to Timolol, and both doses of the implant did well. 
Um, I mentioned before, you know, how many of these patients were actually on multiple medicines or how many were just on one medicine? So about a quarter of the patients were actually on multiple medicines in both the Artemis 1 and 2 study. I'm only showing the Artemis 1 data here. So again, here's our week two, week six, three months, just like we saw with topical medications, we've got approved non-inferiority of Timolol, which is the gray line. And we did that with both the 10 and the 15 microgram implants. Um, and again, these are some of the uh, other ways of looking at the data, but you know, suffice it to say it did its job. Um, here we are looking at the mean diurnal IOP, but now we're looking at it you know, even further out. Here we are at 52 weeks, but then like I said, we're gonna carry it out a whole nother year afterwards and we're going to see how the patient did and it was kind of interesting again after the third administration so essentially the loading dose the probability of not requiring additional iop lowering treatment for one year was 82 percent in the 10 microgram dose and 87.8 percent in the 15 microgram dose kind of interesting well, how is that happening how are we still getting an effect if we think there's no more medication in the eye and so one of the, 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 the thoughts out there is that the, the matter pros, when it's implanted in the eye, it causes some permanent alteration to the outflow pathway. We think it's actually increasing the uh, MMPs uh, and helping with extracellular matrix turnover. And so that's pretty powerful. If that really is the case, if we could administer this, in, this, this medication and not need to re-inject the patient at a certain you know, time interval for the rest of their lives, um, I think many of us would consider using this earlier in our treatment algorithm. So again, so many questions that we need answers to that we just haven't had answers yet. Um, the big risk, I think it's endothelial cell loss. And for all the cornea specialists out there, you're probably cringing when I tell you that, you know, you've got a bunch of these implants stacking up in the angle. And so um, there was a significant rate of, of cell loss, uh, especially 20% cell loss at month 20 or study exit. So between 10 and 20%. And some of the implants needed to be removed in each of the groups uh, because of endothelial decompensation. I actually have one coming up this week that I need to remove for that that was put in by um, another doctor into a rather narrow angle. And so right now, the medication is approved for a single dose. Um, the FDA looked at all the data, and what they noted that zero subjects had 20% endothelial cell loss after a single administration. So I think that's why right now it's approved for single dosing until they see more safety data long-term. So conclusions, medications, man, do we really need more? When is too much? We have so many medicines available. When I go to my cabinet, I don't even know which one to pick, but hopefully this lecture helps sort of guide you a little bit into seeing when you might want to use Natarsidil or Natarsidil plus uh, Latanoprost or even Latanoprost and Bunode. Will these medications you know, be my first line therapy down the road? What is the main issue? Is it cost? Is it compliance? Is it side effect profile? Well, probably all of them. And you might say, well, you know, based upon uh, you know, other lectures I've heard, aren't we saying to intervene earlier with laser and surgery? Do we need all these medications? Well, I think as a glaucoma specialist, it's quite exciting to have so many different tools available to us, but I will say it can be overwhelming at times. And so um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask during the discussion. And again, I really thank you all so much for listening uh, to both of these lectures. Thanks so much. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Smoliak or Dr. Panarelli? I have some, so I can ask mine while you guys are thinking, um, if that's okay. So oh, it just, oh, just excites everybody so much. I could tell at the end of the long day. I know. I really it excites me. I guess I'm probably one of the only ones. But um, so about the I was just wondering, Regina, about the Chennai study that you mentioned. So with the conclusions from that, you know, as an optometrist, I mean, we're the ones that are referring you these narrow angle patients, right, for LPIs all the time, um, and also worrying about dilating these patients. So what would you say, you know, for the ODs out there that are um, currently just referring these patients that we believe have narrow angles or should we continue to do that or should we not worry as much about it or leave that in, in your hands? What do you think? So that's a very good question, uh, Sarah. So I can't really say that I will write a policy on what to do. Um, I think uh, the future will show and there are more studies going to come out. Um, I still think that optometrists play a very important role in screening the patients that come into your door and completing a full eye exam is important. And when you see a narrow angle, it's probably not a bad idea to refer them for evaluation of PI. Um, 
I think the Chennai study looked at the population in vivo in China, in, I'm sorry, in India, where the population is very big, there is shortage of medical care, there's shortage of screening. And they were asking questions like, well, do we miss anything? So given that we are practicing a little different medicine that is practiced in China or in India, I would continue to screen for patients, especially in ophthalmic offices. Give, saying that, that now we as a society moving towards telemedicine, toward dilating people for diabetic eye exams without checking their pressure. And it sounds like we will need massive numbers to um, achieve some kind of change in the population in terms of screening. And in this population, I think the, this literature is pointing us that it's okay to go ahead and screen people for diabetic retinopathy and not check their angles and not check their pressures. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So um, from Dr. DePaulis, he wants to know, um, well, I'm going to read his question for Dr. Panarelli first because I'm missing the one for Regina, but I'll get to that. Uh, he says, the Zen gel stent ab internal versus ab external, uh, matter of preference or efficacy? Ah, it's a good question. We actually, we just said my, uh, my fellow from Wesh, I just published some of the data we have with Johns Hopkins looking at uh, open versus closed, ab internal versus ab external. And we really found a lower needling rate, um, similar efficacy with both with both approaches, but a lower needling rate with the open approach. So typically it comes down to whether you want to put the Zen gel stent beneath tenons and above the sclera or above tenons and beneath the conjunctiva. Personally, I don't think any implant belongs beneath the conjunctiva. We saw bad things with the Express, you know, years ago when that was tried. I think with the Zen, um, you saw a issues with erosion and real vision threatening complications. And it really, it's a potential space for anybody who does pterygium surgery, you know how hard it is to cleave the conjunctiva from T-nods. It's very hard to thread a micro shunt into that space. So for me, it's my eye. You want to get some consistent, predictable results, always place it in the T-nods. I like going from an ob external approach just because it's just more comfortable for me as a glaucoma surgeon. Uh, for Dr. Smoliak, given normal IOPs and narrow angles, what is your criteria for laser PI? When people refer to me, I looked at in the angle when I cannot identify the structures, I do PI them at this point. Um, I became a little bit even more conservative than I used to be. I'm a conservative glaucoma specialist, um, but um, I do PI people when I cannot identify angles um, and it's but looking at the studies right now, I think it's okay to wait until the pressure is up. And maybe after that, you just remove the lens and fix the problem. Um, I, I find this so tough. You got like one study saying, you don't got to do anything. And then you have another study that's telling you, just take the cataract out. I mean, exactly. I mean, that seems like we're going, we have two different, you know, degrees of how aggressive we want to be. I, I, I agree with Regina. I mean, it, it's, eye-opening data. I, I will say, I think they took some liberties with the conclusions that were drawn. These are pretty strong conclusions from both of the studies. Um, they really need to be validated. I think even reproduced, uh, especially, it's always hard to take a study and generalize it to your patient population. So um, I, I think what I took out of it, I still, as Regina says, I, I still offer PIs to everybody. Uh, even if it's that one person that I prevent a blinding attack of glaucoma, it's worth it. I will overtreat however many eyes I have to overtreat to prevent that. Um, and medical legally, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you can justify not doing a PI at this point. Um, I, I don't think it's safe to tell somebody, yeah, you're narrow, but nah, we'll just hold off because if they, they do go into angle closure, the other thing I would add is just, um, I always tell my, my students, my residents, fellow pseudo exfoliative patients, if there's one group that you definitely should always laser, you should always laser those patients. They are the ones who are going to go into angle closure more often. So, um, you know, be very careful to look for signs of mild pseudo X, especially if you're not dilating these patients, but sometimes it's just the, the pigmentation of the TM, it's their ethnicity, but you got to be very careful. I, I have to concur with you, um, Joe. It's, um, I think it has to do with the society we live in. And I, I think you have to take in a perspective that the studies were done in India and China. Yeah. Uh, we have a different level of medicine, uh, a different approach. Um, it did make me a little bit more conservative when I PI people. Like if I see kind of narrow angle, I would observe them. 
I agree. And I think if I have a patient who's a little on the fence, I'm not going to be as pushy with necessarily having it done. I might just say, okay, here's some data that, you know, says we're probably okay. But I think for you, you hit the nail on the head though. It's, it's all about when a resident college student says, I think they have narrow angles, but they're complaining of a floater or flashes. Dilate the patient, dilate the patient or, or the, the, the telehealth screenings that, you know, you should be able to comfortably dilate patients. I think those are two huge points. The other quick thing is, you know, there, there's like with any study, even the study I was presenting that we were part of that randomized study, there's always flaws. One of the things about the ZAP trial, some of the patients, the, the provocative testing, some of those patients were excluded. You know, there's, there's always a little bit of, of, of something. Um, the one quick thing about Eagle that I would just throw out there for, especially for the residents, you know, look at who was in that study. These patients, you know, these were primary angle closure patients, you know, primary angle closure glaucoma patients. These weren't just every a random narrow angle. I see so many of my residents come to me like, well, oh, the angle's narrow. I'm, I'm booking them for cataract. Um, and I'm like, I, I don't know that that's exactly what you have to do. That is not the, the meaning uh, or the interpretation of the results from the Eagle study that every narrow angle patient should have their cataracts taken out. Um, yeah, you have to look at who was included in that study. So I just thought you did a nice job presenting it. And I just wanted to highlight that one point. Yeah. I wanted to actually make sure that we're talking about primary angle closure glaucoma yeah. disease. Which I can't keep track of what that is. PAC, PACG, PACS, I, I don't know. Chronic angle closure. It, right. It changes every week. Exactly. Okay, for Dr. Panarelli, um, someone has a question about the future of punctal plugs for latanoprost. You know, it's interesting. So, um, yeah, there's a punctal plug for Travaprost. Uh, there's a ring insert that eludes the Mataprost. You know, it's it, the, the hard the hard part for these is retention um, and some patient discomfort. So, it is interesting. I mean, the idea of taking compliance out of the patient's hands. I mean, you know, we're seeing a big shift again, given the results of the light study, to starting more with early laser again because um, you know it, it's it's compliance is our biggest problem in in glaucoma. I think. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there, there's, there's some promise there. There's been liposomal subconjunctival injections, all kinds of things. I'm curious to see where Bimatoprost SR ends up. Um, as, as I highlighted, it's, it's the corneal findings that are, are troublesome to some of us, but the idea of a permanent remodeling of the outflow system is, is kind of appealing. And, and we've seen it, not just with the Bimatoprost MR SR, we've seen it with some of the Travaprost data that's, uh, uh, been presented. So it's, it's interesting, you know, this idea that you could, deposit a high concentration of the drug into the tissue uh, and alter the extracellular matrix turnover. Um, it's kind of cool, but we'd like to see some real science behind how that's working. And that's hard to prove. What we're not talking about often is the economic implications of all sure. those medical treatments. Sure. And, the, MIGS, um, the economic implication of MIGS. I mean, you look at, you know, the treatment costs, um, the, the, the devices, uh, you know, even, even drug delivery. I, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Can we sustain this? Can we keep this up? And that was why part of the impetus for that lecture of, do we have the data to support the hype? I mean, how much extra, how much extra millimeter of mercury reduction are you getting for the cost of some of these devices? You know, I, I think I was, I've been always floored by, I, I congratulate Tom Samuelson for just the, the fact that we see how well cataract surgery works. I mean, I, I do like these devices. I do use a lot of the devices, but you know, it, it is, it's something to consider. A uh, question for either doc to catch the earliest changes, 10-2 visual field or 24-2? And how about inferior ganglion cell thinning? Well, I'm gonna answer it for our, um, because I'm practicing here in Rochester and I'll tell you what I do. I do 24-2 for until people develop the defect. And then I do 10-2s to hone on the defect in the center of the vision because that's in glaucoma we're trying to prevent. Um, what, what do you do, Joe? Yeah, I'm very similar. I'll do a 10 early if I see some GCC loss, but a clean 24-2. And it depends upon sort of how much loss there is on the GCC. Don Hood's done a lot of that great work up at Columbia. Um, I think the big question is 24-2C. Does that replace what we do? If we can get the 24 and the 10 in one, is that better? You know, it's, it's, if you look at that test, it's almost too fast. I don't think it's sensitive enough to pick up all the points. So I do still think you need 24s and 10s. But I agree, I, I still would want a patient to continue to do more 24s than alternating at the beginning with like 24 and 10. So if I have my choice, I want more 24s. Okay. Um, so for either of you, uh, when you follow the OCT, what parameter change do you consider to be the most important to characterize a worsening clinical picture? 
Is there one parameter more than all the others that gets your attention? You should totally have asked that to the expert who was on here a while ago. I mean, we are, I mean, I, I do not deserve answering that when you had, you know, David and others speaking this morning. But um, it's interesting you bring that up. We had Felipe Medeiros give a visiting professor lecture and I asked him a similar question. You know, Felipe, what do I look at to define progression on the OCT? So we have, we use the Cirrus in my office. Should I be looking at the average RNFL thickness? Should I be looking about at the quadrants? Is there a number? We all want that magic number, five microns, 10 microns. Yeah, he basically told me you really should be doing probably more RNFL analysis and using the progression analysis on the machine. So that's what I've been doing more of lately um, is using our, our progression analysis to see what it picks up because it looks at so much more data. I only use OCT for primary and glaucoma suspect. Um, the minute they develop a defect, I actually, uh, I don't trust the OCT and I do go by uh, average NFL. Um, there, I think there were some studies published that the clock hours are extremely non-consistent -cons uh, quite often and variable depending on pupil dilation or how the machine uh, evaluates the. Um, so I think OCT is for optic nerve, unfortunately, it's still the modality that probably at the beginning um, of the glaucoma development, not at the, when you establish the disease. When you establish yeah, the I mean, disease, I there's- agree. A It's great for diagnostic purposes. I love OCT early on. I still have trouble tracking progression with it. I'm looking at all my parameters, looking at my fields, looking at my pressures. Um, you know, there is some literature out there on people with severe disease tracking the GCC for some of your more advanced patients, but truthfully, I'm looking at fields. Once they have field loss, it's it's pretty much all fields at that point. Um, that's a great question. I think we all would love an answer to that. I, I would just say the key would be you need enough tests to actually track progression using the analysis. Uh, let's I'm going to ask one quick question if I can to Regina, just since uh, Regina, how often are you doing things like iridoplasty? So I was I was lucky. Regina was one of my clinical instructors when I was a resident. <laughs> But New York guy near was like Holmes doing peripheral iridoplasty for a long time. But there is, so for me, when I have a patient who has a patent PI and has normal pressures, even if the angle still looks somewhat occludable, I tend to leave them alone. Are you doing iridoplasty early lens extraction? I think that is the question. People are taking the data from Eagle and saying, well, if you have an iridotomy and you're still narrow, take the lens out. Do you do that or do you wait for a problem before you take the lens out? I do not. I only do peripheral iridotomy when I did the, when the patient comes in with a narrow angle and increased intraocular pressure. I will okay. first do iridotomy, then I will do the iridoplasty if the pressure is not coming up. And mostly in the younger patients where I am a little bit hesitant about taking the lens out. But essentially, yes. if, if, they, if they have an iridotomy and they're narrow, but the pressures are fine and the nerves fine, you do nothing? I do not think. That's, that's what I do. But I think there is a lot of controversy out there in terms of what you do at that point. There is. I agree. Uh, one last quick question here. Uh, do you have a gut intuitive feeling that glaucoma is really a disease of microvascular starvation? That's heavy. <laughs> uh, that's a deep question. You know, okay. I, I would say that the, the more I've practiced, the, the more I just tell patients, you know, glaucoma truly is a multifaceted, um, you know, disease, multifactorial disease. I always tell them glaucoma is a long equation, A plus B plus C plus D plus E. I, I think there's definitely something to CSF pressure. There's something to microvasculature. When it comes down to it still, the only thing we can modify is pressure. So um, sorry to say that's why we talk about it so much, but, but um, yes, I, I do think there's a lot more that we don't know. And hopefully OCT and geography, some of the great lectures you heard today with adaptive optics, if we can hone some of that technology even better. I mean, adaptive optics, I've, I've tried looking at it with Rich Rosen at New York Ioneer. Man, that's come a long way. That was a tough test to do the first few times you had to have a patient do it. They could sit there for like four hours still trying to get a few images, but it's come a long way. But um, yeah, I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's so many factors we don't totally know everything about. Joe, you make me feel better because I was trying to do the study with actually Jesse Shalek, uh, one of our uh, researchers. I gave up. I gave up. I gave up. And uh, I, we actually, I you know, Jesse, if you're there, I'm sorry, we gave up because it's torturing patients. And there was such a miscommunication between the researchers and clinicians when I said, oh, let's look at the narrow, like normal tension glaucoma and look at their vasculature. They said, great, let's do it. Give me a 40 year old patient with uh, who is Perfect media. Perfect and, media. And sit there for three hours and it was like well we're gonna find that but the pictures are beautiful for a lecture when you put the pictures in a lecture the beautiful. pictures are beautiful i have to agree <laughs>
Well, thank you both. I thought that was really interesting. And I think a lot of other people did too. So we'll go back to Dave DiLoretto here. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for everybody, uh, for, to everybody uh, for spending the day with us. Um, certainly all the participants, speakers, moderators. Um, remember also that um, you'll get an email tomorrow afternoon at the end of the conference that'll give you instructions on how to claim your CME credits. And tomorrow's session, the link will be live at 7 a.m. and will be um, officially begin at 7.55 with the introduction. Uh, tomorrow's session features uh, Ray Zidana as our Albert Snell lecturer. Uh, everybody, again, thank you. Uh, enjoy your evening in Meliora. Thank you. Thank you.